Cleek of Scotland Yard by Thomas W. Hanshu. Prologue The Affair of the Man Who Vanished. Mr. Maverick Narkom, superintendent at Scotland Yard, flung aside the paper he was reading and wheeled round in his revolving desk chair, all alert on the instant, like a terrier that scents a rat. He knew well what the coming of the footsteps toward his private office portended. His messenger was returning at last. Good! Now he would get at the facts of the matter, and be relieved from the sneers of carping critics and the pinpricks of overzealous reporters, who seemed to think that the yard was to blame, and all the forces connected with it to be screamed at as incompetence if every evil-doer in London was not instantly brought to book and his craftiest secrets promptly revealed. Gad! Let them take on his job, then, if they thought the thing so easy. Let them have a go at this business of stopping at one's post until two o'clock in the morning trying to patch up the jumbled fragments of a puzzle of this sort, if they regarded it as such child's play finding an assassin whom nobody had seen and who struck with a method which neither medical science nor legal acumen could trace or name then by james the door opened and closed and detective sergeant petrie stepped into the room removing his hat and standing at attention well rapped out the superintendent in the sharp staccato of nervous impatience speak up it was a false alarm was it not no sir it's even worse than reported. Quicker and sharper than any of the others. He's gone, sir. Gone? Good God, you don't mean dead? Yes, sir. Dead as Julius Caesar. Total collapse about twenty minutes after my arrival and went off like that, snapping his fingers and giving his hand an outward fling. Same way as the others, only, as I say, quicker, sir, and with no more trace of what caused it than the doctors were able to discover in the beginning. That makes five in the same mysterious way, Superintendent, and not a ghost of a clue yet. The papers will be ringing with it tomorrow. Ringing with it? Can they ring any more than they are doing already? Narkom threw up both arms and laughed the thin, mirthless laughter of utter despair. Can they say anything worse than they have said? Blame any more unreasonably than they have blamed? It is small solace for the overburdened taxpayer to reflect that he may be done to death at any hour of the night, and that the heads of the institution he has so long and so consistently supported are capable of giving his stricken family nothing more in return than the dear me, dear me of utter bewilderment, and to prove anew that the efficiency of our boasted police detective system may be classed under the head of brilliant fiction. That sort of thing day after day, as if I had done nothing but pile up failures of this kind since I came into office. No heed of the past six years' brilliant success. No thought for the manner in which the police departments of other countries were made to sit up and to marvel at our methods. Two months' failure, and that doesn't count. By the Lord Harry, I'd give my head to make those newspaper fellows eat their words. Gad, yes. Why don't you then, sir? Petrie dropped his voice a tone or two and looked round over the angle of his shoulder as he spoke. Then, recollecting the time and the improbability of anybody being within earshot, took heart of grace and spoke up bolder. There's no use blinking the fact, Mr. Narkom. It was none of us none of the regular force, I mean, that made the record of those years what it was. That chap Cleek was the man that did it, sir. You know that as well as I. I don't know whether you've fallen out with him or not, or if he's off on some secret mission that keeps him from handling yard matters these days. But if he isn't, take my advice, sir, and put him on this case at once. Don't talk such rot, flung out Narkom impatiently. Do you think I'd have waited until now to do it if it could be done? Put him on the case, indeed. How the devil am I to do it when I don't know where on earth to find him? He cleared out directly after that panther's paw case six months ago, gave up his lodging, sacked his housekeeper, laid off his assistant dollops, and went the Lord knows where and why. 
my hat then that's the reason we never hear any more of him in yard matters is it i wondered disappeared eh well well y you don't think he can have gone back to his old lay back to the wrong uns and his old vanishing cracksman's tricks do you sir no i don't no backslider about that chap by james he's not built that way last time i saw him he was out shopping with miss elsa lorne the girl who redeemed him and judging from their manner toward each other i rather fancied well never mind that's got nothing to do with you besides i feel sure if they had mrs narkom and i would have been invited all he said was that he was going to take a holiday he didn't say why and he didn't say where i wish to heaven i'd asked him i could have kicked myself for not having done so when that she-devil of a frenchwoman managed to slip the leash and get off scot-free mean that party we nabbed in the house at roehampton along with the mauravanian baron who got up that silver snare fake don't you sir margot the queen of the apaches or at least that's who you declared she was i recollect and that's who i still declare she was rapped in narkom testily and what i'll continue to say while there's a breath left in me i never actually saw the woman until that night it is true but cleek told me she was margot and who should know better than he when he was once her pal and partner but it's one of the infernal drawbacks of british justice that a crook's words as good as an officer's if it's not refuted by actual proof the woman brought a dozen witnesses to prove that she was a respectable austrian lady on a visit to her son in england that the motor in which she was riding broke down before that roehampton house about an hour before our descent upon it and that she had merely been invited to step in and wait while the repairs were being attended to by her chauffeur of course such a chauffeur was forthcoming when she was brought up before the magistrate and the garage keeper was produced to back up his statement so that when the mauravanian prisoner confessed from the dock that what the lady said was true that settled it i couldn't swear to her identity and cleek who could was gone the lord knows where upon which the magistrate admitted the woman to bail and delivered her over to the custody of her solicitors pending my efforts to get somebody over from paris to identify her and no sooner is the vixen set at large than presto away she goes bag and baggage out of the country and not a man in england has seen hide nor hair of her since gad if i could but have got word to cleek at that time just to put him on his guard against her but i couldn't i'd no more idea than a child where the man went not one it's pretty safe odds to lay one's head against a brass farthing as to where the woman went though i reckon said petrie stroking his chin bunked it back to paris i expect sir and made for her hole like any other fox i hear them french techs are as keen to get hold of her as we were but she slips em like an eel can't lay hands on her and couldn't swear to her identity if they did not one in a hundred of em's ever seen her to be sure of her i'm told no not one even cleek himself knows nothing of who and what she really is he confessed that to me their knowledge of each other began when they threw in their lot together for the first time and ceased when they parted yes i suppose she did go back to paris petrie it would be her safest place and there'd be rich pickings there for her and her crew just now the city is en fete you know yes sir king ulrich of mauravania is there as the guest of the republic funny time for a king to go visiting another nation sir isn't it when there's a revolution threatening in his own don't know much about the ways of kings superintendent but if there was a row coming up in my house you can bet all your worth i'd be mighty sure to stop at home diplomacy petrie diplomacy he may be safer where he is rumours are afloat that prince what's his name son and heir to the late queen karma is not only still living but has during the present year secretly visited mauravania in person 
i see by the papers that that ripping old royalist count irma is implicated in the revolutionary movement and that by the king's orders he has been arrested and imprisoned in the fort of sulberga on a charge of sedition grand old johnny that i hope no harm comes to him he was in england not so long ago came to consult cleek about some business regarding a lost pearl and i took no end of a fancy to him hope he pulls out all right but if he doesn't oh well we can't bother over other people's troubles we've got enough of our own just now with these mysterious murders going on and the newspapers hammering the yard day in and day out Gad, how i wish i knew how to get hold of cleek how i wish i did can't you find somebody to put you on the lay sir some friend of his somebody that's seen him or maybe heard from him since you have oh don't talk rubbish snapped narkom with a short derisive laugh friends indeed what friends has he outside of myself who knows him any better than i know him and what do i know of him at that nothing not where he comes from not what his real name may be not a living thing but that he chooses to call himself hamilton cleek and to fight in the interest of the law as strenuously as he once fought against it and where will i find the man who has seen him as you suggest or would know if he had seen him and he has that amazing birth gift to fall back upon you never saw his real face never in all your life i never saw it but twice and even i why he might pass me in the street a dozen times a day and i'd never know him if i looked straight into his eyes he'd come like a shot if he knew i wanted him gad yes but he doesn't and there you are imagination was never one of petrie's strong points his mind moved always along well-prepared grooves to time on at ends it found one of those grooves and moved along it now why don't you advertise for him then he suggested put a personal in the morning papers sir chap like that's sure to read the news every day and it's bound to come to his notice sooner or later or if it doesn't why people will get to knowing that the yard's lost him and get to talking about it and maybe he'll learn of it that way narkom looked at him the suggestion was so bald so painfully ordinary and commonplace that heretofore it had never occurred to him to associate cleek's name with the banalities of the everyday agony column to connect him with the appeals of the scullery and the methods of the raw amateur the very outrageousness of the thing was its best passport to success by james i believe there's something in that he said abruptly if you get people to talking well it doesn't matter so that he hears so that he finds out i want him you ring up the daily mail while i'm scratching off an ad tell em it's simply got to go in the morning's issue i'll give it to them over the line myself in a minute he lurched over to his desk drove a pen into the ink pot and made such good haste in marshalling his straggling thoughts that he had the thing finished before petrie had got farther than yes scotland yard hold the line please superintendent narkom wants to speak to you the yard's requests are at all times treated with respect and courtesy by the controlling forces of the daily press so it fell out that late as the hour was space was accorded and in the morning half a dozen papers bore this notice prominently displayed cleek where are you urgently needed communicate at once maverick narkom the expected came to pass and the unexpected followed close upon its heels the daily press publishing the full account of the latest addition to the already long list of mysterious murders which for a fortnight past had been adding nervous terrors to the public mind screamed afresh as narkom knew that it would 
and went into paroxysms of the reporter's disease until the very paper was yellow with the froth of it the afternoon editions were still worse for between breakfast and lunch-time yet another man had fallen victim to the mysterious assassin and sheets pink and sheets green sheets grey and sheets yellow were scattering panic from one end of london to the other the police detective system of the country was rotten the government should interfere must interfere it was a national disgrace that the foremost city of the civilized world should be terrorized in this appalling fashion and the author of the outrages remain undetected could anything be more appalling it could and it was when night came and the evening papers were supplanting the afternoon ones that something more appalling known hours before to the yard itself was glaring out on every bulletin and every front page in words like these london's reign of terror appalling atrocity in clarges street shocking dynamite outrage clarges street the old magic street of those magic old times of cleek and the red limousine and the riddles that were unriddled for the asking narkom grabbed the report the instant he heard that name and began to read it breathlessly it was the usual station advice ticked through to headquarters and deciphered by the operator there and it ran tersely thus four twenty eight p m attempt made by unknown parties to blow up house in clarges street piccadilly partially successful three persons injured and two killed no clue to motive occupants family from essex only moved in two days ago house been vacant for months previously formerly occupied by a retired seafaring man named captain horatio burbage who narkom read no farther he flung the paper aside with a sort of mingled laugh and blub and collapsed into his chair with his eyes hidden in the crook of an upthrown arm and the muscles of his mouth twitching now i know why he cleared out good old cleek bully old cleek he said to himself and stopped suddenly as though something had got into his throat and half choked him but after a moment or two he jumped to his feet and began walking up and down the room his face fairly glowing and if he had put his thoughts into words they would have run like this margot's crew of course and he must have guessed that something of the sort would happen some time if he stopped there after that silver snare business at roehampton either from her lot or from the followers of that mauravanian johnny who was at the back of it they were after him even in that little game those two i wonder why what the dickens when one comes to think of it could have made the prime minister of mauravania interest himself in an apache trick to do in an ex-cracksman god she flies high sometimes that margot prime minister of mauravania and the fool faced fifteen years hard to do the thing and let her get off scot-free faced it and took it and is taking it still for the sake of helping her to wipe off an old score against a reformed criminal wonder if cleek ever crossed him in something wonder if he too was on the crooked side once and wanted to make sure of its never being shown up oh well he got his medicine and so too will this unknown murderer who's doing the secret killing in london now that this clarges street affair is over bully old cleek slipped em again had their second shot and missed you now you'll come out of hiding old chap and we shall have the good old times once more his eye fell upon the ever-ready telephone he stopped short in his purposeless walking and nodded and smiled to it we'll have you singing your old tune before long my friend he said optimistically 
I know my man. Gad, yes. He'll let no grass grow under his feet now that this thing's over. I shall hear soon. Yes, by James, I shall. His optimism was splendidly rewarded. Not, however, from the quarter, nor in the manner he expected. It had but just gone half-past seven when a tap sounded, the door of his office swung inward, and the porter stepped into the room. "'A person wanted to speak with you, sir, in private,' he announced. "'Says it's about some personal in the morning paper.' "'Send him in. Send him in at once,' rapped out Narkom excitedly. "'Move sharp, and don't let anybody else in until I give the word.' Then, as soon as the porter had disappeared, he crossed the room, twitched the thick curtains over the window, switched on the electric light, wheeled another big chair up beside his desk, and, with face aglow, jerked open a drawer and got out a cigarette box which had not seen the light for weeks. Quick as he was, the door opened and shut again before the lid of the box could be thrown back, and into the room stepped Cleek's henchman, Dollops. "'Hello, you, is it, you blessed young monkey?' said Narkom gaily as he looked up and saw the boy. "'Knew I'd hear to-day. Knew it by James. Sent he for me, has he, eh? Is he coming himself, or does he want me to go to him? Speak up, and—good Lord, what's the matter with you? What's up? Anything wrong?' Dollops had turned the colour of an underbaked biscuit and was looking at him with eyes of absolute despair. "'Sir,' he said, moving quickly forward and speaking in the breathless manner of a spent runner, "'Sir, I was hoping it was a fake, and to hear you speak like that. God's truth, Governor, you don't mean as it's real, sir, do you? That you don't know, Arthur?' "'No? Know what?' "'Where he is. What's become of him? Mr. Cleek, the Governor, sir.' I made sure that you'd know if anybody would. That's what made me come, sir. I'd have gone off me blooming dot if I hadn't. After you a putting in that personal and him never a turning up like he'd ought. Sir, do you mean to say as you don't know where he is and haven't seen him even yet? No, I've not. Good Lord, haven't you? No, sir. I aren't clapped eyes on him since he sent me off to the blooming seaside six months ago. All he told me when we come to part was that Miss Lorne was going out to India on a short visit to Captain and Mrs. Hawksley, Lady Chepstow as was, sir, and that directly she was gone he'd been knocking about for a time on his own, and I wasn't to worry over him. I haven't seen hide nor air of him, sir, since that hour. Nor heard from him. Narkom's voice was thick and the hand he laid on the chair-back hard shut. "'Oh, yes, sir, I've heard. I'd have gone off my blooming dot if I hadn't done that. Heard from him twice. Once when he wrote and gimme my orders about the new place he's took up the river, four weeks ago. The second time, last Friday, sir, when he wrote me the thing that's fetched me here, that's been tearing the heart out of me ever since I heard at Charing Cross about what's happened at Clarges Street, sir. And what was that? I, sir, he wrote that he'd just remembered about some papers as he'd left behind the wainscot in his old den, and that he'd get the key and drop in at the old Clarges Street house on the way home. Said he'd arrive in England either yesterday afternoon or this one, sir, but whichever it was he'd wire me from Dover before he took the train, and he never done it, sir. "'My God, he never done it in this world!' "'Good God!' Narkom flung out the words in a sort of panic, his lips twitching, his whole body shaking, his face like the face of a dead man. "'He never done it, I tell you,' pursued Dollops in an absolute tremble of fright. "'I haven't never had a blessed line, and now this here awful thing has happened, and if he'd done what he said he was a-going to do, if he'd come to town and went to that house—' If he said more, the clanging of a bell drowned it completely. Narkom had turned to his desk and was hammering furiously upon the call gong. A scurry of flying feet came up the outer passage. The door opened in a flash, and the porter was there. And behind him, Leonard, the chauffeur, who guessed from that excited summons that there would be a call for him. "'The limousine! As quick as you can get around!' 
said narkom in the sharp staccato of excitement to the scene of the explosion in clarges street first and if the bodies of the victims have been removed then to the mortuary without an instant's delay he dashed into the inner room grabbed his hat and coat down from the hook where they were hanging and dashed back again like a man in a panic come on he said beckoning to dollops as he flung open the door and ran out into the passage if they've done him in him if they've got him after all come on come on dollops came on with a rush and two minutes later the red limousine swung out into the roadway and took the distance between scotland yard and clarges street at a mile a minute clip end of section one Prologue The Affair of the Man Who Vanished, Part Two. Arrival at the scene of the disaster elicited the fact that the remains, literally remains, since they had been well nigh blown to fragments, had indeed been removed to the mortuary. So thither Narkom and Dollops followed them, their fears being in no wise lightened by learning that the bodies were undeniably those of men as the features of both victims were beyond any possibility of recognition identification could of course be arrived at only through bodily marks and dollops close association with cleek rendered him particularly capable of speaking with authority regarding those of his master it was therefore a source of unspeakable delight to both narkom and himself when, after close and minute examination of the remains, he was able to say positively, "'Sir, whatever's become of him, praise God, neither of these here two men is him, bless his heart.' "'So they didn't get him after all,' supplemented Narkom, laughing for the first time in hours. "'Still, it cannot be doubted that whoever committed this outrage was after him.' since the people who have suffered are complete strangers to the locality and had only just moved into the house no doubt the person or persons who threw the bomb knew of cleek's having at one time lived there as captain burbage margot did for one and finding the house still occupied and not knowing of his removal why well, there you are i'll go the name brought back all dollops banished fears he switched round on the superintendent and laid a nervous clutch on his sleeve. "'And Margot's lay is Paris. Sir, I didn't tell you, did I, that it was from there the governor wrote those two letters to me?' "'Cinnamon! From Paris?' "'Yes, sir. He didn't say from what part of the city, nor what he was a-doing there anyways. But, my aunt, listen here, sir. There, there, them Moravanian Johnnies.' and the apaches and margot there too and you know how both lots has their knife into him i don't know what the moravanians has got against him sir he never tells nothing to nobody he don't but most like it's something he done to some of em that time he went out there about the lost pearl but they're after him and the apaches is after him and between the two governor his voice rose thin and shrill. "'Governor, if one lot don't get him, the other may. And, sir, there's Apaches in London this very night. I know. I've seen them. "'Seen them? When? Where?' "'At Charing Cross Station, sir, just before I went to the yard to see you. As I hadn't had no telegram from the governor like I was promised, I went there on the off chance, hoping to meet him when the boat train come in. And there I see him, sir.' A lounging round the platform where the Dover train goes out at nine to catch the night boat back to Calais, sir. I spotted them on the instant, from their walk, their way of carrying of theirselves, their manner of wearing of their blooming air. Laughing among themselves they was, and looking round at the entrance every now and then, like as they was expecting someone to come and join them. And I see, too, as they was a-going back to where they come from, "'cause they'd the return halves of their tickets in their hat-bands. "'One of em, he buys a paper at the bookstall "'and sees something in it as tickled him wonderful, "'for I see him go up to the others and point it out to em, "'and then the whole lot begins to laugh like blessed hyenas. "'I spotted what the paper was "'and the place on the page the blighter was a-pointing at, 
so i went and bought one myself to see what it was sir it was that there personal of yours the minute i read that i makes a dash for a taxi to go to you at once sir and just as i does so a newsboy runs by me with a bill on his chest telling about the explosion and then sir i fair went off me dot they were back on the pavement within sight of the limousine when the boy said this narkom brought the car to his side with one excited word and fairly wrenched open the door to charing cross station as fast as you can streak it he said excitedly the last train for the night boat leaves at nine sharp catch it if you rack the motor to pieces crumbs a minute and a half commented leonard as he consulted the clock dial beside him then just waiting for narkom and dollops to jump into the vehicle he brought her head round with a swing threw back the clutch and let her go full tilt but even the best of motors cannot accomplish the impossible the gates were closed the signal down the last train already outside the station when they reached it and not even the mandate of the law might hope to stay it or to call it back plenty of petrol narkom faced round as he spoke and looked at leonard plenty sir all right beat it the boat sails from dover at eleven i've got to catch it understand yes sir but you could wire down and have her held over till we get there superintendent not for the world she must sail on time i must get aboard without being noticed without some persons i'm following having the least cause for suspicion beat that train do you hear me beat it i want to get there and get aboard that boat before the others arrive do you want any further incentive than that if so here it is for you mr cleek's in paris mr cleek's in danger mr cleek god's truth hop in sir hop in i'll have you there ahead of that train if i dash down the admiralty pier in flames from front to rear just let me get to the open road sir and i'll show you something to make you sit up he did once out of the track of all traffic and with the lights of the city well at his back he strapped his goggles tight jerked his cap down to his eyebrows and leaned over the wheel for mr cleek do you hear he said addressing the car as if it were a human being now then show what you're made of there take your head now go you vixen go there was a sudden roar a sudden leap then the car shot forward as though all the gales of all the universe were sweeping it on and the wild race to the coast began narkom jerked down the blinds turned on the light and flung open the locker as they pounded on dip in get something that can be made to fit you he said to dollops we can't risk any of those fellows identifying you as the chap who was hanging round the station to-night toss me over that wig the grey one in the far corner there god knows what we're on the track of but if it leads to cleek i'll follow it to the end of time then lifting his voice until it sounded above the motor's roar faster leonard faster he called give it to her give it to her we've got to beat that train if it kills us they did beat it the engine's light was not even in sight when the bright glare of the moon on the channel's waters flashed up out of the darkness before them nor was the sound of the train's coming even faintly audible as yet when a few minutes later the limousine swung down the incline and came to a standstill within a stone's throw of the entrance to the pier at whose extreme end the packet lay with gangways down and fires up and her huge bulk rising and falling with the movements of the waves peter you see sir said leonard chuckling as he got down and opened the door for the superintendent to alight better not go any nearer sir with the car there's a chap down there standing by the gangplank and he seems interested in us from the way he's watching jumped up like a shot and came down the gangplank the instant he heard us coming better do the rest of the journey afoot sir and make a pretence of paying me as if i were a public taxi what'll i do stop here until morning yes put up at a garage and if i don't return by the first boat get back to town meantime cut off somewhere and ring up the yard tell em where i've gone now then dollops come on a moment later the limousine had swung off into the darkness and disappeared 
and what might properly have been taken for a couple of english curates on their way to a continental holiday moved down the long pier between the glimmering and inadequate lamps to the waiting boat but long before they reached it the figure at the gangplank the tall erect figure of a man whom the most casual observer must have recognized as one who had known military training had changed its alert attitude and was sauntering up and down as if when they came nearer and the light allowed him to see what they were he had lost all interest in them and their doings narkom gave the man a glance from the tail of his eye as they went up the gangplank and boarded the boat and brief as that glance was it was sufficient to assure him of two things first that the man was not only strikingly handsome but bore himself with an air which spoke of culture birth position second that he was a foreigner with the fair hair and the slightly hooked nose which was so characteristic of the mauravanians with dollops at his side narkom slunk aft where the lights were less brilliant and the stern of the boat hung over the dark still waters and pausing there turned and looked back at the waiting man a french sailor was moving past in the darkness he stopped the man and spoke to him tell me he said slipping a shilling into the fellow's hand do you happen to know who that gentleman is standing on the pier there yes monsieur he is equerry to his majesty king ulrich of mauravania he has crossed with us frequently during his majesty's sojourn in paris gold's truth sir whispered dollops plucking nervously at the superintendent's sleeve as the sailor after touching his cap with his forefinger passed on apaches at one end and them mauravanian johnnies at the other i tell you they're a working hand in hand for some reason working against him narkom lifted a silencing hand and turned to move away where there would be less likelihood of anything they might say being overheard for at that moment a voice had sounded and from a most unusual quarter unnoticed until now a fisher's boat which for some time had been nearing the shore swept under the packet's stern and grazed along the stone front of the pier voila monsieur said in french the man who sailed it have i not kept my word and brought your excellency across in safety and with speed yes replied the passenger whom the fisher addressed he spoke in perfect french and with the smoothness of a man of the better class you have done well indeed also it was better than waiting about at calais for the morning boat i can now catch the very first train to london fast is she there is your money adieu then came the sound of some one leaving the boat and scrambling up the water stairs and hard on the heels of it the first whistle of the coming train narkom glancing round saw a slouching ill-clad fellow whose appearance was in distinct contrast with his voice and manner of speaking come into view upon the summit of the pier his complexion was sallow his matted hair seemed to have gone for years uncombed a turkish fez dirty and discoloured was on his head and over his arm hung several bits of tapestry and shining stuff which betokened his calling as that of a seller of oriental draperies this much narkom saw and would have gone on his way giving the fellow no second thought but that a curious thing happened moving away toward the footpath which led from the pier to the town the pedlar caught sight suddenly of the man standing at the gangplank he halted abruptly looked round to make sure that no one was watching then without more ado turned round suddenly on his heel walked straight way to the gangplank and boarded the boat the mauravanian took not the slightest heed of him nor he of the mauravanian afterward when the train had arrived narkom thought he knew why for the present he was merely puzzled to understand why this dirty greasy oriental pedlar who had been at the pains to cross the channel in a fisher's boat should do so for the apparent purpose of merely going back on the packet to calais by this time the train had arrived 
the pier was alive with people porters were running back and forth with luggage and there was bustle and confusion everywhere narkom looked along the length of the vessel to the teeming gangway the mauravanian was still there alert as before his fixed eyes keenly watching a crowd came stringing along bags and bundles done up in gaudy handkerchiefs in their hands laughing jostling jabbering together in low-class french here they are governor the apaches said dollops in a whisper that's the lot sir keep your eye on them as they come aboard and if they're with him crumbs not a sign not a blessed one for the apaches stringing up the gangplank by twos and threes and coming within brushing distance of the waiting man passed on as the oriental peddler had passed on taking no notice of him nor he of them nor yet of how as they advanced the peddler slouched forward and slipped into the thick of them by james one of them that's what the fellow is said narkom as he observed this if during the voyage the mauravanian speaks to one man of the lot he stopped and sucked in his breath and let the rest of the sentence go by default for of a sudden there had come into sight upon the pier a dapper little french dandy fuzzy of moustache mincing of gait with a flower in his buttonhole and a shining topper on his beautifully pomaded head and it came upon narkom with a shock of remembrance that he had seen this self-same living fashion plate pass by scotland yard twice that very day onward he came this pretty monsieur with his jaunty air and his lovely wine-glass waist onward and up the gangway and aboard the packet and there the mauravanian still stood looking out over the crowd and taking no more heed of him than he had taken of anybody else but with the vanishing of this exquisite to whom he had paid no heed his alertness and his interest seemed somehow to evaporate for he turned now and again to watch the sailors and the longshoremen at their several duties and strolled leisurely aboard and stood lounging against the rail of the lower deck when the call of all ashore that's going rang through the vessel's length and was still lounging there when the packet cast off her mooring and swinging her bows round in the direction of france creamed her way out into the channel and headed for calais a wind unnoticed in the safe shelter of the harbour played boisterously across the chopping waves as the vessel forged outward sending clouds of spray sweeping over the bows and along the decks and such passengers as refrained from seeking the shelter of the saloon and smoke-room sought refuge by crowding aft come whispered narkom tapping dollop's arm we can neither talk nor watch here with safety in this crowd let us go for it better a drenching in loneliness than shelter with a crowd like this come along the boy obeyed without a murmur following the larger and heavier built curate along the wet decks to the deserted bows and finding safe retreat with him there in the dark shadow cast by a tarpaulin covered lifeboat from this safe shelter they could by craning their necks get a half view of the interior of the smoke-room through its hooked back door and their first glance in that direction pinned their interest for the pretty monsieur was there smoking a cigarette and sipping now and again at a glass of absinthe which stood on a little round table at his elbow but of the mauravanian or the apaches or the oriental peddler there was neither sight nor sound nor had there been since the vessel started what do you make of it queried narkom when at the end of an hour the dim outlines of the french coast blurred the clear silver of the moonlit sky have we come on a wild goose chase do you think what do you suppose has become of the apaches and of the peddler chap travel in second class said dollops after stealing out and making a round of the vessel and creeping back into the shadow of the lifeboat unseen palin with em is sir making a play of selling em things for their donors for the sake of appearances one of em is and if either that frenchy or that mauravanian johnny is mixed up with em 
Lay low. Smell her to the ground, sir, and eyes and ears wide open. We'll know what's what now. For of a sudden the Mauravanian had come into view far down the wet and glistening promenade deck, and was whistling a curious lilting air as he strolled along past the open door of the smoke-room. Just the mere twitch of Monsieur's head told when he heard that tune. He finished his absinthe, flung aside his cigarette, and strolled leisurely out upon the deck. The Mauravanian was at the after-end of the promenade. A glance told him that. He set his face resolutely in the direction of the bows, and sauntered leisurely along. He moved on quietly, until he came to the very end of the covered promenade, where the curving front of the deck-house looked out upon the spray-washed forward deck, then stopped and planted his back against it, and stood silently waiting, not ten feet distant from where Narkom and Dollops crouched. A minute later the Mauravanian, continuing what was to all appearances a lonely and aimless promenade round the vessel, came abreast of that spot and of him. And then the deluge. Monsieur spoke out, guardedly, but in a clear, crisp tone that left no room for doubt upon one point at least. Mon ami, it is done, it is accomplished that crisp voice said. You shall report that to His Majesty's ministers. Voila, it is done. It is not done, replied the Mauravanian in a swift, biting, emphatic whisper. You jump to conclusions too quickly. Here, take this. It is an evening paper. The thing was useless. He was not there. Not there? Grand Dieu? Shh! Take it. Read it. I will see you when we land. Not here. It is too dangerous. Au revoir. Then he passed on and round the curve of the deck-house to the promenade on the other side, and Monsieur, with the paper hard shut in the grip of a tense hand, moved fleetly back toward the smoke-room, but not unknown any longer. God's truth! A woman! gulped Dollops in a shaking voice. "'No, not a woman, a devil,' said Narkom through his teeth. "'Margot by James, Margot herself. "'And what is he, what is Cleek, "'that a king should enter into compact with a woman to kill him? "'Margot, dash her! "'Well, I'll have you now, my lady. "'Yes, by James, I will.' "'Governor!' "'Gould's truth, sir, where are you going?' "'To the operator in charge of the wireless "'to send a message to the chief of the Calais police "'to meet me on arrival,' said Narkom in reply. "'Stop where you are. Lay low. Wait for me. "'We'll land in a dozen minutes' time. "'I'll have that Jezebel and her confederates, "'and I'll rout out Cleek and get him beyond the clutches of them "'if I tear up all France to do it.' "'God bless you, sir. God bless you and forgive me,' said Dollops, with a lump in his throat and a mist in his eyes. "'I said often you was a sausage and a mufter, but you aren't. You're a man.' Narkom did not hear. He was gone already, down the deck to the cabin of the wireless operator. In another moment he had passed in, shut the door behind him, and the law at sea was talking to the law ashore through the blue ether and across the moonlit waves. End of section two. Prologue, The Affair of the Man Who Vanished, Part Three. It was ten minutes later. The message had gone its way, and Narkom was back in the lifeboat's shadow again and close on the bows the lamps of Calais Pier shone yellow in the blue and silver darkness. On the deck below people were bustling about, and making for the place where the gangplank was to be thrust out presently, and link boat and shore together. On the quay customs officials were making ready for the coming inspection. Porters were scuttling about in their blue smocks and peaked caps, 
and back of all the outlines of Calais town loomed shadowy and grim through the crowding gloom. The loneliness of the upper deck offered its attractions to the Mauravanian and to Margot, and in the emptiness of it they met again, within earshot of the lifeboat where Narkom and the boy lay hidden, for one brief word before they went ashore. "'So you have read. You understand how useless it was.' the Mauravanian said, joining her again at the deck-house, where she stood with the crumpled newspaper in her hand. "'His Majesty's purse cannot be lightened of all that promised sum for any such bungle as this. Speak quickly. Where may we go to talk in safety? I cannot risk it here. I will not risk it in the train. Must we wait until we reach Paris, mademoiselle, or have you a lair of your own here?' have lairs as you term them in half the cities of france monsieur le comte she answered with a vicious little note of resentment in her voice and i do not work for nothing no not i i paid for my adherence to his majesty's prime minister and i intend to be paid for my services to his majesty's self even though i have this once failed it must be settled that question at once and for all, now, to-night. "'I guessed it would be like that,' he answered with a jerk of his shoulders. "'Where shall it be, then? Speak quickly. They are making the landing, and I must not be seen talking with you after we go ashore. Where, then?' "'At the inn of the Seven Sinners, on the Kedlom, a gunshot distant. Any gosher will take you there.' "'Is it safe?' "'All my lairs are safe, monsieur.' It overhangs the water, and if strangers come, there is a trap with a bolt on the underside. One way to the town and the sewers and forty other inns. The other to a motorboat, always in readiness for instant use. You could choose for yourself, should occasion come. You will not find the place shut. My lairs never are. A password? No, there is none, for any but the Brotherhood nor will you need one. You remember old Marie's of the Twisted Arm in Paris? Well, she serves at the Seven Sinners now. I have promoted Madame Serpice to the Twisted Arm. She will know you, will Marie's. Say to her I am coming shortly. She and her maids will raise the roof with joy, and la la, the gangway is out. They are calling all ashore. Look for me and my lads close on your heels when you arrive. Au revoir. Au revoir, he repeated, and slipping by, went below and made his way ashore. She waited that he might get well on his way, that none might by any possibility associate them, then turning, went down after him and out to the pier, where her crew were already foregathering, and when or how she passed the word to them that it was not Paris to-night but the Inn of the Seven Sinners, neither Narkom nor Dollops could decide, close as they came on after her, for she seemed to speak to no one. "'No inn of the seven sinners for you to-night, my lady, if my friend Monsieur Ducroix has attended to that wireless message properly,' muttered Narkom as he followed her. "'Look sharp, Dollops, and if you see a sergent de ville, let me know. They've no luggage, that lot, and besides they're natives, so they will pass the customs in a jiffy.' Hello, there goes that peddler chap, and without his fez or his draperies, begad, through the customs like a flash, the bounder. And there go the others, too, and she after them. She, by James. God, where are Ducroix and his men? Why aren't they here? Looking vainly about for some sign of the chief of police. I can't do anything without him, here on foreign soil. Why, in heaven's name, doesn't the man come? Maybe he hasn't had time, Governor. Maybe he wasn't on hand when the message arrived, hazarded Dollops. It's not fifteen minutes all told since it was dispatched. So if— There she goes! There she goes, past and through the customs in a wink, the Jezebel! interposed Narkom in a fever of excitement as he saw Margot go by the inspector at the door and walk out into the streets of the city. "'Lord, if she slips me now!' "'She shan't!' cut in Dollops, jerking down his hat-brim and turning up his collar. 
Wait here till the cops come. I'll nip out after her and see where she goes. Like as not, the cops will know the place when you mention it, but if they don't, watch out for me. I'll come back and lead them. Then he moved hurriedly forward, past the inspector, and was gone in a twinkling. For ten wretched minutes after he, too, had passed the customs and was at liberty to leave, Narkom paced up and down and fretted and fumed before a sound of clanking sabres caught his ear, and looking round he saw Monsieur Ducroix enter the place at the head of a detachment of police. He hurried to him and in a word made himself known. Ten million pardons, monsieur, but I was absent when the message he shall be delivered, exclaimed Ducroix in broken English. I shall come and shall bring my men as soon as he shall be received. Monsieur, who shall it be, this great criminal you demand of me to arrest? Is he here? No, no. A moment, Ducroix. Do you know a place called the Inn of the Seven Sinners? Perfectly. It is but a stone's throw distant on the Kid Lom. Come with me to it, then. I'll make you the most envied man in France, Ducroix. I'll deliver into your hands that witch of the underworld, Margot, the queen of the Apaches. Ducroix's face lit up like a face transfigured. Monsieur, he cried, that woman? You can give me that woman? You know her? You can recognize her? But yes, I remember. You shall have her in your hands once in your own country, but she shall slip you as she shall slip everybody. She won't slip you, then, I promise you that, said Narkom. Reward and glory both shall be yours. I have followed her across the channel, Ducroix. I know where she is to be found for a certainty. She is at the Inn of the Seven Sinners. Just take me there and I'll turn the Jezebel over to you. Ducroix needed no urging. The prospect of such a capture made him fairly beside himself with delight. In twenty swift words he translated this glorious news to his men, setting them as wild with excitement as he was himself. Then, with a sharp, "'Come, monsieur,' he turned on his heel and led the breathless race for the goal. Halfway down the narrow ink-black street that led to the inn, they encountered Dollops pelting back at full speed. "'Come on, governor, come on, all of you,' he broke out as he came abreast of them. "'She's there!' They're all there, kicking up Meg's diversion, sir, and singing and dancing like mad. And, sir, he's there, too, the peddler chap. I see him come up and sneak in with the rest. Come on, this way, all of you. If they had merely run before, they all but flew now, for this second assurance that Margot, the great and long-sought-for Margot, was actually within their reach, served to spur every man to outdo himself so that it was but a minute or two later when they came in sight of the inn and bore down upon it in a solid phalanx. And then, just then, when another minute would have settled everything, the demon of mischance chose to play them a scurvy trick. All they knew of it was that an Apache, coming out of the building for some purpose of his own, looked up and saw them, then faced round and bent back in the doorway that of a sudden a very tornado of music and laughter and singing and dancing rolled out into the night, and that when they came pounding up to the doorway, the fellow was lounging there, serenely smoking, and inside his colleagues were holding a revel wild enough to wake the dead. In the winking of an eye he was carried off his feet and swept on by this sudden inrush of the law. The door clashed open, the little slatted barrier beyond was knocked aside, and the police were pouring into the room and running headlong into a spinning mass of wild dancers. The band ceased suddenly as they appeared. The dancers cried out as if in a panic of alarm, and at Ducroix's commanding, Surrender in the name of the law! A fat woman behind the bar flung up her arms and voiced a despairing shriek. So love misfortune for what, monsieur, for what? she cried. It is no sin to laugh and dance. We break no law, my customers and I. What is it you want that you come in upon us like this? Ah, oh, what indeed? Not anything that could be seen. 
a glance round the room showed nothing and no one but these suddenly disturbed dancers and of margot and the mauravanian never a sign monsieur began ducroix turning to narkom whose despair was only too evident and who in company with dollops was rushing about the place pushing people here and there looking behind them looking in all the corners and generally deporting themselves after the manner of a couple of hounds endeavouring to pick up a lost scent monsieur shall it be an error then narkom did not answer of a sudden however he remembered what had been said of the trap and pushing aside a group of girls standing over it found it in the middle of the floor here it is this is the way she got out he shouted bolted by james bolted on the underside up with it up with it the jezebel got out this way but though ducroix and dollops aided him and they pulled and tugged and tugged and pulled they could not budge it one inch monsieur no what madness he is not a trap no he is not a trap at all protested old marise it is but a square where the floor broke and was mended mother of misfortune it is nothing but that what response narkom might have made was checked by a sudden discovery huddling in a corner feigning a drunken sleep he saw a man lying with his face hidden in his folded arms it was the peddler he pounced on the man and jerked up his head before the fellow could prevent it or could dream of what was about to happen here's one of them at least he cried and fell to shaking him with all his force here's one of margot's pals du croix you shan't go empty-handed after all a cry of consternation fluttered through the gathering as he brought the man's face into view evidently they were past masters of the art of acting these apaches for one might have sworn that every man and every woman of them was taken aback by the fellow's presence mother of miracles who shall the man be exclaimed marise monsieur i know him not i have not seen him in all my life before cochon speak up who are you that you come in like this and get a respectable widow in trouble dog eh the man made a motion first to his ears then to his mouth then fell to making movements in the sign language but spoke never a word la la he is a deaf mute monsieur said ducroix he hears not and speaks not poor unfortunate oh doesn't he said narkom with an ugly laugh he spoke well enough a couple of hours back i promise you my young friend here and i heard him when he paid off the fisherman who had carried him over to dover just before he sneaked aboard the packet to come back with margot and the mauravanian the eyes of the apaches flew to the man's face with a sudden keen interest which only they might understand but he still stood wagging his great head either drunkenly or idiotically and pointing to ears and mouth lay hold of him run him in said narkom whirling him across into the arms of a couple of stalwart sergents de ville i'll go before the magistrate and lay a charge against him in the morning that will open your eyes when you hear it one of a bloodthirsty dynamiting crew the dog lay fast hold of him don't let him get away on your lives god to have lost that woman to have lost her after all it was a sore blow certainly but there was nothing to do but to grin and bear it for to seek margot at any of the inns which might communicate with the sewer trap or to hunt for her and a motor-boat on the dark water's surface was in very truth like looking for a needle in a haystack and quite as hopeless he therefore decided to go for the rest of the night to the nearest hotel and waiting only to see the peddler carried away in safe custody and promising to be on hand when he was brought up before the local magistrate in the morning took dollops by the arm and dejectedly went his way the morning saw him living up to his promise 
and long before the arrival of the magistrate, or indeed before the night's harvest of prisoners was brought over from the lock-up, and thrust into the three little detention-rooms below the court, he was there with Dollops and Ducroix, observing with wonder that groups of evil-looking fellows of the Apache breed were hanging round the building as he approached, and that later on others of the same kidney slipped in and took seats in the little courtroom, and kept constantly whispering one to the other while they waited for the morning session to begin. "'God's truth, Governor! Look at em! The old blessed place is alive with the banders!' whispered Dollops. "'What do you think they're up to, sir? Making a rush and setting the peddler free when he comes up before the beak? There's twenty of em waiting round the door if there's one!' Narkom made no reply. The arrival of the magistrate focused all eyes on the bench and riveted his attention with the rest. The proceedings opened with all the trivial cases first. The night's sweep of the dragnet, drunks and disorderlies, vagrants and pariahs. One by one these were brought in and paid their fines and went their way unheeded. For this part of the morning's proceedings interested nobody, not even the Apaches. The list was dragged through monotonously. The last blear-eyed sot, a hideous, cadaverous, monkey-faced wretch, whose brutal countenance sickened Narkom when he shambled up in his filthy rags, had paid his fine and gone his way, and there remained now but a case of attempted suicide to be disposed of before the serious cases began. This latter occupied the magistrate's time and attention for perhaps twenty minutes or so, then that too was disposed of, and then a voice was heard calling out for the unknown man arrested last night at the Inn of the Seven Sinners to be brought forward. In an instant a ripple of excitement ran through the little court. The Apache fraternity sat up within, and passed the word to the Apache fraternity without, and these stood at attention, close-lipped, dark-browed, eager, like human tigers waiting for the word to spring. Every eye was fixed on the door through which that pretended mute should be led in, but although others had come at the first call, he came not even at the second, and the magistrate had just issued an impatient command for the case to be called yet a third time, when there was a clatter of hasty footsteps, and the keeper of the detention-rooms burst into the court, pale as a dead man, and shaking in every nerve. "'Monsieur le juge!' he cried out, extending his two arms. "'Soul of misfortunes, how shall I tell? He is not there! He is gone! He is escaped, that unknown one!' when i shall unlock the room and call for jean lamarot the drunkard at the case before last there shall come out of the dimness to me what i shall think is he and i shall bring him here and he shall be fine and dismissed but monsieur he shall not be jean lamarot after all i shall go now and call for the unknown and i shall get no answer i shall go in and make up the place light and there he shall be that real jean lamarot stripped of his clothes choked to unconsciousness alone on the floor and the other shall have paid his fine and gone a great cry went up a wild confusion filled the court the apaches within rose and ran with the news to the apaches without and these joining forces scattered and ran through the streets in the direction the escaped prisoner had been seen to take but through it all Narkom sat there squeezing his hands together and laughing in little shaking gusts that had a heart-throb wavering through them, for to him this could mean but one thing. Cleek, he said, leaning down and shrilling a joyous whisper into Dollop's ear, but one man in all the world could have done that thing. But one man in all the world would have dared. It was he, it was Cleek. God bless his bully soul. Amen, sir, said Dollops, swallowing something. Then he rose at Narkom's bidding and followed him outside. 
A minute later, a gamin brushing against them put out a grimy hand and said whiningly, Boulogne, monsieur, Quai des Anges, third house back from the water side, in time for the noon boat across to Folkestone. Give me two francs, please. The monsieur said you would if I said that to you when you came out. The two francs were in his hand almost as he ceased speaking, and in less than a minute later a fiacre was whirling Narkom and Dollops off to the railway station and the next outgoing train to Boulogne. It was still short of midday when they arrived at the Quai des Anges and made their way to the third house back from the waterside, a little tavern with a toy garden in front and a sort of bowered arcade behind and there under an almond tree with a cigarette between his fingers and a bunch of flowers in his buttonhole they came upon him at last governor oh god bless you governor is it really you again said dollops rushing up to him like a girl to a lover yes it is really i he answered with one of his easy laughs then he rose and held out his hand as narkom advanced and for a moment or two they stood there, palm in palm, saying not one word, making not one sound. "'Nearly did for me, my overzealous friend,' said Cleek, after a time. "'I could have kicked you when you turned up with that lot at the Seven Sinners. Another ten minutes, and I'd have had that in my hands which would have compelled His Majesty of Mauravania to give Irma his liberty, and to abdicate in his consort's favour but you came you dear old blunderer and when i looked up and recognized you well let it pass i was on my way back to london when i chanced to see count valdemar on watch beside the gangway of the calais packet he had slipped me the hound slipped me in paris and i saw my chance to run him down gad it was a close squeak that when you let those apaches know that i had just crossed over from this side and had gone aboard the packet because i saw valdemar they guessed then i couldn't speak there and i dared not speak in the court they were there on every hand inside the building and out waiting to knife me the instant they were sure i had to get out i had to get past them and voila he turned and laid an affectionate hand on dollop's shoulder and laughed softly and pleasantly new place all right old chap garden doing well and all my traps in shipshape order eh yes sir god bless you sir everything sir everything good lad then we'll be off to them my holiday is over mr narkom and i'm going back into harness again you want me i see and i said i'd come if you did give me a few days rest in old england dear friend and then out with your riddles and i'm your man again End of section three. Chapter one. This will be it, I think, sir, said Leonard, bringing the limousine to a halt at the head of a branching lane, thick set with lime and chestnut trees, between whose double wall of green one could catch a distant glimpse of the river, shining golden in the five o'clock light. Look, see, there's the signpost to the sleeping mermaid over to the left there anything pinned to it or hanging on it mr narkom spoke from the interior of the vehicle without making even the slightest movement toward alighting merely glancing at a few memoranda scribbled on the back of a card whose reverse bore the words taverne maladosie que des anges boulogne printed upon it in rather ornate script a bit of rag, a scrap of newspaper, a fowl's feather, anything? Look sharp. No, sir, not a thing of any sort that I can see from here. Shall I nip over and make sure? Yes, only don't give away the fact that you are examining it in case there should be anybody on the lookout. If you find the smallest thing, even a carpet tack attached to the post, get back into your seat at once and cut off townward as fast as you can make the car travel right you are sir said leonard and forthwith did as he had been bidden 
in less than ninety seconds however he was back with the word that the post's surface was as smooth as your hand and not a thing of any sort attached to it from top to bottom narkom fetched a deep breath of relief at this news tucked the card into his pocket and got out immediately hang round the neighbourhood somewhere and keep your ears open in case i should have to give the signal sooner than i anticipate he said then twisted round on his heel turned into the tree-bordered lane and bore down in the direction of the river when still short by thirty yards or so of its flowered and willow-fringed brim he came upon a quaint little diamond-paned red-roofed low-eaved house set far back from the shore with a garden full of violets and primroses and flaunting crocuses in front of it and a tangle of blossoming things crowding what once had been a bower-bordered bowling green in the rear queen anne for a ducket he commented as he looked at the place and took in every detail from the magpie in the old pointed-topped wicker cage hanging from a nail beside the doorway to the rudely carved figure of a mermaid over the jutting flower-filled diamond-paned window of the bar parlour with its swinging sashes and its oak beam sill shoulder high from the green sweet-smelling earth how the dickens does he ferret out these places i wonder and what fool has put his money into a show like this in these days of advancement and enterprise buried away from the line of traffic ashore and shut in by trees from the river gad they can't do a pound's worth of business in a month at an out-of-the-way roost like this certainly they were not doing much of it that day for as he passed through the tap-room he caught a glimpse of the landlady dozing in a deep chair by the window and of the back of a by no means smartly dressed barmaid who might have been stone deaf for all notice she took of his entrance standing on a stool behind the bar dusting and polishing the woodwork of the shelves the door of the bar parlour was open and through it narkom caught a glimpse of a bent-kneed stoop-shouldered doddering old man shuffling about filling match-boxes wiping ash-trays and carefully refolding the rumpled newspapers that lay on the centre table that he was not the proprietor merely a waiter the towel over his arm the shabby old dress-coat the baggy-kneed trousers would have been evidence enough without that added by the humble tasks he was performing poor devil and at his age said narkom to himself as he noted the pale hopeless-looking time-worn face and the shuffling time-bent body then moved by a sense of keen pity he walked into the room and spoke gently to him tea for two uncle at a quarter past five to the tick if you can manage it he said tossing the old man a shilling and say to the landlady that i'd like to have exclusive use of this room for an hour or two so she can charge the loss to my account if she has to turn any other customers away thank ye sir i'll attend to it at once sir replied the old fellow pocketing the coin and moving briskly away to give the order in another minute he was back again laying the cloth and setting out the dishes while narkom improved the time of waiting by straying round the room and looking at the old prints and cases of stuffed fishes that hung on the oak-panelled walls it still wanted a minute or so of being a quarter past five when the old man bore in the tea-tray itself and set it upon the waiting table and little custom though the place enjoyed narkom could not but compliment it upon its promptness and the inviting quality of the viands served you may go he said to the waiter when the man at length bowed low and announced that all was ready then after a moment turning round and finding him still shuffling about i say you may go he reiterated a trifle sharply no don't take the cosy off the teapot leave it as it is the gentleman i am expecting has not arrived yet and look here will you have the goodness to let that cosy alone and to clear out when i tell you by james if you don't hello what the dickens was that 
that was undoubtedly the tingle of a handful of gravel against the panes of the window a sign that the coast is quite clear and that you have not been followed dear friend said a voice cleek's voice in reply shall we not sit down i'm famishing and as narkom turned round on his heel with the certainty that no one had entered the room since the door was closed and he himself before it the tea-cosy was whipped off by a hand that no longer shook the waiter's bent figure straightened his pale drawn features writhed blent settled into placid calmness and the thing was done by all that's wonderful cleek blurted out narkom delightedly and lurched toward him sh gently gently my friend he interposed putting up a warning hand it is true that dollops has signalled that there is no one in the vicinity likely to hear but although the maid is both deaf and dumb recollect that mrs condiment is neither and i have no more wish for her to discover my real calling than i ever had mrs condiment repeated narkom sinking his voice and speaking in a tone of agitation and amazement you don't mean to tell me that the old woman you employed as housekeeper when you lived in clarges street is here certainly she is the landlady her assistant is that same deaf and dumb maid of all work who worked with her at the old house and is sharing with her a sort of retirement here captain burbage set the pair of them up in business here two days after his departure from clarges street and pays them a monthly wage sufficient to make up for any lack of custom all that they are bound to do is to allow a pensioner of the captain's a poor old half-witted ex-waiter called joseph to come and go as he will and to gratify a whim for waiting upon people if he chooses to do so what's that no the captain does not live here he and his henchman dollops are supposed to be out of the country mrs condiment does not know where he lives nor will she ever be permitted to do so you may some day perhaps that is for the future to decide but not at present my dear friend it is too risky why risky old chap surely i can come and go in disguise as i did in the old days cleek we managed secret visits all right then remember yes i know but things have changed mr narkom you may disguise yourself as cleverly as you please but you can't disguise the red limousine it is known and it will be followed so until you can get another of a totally different colour and appearance i'll ring you up each morning at the yard and we can make our appointments over your private wire for the present we must take no great risks in the days that lie behind dear friend i had no tracker to guard against but margot no enemies but her paltry crew to reckon with and to outwit in these i have many they have brains these new foes they are rich they are desperate they are powerful and behind them is the implacable hate and the malignant hand of no matter you wouldn't understand i can make a devilish good guess then rapped in narkom a trifle testily his vanity a little hurt by that final suggestion and his mind harking back to the brief enlightening conversation between margot and count valdemar that night on the spray-swept deck of the channel packet behind them is the implacable hate and the malignant hand of the king of mauravania what utter rubbish cleek's jeering laughter fairly stung it was so full of pitying derision my friend have you taken to reading penny novelettes of late a thief-taker and a monarch an ex-criminal and a king i should have given you credit for more common sense it was the king of mauravania's equerry who directed that attempt to kill you by blowing up the house in clarges street very possibly but that does not incriminate his royal master 
count valdemar is not only equerry to king ulric of mauravania but is also nephew to its ex-prime minister the gentleman who is doing fifteen years energetic labour for the british government as a result of that attempt to trap me with his witless silver snare oh said narkom considerably crestfallen then grasped at yet another straw with sudden breathless eagerness but even then the head of the mauravanian government must have had some reason for wishing to wipe you out he added earnestly there could be no question of avenging an uncle's overthrow at that time cleek his voice running thin and eager his hand shutting suddenly upon his famous ally's arm cleek trust me won't you can't you as god hears me old chap i'll respect it who are you what are you man cleek he made answer calmly drawing out a chair and taking his seat at the table cleek of scotland yard cleek of the forty faces which you will who should know that better than you whose helping hand has made me what i am yes but before cleek what were you who were you in the days before the vanishing cracksman a dog who would have gone on no doubt to a dog's end but for your kind hand and the dear eyes of ailsa lorne now give me my tea i'm famishing and after that we'll talk of this new riddle that needs unriddling for the honour of the yard yes thanks two lumps and just a mere dash of milk cad it's good to be back in england dear friend it's good it's good end of section four chapter two five men eh said cleek glancing up at mr narkom who for two or three minutes past had been giving him a sketchy outline of the case in hand a goodish many that and all inside of the past six weeks you say no wonder the papers have been hammering the yard if as you suggest they were not accidental deaths sure they are not as uh, sure as i am that i am speaking to you at this minute i had my doubts in the beginning there seemed so little to connect the separate tragedies but when case after case followed with exactly or nearly exactly the same details in every instance one simply had to suspect foul play naturally even a donkey must know that there's food about if he smells thistles begin at the beginning please how did the affair start when and where in the neighbourhood of hampstead heath at two o'clock in the morning the constable on duty in the district came upon a man clad only in pyjamas lying face downward under the wall surrounding a corner house still warm but as dead as queen anne in his pyjamas eh said cleek reaching for a fresh slice of toast pretty clear evidence that that poor beggar's trouble whatever it was must have overtaken him in bed and that that bed was either in the vicinity of the spot where he was found or else the man had been carried in a closed vehicle to the place where the constable discovered him a chap can't walk far in that kind of a get-up without attracting attention and the body was warm you say when found hmm any vehicle seen or heard in the vicinity of the spot just previously not the ghost of one the night was very still and the constable must have heard if either cab auto carriage or dray had passed in any direction whatsoever he is positive that none did naturally he thought as you suggested just now that the man must have come from some house in the neighbourhood investigation however proved that he did not in short that nobody could be found who had ever seen him before indeed it is hardly likely that he could have been sleeping in any of the surrounding houses 
for the neighbourhood is a very good one and the man had the appearance of being a person of the labouring class any marks on the clothing or body not one beyond a tattooed heart on the left forearm which caused the coroner to come to the conclusion later that the man had at some time been either a soldier or a sailor why the tattooing was evidently of foreign origin he said from the skilful manner in which it had been performed and the brilliant colour of the pigments used beyond that the body bore no blemish the man had not been stabbed he had not been shot and a post-mortem examination of the viscera proved conclusively that he had not been poisoned neither had he been strangled etherized drowned or bludgeoned for the brain was in no way injured and the lungs were in a healthy condition it was noticed however that the passages of the throat and nose were unduly red and that there was a slightly distended condition of the bowels this latter however was set down by the physicians as the natural condition following enteric from which it was positive that the man had recently suffered they attributed the slightly inflamed condition of the nasal passage and throat to his having either swallowed or snuffed up something camphor or something of that sort to allay the progress of the enteric although even by analysis they were unable to discover a trace of camphor or indeed of any foreign substance whatsoever the body was held in the public mortuary for several days awaiting identification but nobody came forward to claim it so it was eventually buried in the usual way and a verdict of found dead entered in the archives against the number given to it the matter had excited but little comment on the part of the public or the newspapers and would never have been recalled but for the astonishing fact that just two nights after the burial a second man was found under precisely similar circumstances only that this second man was clad in boots under vest and trousers he was found in a sort of gully down which from the marks on the side he had evidently fallen behind some furze bushes at a far and little frequented part of the heath an autopsy established the fact that this man had died in a precisely similar manner to the first but what was more startling that he had evidently predeceased that first victim by several days for when found decomposition had already set in hmm i see said cleek arching his brows and stirring his tea rather slowly a clear case of what paddy would term the second fellow being the first one go on please what next oh a perfect fever of excitement of course for it now became evident that a crime had been committed in both instances and the press made a great to-do over it within the course of the next fortnight it was positively frothing throwing panic into the public mind by the wholesale and whipping up people's fears like a madman stirring a salad for by that time a third body had been found under some furze bushes upward of half a mile distant from where the second had been discovered like the first body this one was wearing night clothes but it was in an even more advanced state of decomposition than the second showing that the man must have died long before either of them oh ho said cleek with a strong rising inflection what a blundering idiot our assassin is evidently a raw hand at the game mr narkom and not as i had begun to fancy either a professional or the appointed agent of some secret society following a process of extermination against certain marked men neither the secret agent nor the professional bandit would be guilty of the extreme folly of operating several times in the same locality be assured and here is this muddling amateur letting himself be lulled into a feeling of security by the failure of anybody to discover the bodies of the first victims 
and then going at it again in the same place and the same way for it is fair to assume i dare say that the fourth man was discovered under precisely similar circumstances to the first not exactly very like them but not exactly like them cleek as a matter of fact he was alive when found i didn't credit the report when i first heard it a newspaper man brought it to me and sent petrie to investigate the truth of it why didn't you believe the report because it seemed so wildly improbable and besides they had hatched up so many yarns those newspaper reporters since the affair began according to this fellow a tramp crossing the heath in quest of a place to sleep had been frightened half out of his wits by hearing a voice which he described as being like the voice of someone strangling calling out in the darkness sapphires sapphires and a few moments later when as the reporter said the tramp told him he was scuttling away in a panic he came suddenly upon the figure of a man who was dancing round and round like a whirling dervish with his mouth wide open his tongue hanging out and the forefinger of each hand stuck in his nostril as if what's that what's that cleek's voice flicked in like the crack of a whip good god dancing round in circles his mouth open his tongue hanging out his fingers thrust into his nostrils was that what you said yes why do you see anything promising in that fact cleek it seems to excite you never mind about that stick to the subject was that report found to be correct then in a measure yes only of course one had to take the tramp's assertion that the man had been calling out sapphires upon faith for when discovered and conveyed to the hospital he was in a comatose condition and beyond making any sound at all he died without recovering consciousness about twenty minutes after petra's arrival and although the doctors performed a post-mortem immediately after the breath had left his body there was not a trace of anything to be found that differed in the slightest from the other cases heart brain liver lungs all were in a healthy condition and beyond the reddened throat and signs of recent enterics there was nothing abnormal but his lips his lips mr narkom was there a smear of earth upon them was he lying on his face when found were his fingers clenched in the grass did it look as if he had been biting the soil yes replied narkom as a matter of fact there was both earth and grass in the mouth the doctors removed it carefully examined it under the microscope even subjected it to chemical test in the hope of discovering some foreign substance mixed with the mass but failed utterly to discover a single trace of course of course it would be gone like a breath gone like a passing cloud if it were that if it were what cleek my dear fellow good lord you don't mean to tell me you've got a clue perhaps perhaps don't worry me he made answer testily then rose and walked over to the window and stood there alone pinching his chin between his thumb and forefinger and staring fixedly at things beyond after a time however yes it could be that assuredly it could be that he said in a low-sunk voice as if answering a query but in england in this far land in malay yes in ceylon certainly and sapphires too sapphires Mm, they mine them there one man had travelled in foreign parts and been tattooed by natives so that the self-same country just so of course of course but who but how and in england his voice dropped off he stood for a minute or so in absolute silence, drumming noiselessly with his fingertips upon the window sill, 
then turned abruptly and spoke to Mr. Narkom. "'Go on with the story, please,' he said. "'There was a fifth man, I believe. When and how did his end come?' like the others for the most part but with one startling difference instead of being undressed nothing had been removed but his collar and boots he was killed on the night i started with dollops for the continent in quest of you and his was the second body that was not actually found on the heath like the first man he was found under the wall which surrounds lemmingham house lemmingham house what's that a hotel or a private residence a private residence owned and occupied by mr james barrington edwards any relation to that captain barrington edwards who was cashiered from the army some twenty years ago for conduct unbecoming an officer and a gentleman the same man aho uh -huh. the same man eh Cleek's tone was full of sudden interest. Stop a bit. Let me put my thinking box into operation. Captain Barrington Edwards. Hmm. That little military unpleasantness happened out in Ceylon, did it not? The gentleman had a fancy for conjuring tricks, I believe, even went so far as to study them first hand under the tutelage of native fakirs and was subsequently caught cheating at cards. That's the man, isn't it? Yes, said Narkom. That's the man. I'll have something startling to tell you in connection with him presently, but not in connection with that card-cheating scandal. He always swore that he was innocent of that. In fact, that it was a put-up job by one of the other officers for the sake of ruining him. Yes, I know. They all say that. It's the only thing they can say. Still, I always believed him, Cleek. He's been a pretty straightforward man in all my dealings with him, and I've had several. Besides which, he is highly respected these days. Then, too, there's the fact that the fellow he said put up the job against him for the sake of blackening him in the eyes of his sweetheart eventually married the girl. So it does look rather fishy. However, although it ruined Barrington Edwards for the time being, and embittered him so that he never married, he certainly had the satisfaction of knowing that the fellow who had caused this trouble turned out an absolute rotter, spent all his wife's money, and brought her down to absolute beggary. Whereas if she'd stuck to Barrington Edwards, she'd have been a wealthy woman indeed today. He's worth half a million at the least calculation." "'How's that? Somebody die and leave him a fortune?' "'No, he had a little of his own. Speculated while he was in the East in precious stones and land which he had reason to believe likely to produce them. Succeeded beyond his wildest hopes, and is today head of the firm of Barrington Edwards, Morpeth, and Furman, the biggest dealers in precious stones that Hatton Garden can boast of.' Oh said cleek i see i see and screwed round on his heel and looked out of the window again then after a moment and mr barrington edwards lives in the neighbourhood of hampstead heath does he he asked quite calmly alone no with his nephew and heir young mr archer blaine a dead sister's only child as a matter of fact, it was Mr. Archer Blaine himself who discovered the body of the fifth victim. Coming home at a quarter to one from a visit to an old college friend, he found the man lying stone dead in the shadow of the wall surrounding Lemmingham House, and, of course, lost no time in dashing indoors for a police whistle and summoning the constable on point duty in the district. The body was at once given in charge of a hastily summoned detachment from the yard and conveyed to the Hampstead mortuary, where it still lies awaiting identification. Been photographed? Not as yet. Of course it will be, as were the other four, prior to the time of burial, should nobody turn up to claim it. 
but in this instance we have great hopes that identification will take place on the strength of a marked peculiarity the man is web-footed and the man is what rapped in cleek excitedly web-footed repeated narkom the several toes are attached one to the other by a thin membrane after the manner of a duck's feet and on the left foot there is a peculiar horny protuberance like like a rudimentary sixth toe interrupted cleek fairly flinging the eager query at him it is eh well by the eternal i once knew a fellow years ago in the far east whose feet were malformed like that and if by any possibility stop a bit a word more is that man a big fellow broad-shouldered muscular and about forty or forty-five years of age you've described him to a t dear chap there is however a certain other peculiarity which you have not mentioned though that of course may be a recent acquirement the palm of the right hand wait a bit wait a bit interposed cleek a trifle irritably he had swung away from the window and was now walking up and down the room with short nervous steps his chin pinched up between his thumb and forefinger his brows knotted and his eyes fixed upon the floor saffragam jaffna trincomalee in all three of them in all three he said putting his running thoughts into muttered words and now a dead man sticks his fingers in his nostrils and talks of sapphires sapphires eh and the saffragam district stuck thick with them as spangles on a nautch girl's veil the bereva for a ducat the bereva reef or i'm a dutchman and barrington edwards was in that with the rest so was peabody so was miles and so too were lieutenant edgeburn and the spaniard juan alvarez eight of them begat eight and i was ass enough to forget idiot enough not to catch the connection until i heard again of jim peabody's web foot but wait stop there should be another marked foot if this is indeed a clue to the riddle and so he stopped short in his restless pacing and faced round on mr narkom tell me something he said in a sharp staccato the four other dead men did any among them have an injured foot the left or the right i forget which from which all toes but the big one had been torn off by a crocodile's bite so that in life the fellow must have limped a little when he walked did any of the dead men bear a mark like that no said narkom the feet of all the others were normal in every particular hm that's a bit of a setback and i am either on the wrong track or alvarez is still alive what's that oh it doesn't matter a mere fancy of mine that's all now let's get back to our mutton please you are going to tell me something about the right hand of the man with the web foot what was it the palm bore certain curious hieroglyphics traced upon it in bright purple hieroglyphics eh that doesn't look quite so promising said cleek in a disappointed tone it is quite possible that there may be more than one web-footed man in the world so of course <clears throat> what were those hieroglyphics mr narkom can you describe them i can do better my dear chap replied the superintendent dipping into an inner pocket and bringing forth a brown leather case i took an accurate tracing of them from the dead hand this morning and there you are that's what's on his palm cleek close to the base of the forefinger running diagonally across it cleek took the slip of tracing paper and carried it to the window for the twilight was deepening and the room was filling with shadows in the middle of the thin transparent sheet was traced this reader's note the image shows what appears to be an unintelligible scribble End of note. 
he turned it up and down he held it to the light and studied it for a moment or two in perplexed silence then of a sudden he faced round and narkom could see that his eyes were shining and that the curious one-sided smile peculiar unto him was looping up his cheek my friend he said answering the eager query in the superintendent's look this is yet another vindication of poe's theory that things least hidden are best hidden and that the most complex mysteries are those which are based on the simplest principles with your permission i'll keep this tucking the tracing into his pocket and afterward i will go to the mortuary and inspect the original meantime i will go so far as to tell you that i know the motive for these murders i know the means and if you will give me forty-eight hours to solve the riddle at the end of that time i'll know the man i will even go farther and tell you the names of the victims and all on the evidence of your neat little tracing the web-footed man was one james peabody a farrier at one time attached to the blue cavalry at trincomalee ceylon another was joseph miles an irishman bitten early with the wanderlust which takes men everywhere and in making rolling stones of them suffers them to gather no moss still another and probably from the tattoo mark on his arm the first victim found was thomas hart able-bodied seaman formerly in service on the p and o line the remaining two were alexander mccurdy a scotchman and t jenkins quegg a yankee the latter however was a naturalized englishman and both were privates in her late majesty's army and honorably discharged cleek my dear fellow are you a magician said narkom sinking into a chair overcome oh no my friend merely a man with a memory that's all and i happen to remember a curious little pool that was made up of eight men five of them are dead the other three are juan alvarez a spaniard that lieutenant edgeburn who married and beggared the girl captain barrington edwards lost when he was disgraced and last of all the ex-captain barrington edwards himself gently gently my friend don't excite yourself all these murders have been committed with a definite purpose in view with a devil's instrument and for the devil's own stake riches those riches mr narkom were to come in the shape of precious stones the glorious sapphires of ceylon and five of the eight men who were to reap the harvest of them died mysteriously in the vicinity of lemmingham house cleek my hat narkom sprang up as he spoke and then sat down again in a sort of panic and he barrington edwards the man that lives there deals in precious stones then that man gently my friend gently don't bang away at the first rabbit that bolts out of the hole it may be a wee one and you'll lose the buck that follows two men live in that house remember mr archer blaine is mr barrington edwards heir as well as his nephew and who knows End of section 5、Chapter 3 Cinnamon! What a corroboration! What a horrible corroboration! Cleek, you knock the last prop from under me. You make certain a thing that I thought was only a woman's wild imaginings, said Narkom, getting up suddenly, all a tremble with excitement. Good heavens, to have Miss Valmond's story corroborated in this dreadful way. Miss Valmond? Who's she? Any relation to that Miss Rose Valmond, whose name one sees in the papers so frequently, in connection with gifts to Catholic orphanages and foundling homes? The same lady, replied Narkom. Her charities are numberless, her life a psalm. I think she has done more good in her simple, undemonstrative way than half the guilds and missions in London. 
she has an independent fortune and lives in company with an invalid and almost imbecile mother and a brother who is i am told studying for the priesthood in a beautiful home surrounded by splendid grounds the walls of which separate her garden from that of lemmingham house ah i see then she is a neighbour of barrington edwards yes from the back windows of her residence one can look into the grounds of his that is how cleek mr narkom's voice shook with agitation you will remember i said a little time back that i would have something startling to tell you in connection with barrington edwards something that was not connected with that old army scandal if it had not been for the high character of my informant if it had been any other woman in all england i should have thought she was suffering from nerves fancying things as the result of an overwrought mind sent into a state of hysteria through all those abominable crimes in the neighbourhood but when it was she when it was miss valmond uh -huh, said cleek screwing round suddenly then miss valmond told you something with regard to barrington edwards yes a horrible something she came to me this morning looking as i hope i shall never see a good woman look again as if she had been tortured to the last limit of human endurance she had been fighting a silent battle for weeks and weeks she said but her conscience would not let her keep the appalling secret any longer neither would her duty to heaven wakened in the dead of night by a sense of oppression she had gone to her window to open it for air and looking down by chance into the garden of lemmingham house she had seen a man come rushing out of the rear door of barrington edwards place in his pyjamas closely followed by another whom she believed to be barrington edwards himself and she had seen that man unlock the door in the side wall and pushed the poor wretch out into the road where he was afterward found by the constable by jupiter ah you may be moved when you connect that circumstance with what you have yourself unearthed but there is worse to come unable to overcome a frightful fascination which drew her night after night to that window she saw that same thing happen again to the fourth and finally the fifth man the web-footed one and that last time she saw the face of the pursuer quite plainly it was barrington edwards sure of that was she absolutely it was the positive certainty it was he that drove her at last to speak cleek made no reply no comment merely screwed round on his heel and took to pacing the floor again after a minute however mr narkom he said halting abruptly i suppose all my old duds are still in the locker of the limousine aren't they good i thought so give leonard the signal will you i must risk the old car in an emergency like this take me first to the cable office please then to the mortuary and afterward to miss valmont's home i hate to torture her further poor girl but i must get all the facts of this first hand he did the limousine was summoned at once and inside of an hour it set him down looking the very picture of a solicitor's clerk at the cable office then picked up and set him down at the hampstead mortuary this time making so good a counterpart of petrie that even hammond who was on guard beside the dead man said hello pete that you thought you was off duty to-day as he came in with the superintendent jim peabody fast enough mr narkom commented cleek when they were left together beside the dead man changed of course in all the years but still poor old jim good-hearted honest but illiterate could barely more than write his name and even that without a capital poor chap let me look at the hand a violet smudge on the top of the thumb as well as those marks on the palm i see hmm 
any letters or writing of any sort in the pockets when found none eh that old bone-handled pocket-knife there his yes i'd like to look at it open it please thanks i thought so i thought so those the socks he had on poor wretch down to that at last eh down to that let me have one of them for a day or so will you and yes the photographs of the other four please thanks very much no that's all now then to call on miss valmond if you don't mind right you are let her go leonard down with the blinds and open with a locker again mr narkom and we'll dig mr george headland out of his two months old grave and at exactly ten minutes after eight o'clock mr george headland was dug up and was standing with mr narkom in rose valmont's house listening to rose valmont's story from her own lips and saying to himself the while that here surely was that often talked of seldom seen creature a woman with an angel's face how it distressed her to tell again this story which might take away a human life was manifest from the trembling of her sweet voice the painful twitching of her tender mouth and the tears that rose so readily to her soft eyes oh mr headland i can hardly reconcile myself to having done it even yet she said pathetically i do not know this mr barrington edwards but by sight and it seems such a horrible thing to rise up against a stranger like that but i couldn't keep it any longer i felt that to do so would be equivalent to sharing his guilt and the thought that if i kept silent i might possibly be paving the way to the sacrifice of other innocent lives almost drove me out of my mind i can quite understand your feelings miss valmond said cleek touched to the very heart by the deep distress of her but may i say i think you have done right i never yet knew heaven to be anything but tender to those who do their duty and you certainly have done yours to yourself to your fellow creatures and to god before she could make any response to this footsteps sounded from the outer passage and a deep rich masculine voice said rose rose dear i am ready now and almost in the same moment a tall well set up man in priestly clothing crossed the threshold and entered the room he stopped short as he saw the others and made a hasty apology oh pardon me he said i did not know that you had visitors dear otherwise eh what mr narkom is it not yes mr valmond replied the superintendent holding out a welcoming hand it is i and this is my friend and assistant mr george headland we have just been talking with your sister over her trying experience terrible terrible is the proper word mr narkom like you i never heard of it until to-day it shocked me to the very soul you may believe delighted to meet you mr headland a new disciple eh mr narkom another follower in the footsteps of the great cleek by the way i see you have lost touch with that amazing man i saw your advertisement in the paper the other day any clue to his whereabouts as yet not the slightest ah that's too bad from what i have heard of him he would have made short work of this present case had he been available but pray pardon me if i rush off my time is very limited rose dear i am going to visit father burns this evening and shall stop at the orphanage on the way so if you have the customary parcel for the children it is upstairs in my oratory dear she interposed come with me if the gentleman will excuse us for a moment and i will get it for you may we not all go up miss valmond interposed cleek i should like if you do not mind to get a view of the garden of lemmingham house from the window where you were standing that night and to have you explain the positions of the two men if you will yes certainly come by all means she replied and led the way forthwith they had scarcely gone halfway down the passage to the staircase however when they came abreast of the open doorway of a room dimly lit by a shaded lamp 
wherein an elderly woman sat huddled up in a deep chair with her shaking head bowed over hands that moved restlessly and aimlessly after the uneasy manner of an idiot's and the shape of whose face could be but faintly seen through the veil of white hair that fell loosely over it cleek had barely time to recall narkom's statement regarding the semi-imbecile mother when miss valmond gave a little cry of wonder and ran into the room why mother she said in her gentle way whatever are you doing down here dearest i thought you were still asleep in the oratory when did you come down the imbecile merely mumbled and muttered and shook her nodding head neither answering nor taking any notice whatsoever it is one of her bad nights explained miss valmond as she came out and rejoined them we can do nothing with her when she is like this horace you will have to come home earlier than usual to-night and help me get her to bed then she went on leading the way upstairs until they came at length to a sort of sanctuary where madonna faces looked down from sombre niches and wax lights burnt with a scented flame on a draped and cushioned prie dieu here miss valmond who was in the lead went in and taking a paper-wrapped parcel from beside the little altar came back and put it in her brother's hand and sent him on his way was it from there you saw the occurrence miss valmond asked cleek looking past her into the dim religious light of the sanctuary oh no she made reply from the window of my bedroom just on the other side of the wall in here look see and she opened a door to the right and led them in touching a key that flashed an electric lamp into radiance and illuminated the entire room it was a large room furnished in dull oak and dark green after the stately sombre style of a gothic chapel and at one end there was a curtained recess leading to a large bow window at the other there was a sort of altar banked high with white flowers and at the side there was a huge canopied bed over the head of which hung an immense crucifix fastened to the wall that backed upon the oratory it was a majestic thing that crucifix richly carved and exquisitely designed cleek went nearer and looked at it his artistic eye captured by the beauty of it and miss valmond noting his interest smiled my brother brought me that from rome she said is it not divine mr headland yes he said but you must be more careful of it i fear miss valmond is it not chipping look isn't this a piece of it he bent and picked a tiny curled sliver of wood from the narrow space between the two down-filled pillows of the bed holding it out to her upon his palm but of a sudden he smiled lifted the sliver to his nose smelt it and cast it away <laughs> their laugh is on me i fear it's only a cedar paring from a lead pencil and now please i'd like to investigate the window she led him to it at once explaining where she stood on the eventful night where she had seen the two figures pass and where was the wall door through which the dying man had been thrust i wish i might see that door clearer said cleek for night had fallen and the moon was not yet up don't happen to have such a thing as a telescope or an opera glass do you miss valmond my brother has a pair of field glasses downstairs in his room shall i run and fetch them for you i'd be very grateful if you would said cleek and a moment after she had gone run down and get my sketching materials out of the locker will you mr narkom he added i want to make a diagram of that house and garden then he sat down on the window-seat and for five whole minutes was alone the field-glasses and the sketching materials were brought the garden door examined and the diagram made miss valmond and narkom standing by and watching eagerly the whole proceeding that's all said cleek after a time brushing the charcoal dust from his fingers and snapping the elastic band over the sketch-book i know my man at last mr narkom give me until ten o'clock to-morrow night and then if miss valmond will let us in here again 
I'll capture Barrington Edwards red-handed. You are sure of him, then? As sure as I am that I'm alive. I'll lay a trap that will catch him. I promise you that. So if Miss Valmond will let us in here again— Yes, Mr. Headland, I will. Good. Then let us say at ten o'clock tomorrow night, here in this room, you, I, your brother, Mr. Narkom, all concerned, said Cleek, at ten to the tick, remember. Now come along, Mr. Narkom, and let me be about weaving the snare that shall pull this Mr. Barrington Edwards to the scaffold. Speaking, he bowed to Miss Valmond, and, taking Mr. Narkom's arm, passed out and went down the stairs to prepare for the last great act of tragedy. End of section 6「At ten to the tick on the following night he had said, and at ten to the tick he was there, the old red limousine whirling him up to the door in company with Mr. Narkom, there to be admitted by Miss Valmond's brother. "'My dear Mr. Headland, I have been on thorns ever since I heard,' said he. "'I hope and pray it is right, this assistance we are giving. But tell me, please, have you succeeded in your plans? Are you sure they will not fail? To both questions, yes, Mr. Valmond. We'll have our man tonight. Now, if you please, where is your sister? Upstairs in her own room with my mother. We tried to get the mater to bed, but she is very fractious tonight and will not let Rose out of her sight for a single instant. "'but she will not hamper your plans, I'm sure. "'Come quickly, please, this way.' "'Here he led them on and up "'until they stood in Miss Valmond's bedroom "'and in Miss Valmond's presence again. "'She was there by the window, "'her imbecile mother sitting at her feet "'with her face in her daughter's lap, "'that daughter's solicitous hand "'gently stroking her tumbled hair, "'and no light but that of the moon "'through the broad window "'illuminating the hushed and stately room. "'I keep my word, you see, Miss Valmond,' "'said Cleek as he entered. "'And in five minutes' time, "'if you watch from that window, "'you shall all see a thing that will amaze you.' "'You have run the wretched man down, then, Mr. Headland?' "'Yes, to the last ditch, to the wall itself,' he answered making room for her brother to get by him and make a place for himself at the window. Oh, it's a pretty little game he's been playing, that gentleman, and it dates back twenty years ago when he was kicked out of his regiment in Ceylon. In Ceylon? I, uh, God bless my soul, was he ever in Ceylon, Mr. Headland? Yes, Mr. Valmont, he was. It was at a time when there was what you might call a sapphire fever raging there, and precious stones were being unearthed in every unheard-of quarter. He got the fever with the rest, but he hadn't much money. So when he fell in with a lot of fellows who had heard of a Singalese, one Bereva Singh, who had a reef to sell in the Saffragam district, they made a pool between them and bought the blessed thing calling it, after the man they had purchased it from, the Bereva Reef, setting out like a party of donkeys to mine it for themselves, and expecting to pull out sapphires by the bucketful. Dear me, dear me, how very extraordinary. Of course they didn't, or did they? No, they didn't. A month's work convinced them that the ground was as empty of treasure as an eggshell, so they abandoned it, separated, and went their several ways. A few months ago, however, it was discovered that if they had had the implements to mine deeper, their dream would have been realised, for the reef was a perfect bed of sapphires, and eight men held an equal share in it. The scheme, then, was to get rid of these men secretly one by one, for one, perhaps two men, to get the deeds held by the others, to pretend that they had been purchased from the original owners, and to prevent by murder those original owners from— He stopped suddenly and switched round. Miss Valmond had risen, and so had her mother. 
he was on the pair of them like a leaping cat there was a sharp click-click a snarl and a scream and one end of a handcuff was on the wrist of each got you miss rosie edgeban got you senor juan alvarez he rapped out sharply then in a louder tone as the reverend horace made a bolt for the door stop him nab him mr narkom quick played sir played come in petrie come in hammond gentlemen here they are all three of them lieutenant eric edgeburn his daughter rose and senor juan alvarez the three brute beasts who sent five men to their death for the sake of a load of sapphires and the devil's lust for gain it's a lie flung out the girl who had been known as rose valmond oh no it's not you vixen you loathsome creature that prostituted holy things and made a shield of religion to carry on a vampire's deeds look here you beast of blasphemy i know the secret of this he said and walked over and laid his hand on the crucifix at the head of the bed petrie round into the oratory with you there's a knob at the side of the prayer desk press it when i shout oh no miss edgeburn no i shan't dance circles nor put my fingers into my nose nor bite the dust and die look how i dare it all now petrie now and lo as he spoke out of the nostrils of the figure on the cross there rushed downward two streams of white vapour which beat upon the pillows and upon him smothering both in white dust face powder miss edgeburn only face powder from your own little case over there he said i removed the devil's dust last night when i was in this room alone she made him no reply only like a cornered wretch screamed out and fainted mr narkom you have seen the method of administering the thing which caused the death of those five men it is now only fair that you should know what that thing was he said turning to the superintendent it is known by two names devil's dust and dust of death and both suit it well it is the fine feathery powder that grows on the young shoots of the bamboo tree a favourite method of secret killing with the natives of the Malay Peninsula and those of Madagascar, the Philippines, and Ceylon. When blown into the nostrils of a living creature, it produces first an awful agony of suffocation, a feeling as though the brain is coming down and exuding from the nostrils, then delirium, during which the victim invariably falls on his face and bites the earth then comes death death without a trace my friend for the hellish dust all but evaporates and the slight sediment that remains is carried out of the system by the spasm of enteric it produces that is the riddle solution as for the rest those men were lured here by letters from alvarez telling them of the reef's great fortune of the necessity for coming at once and bringing their deeds with them and impressing upon them the possibility of being defrauded if they breathed one word to a mortal soul about their leaving or why they came they were invited to spend the night and to sleep upon that accursed bed and the devil's dust did the rest i traced that out through poor jim peabody's sock it was one of the blue yarn kind that are given to the inmates of workhouses i traced him through that and the others through the photographs each had been known to have received a letter from london and each had in turn vanished without a word poor chaps poor unhappy chaps let us hope dear friends that they have found the place of sapphires after all End of section 7
how did i come to suspect the girl said cleek answering narkom's query as they swung off through the darkness in the red limousine leaving edgeburn and his confederates in the hands of the police well as a matter of fact i did not suspect her at all in the beginning her saintly reputation saved her from any such things as that it was only when her father came in that i knew and later i knew even better when i saw that pretended imbecile sitting there in that room for the blundering fool had been ass enough to kick off his slippers and sit there in his stocking feet and i spotted the alvarez foot on the instant still i didn't know but what the girl herself might be an innocent victim a sort of dove in a vulture's nest and it was not until i found that scrap of wood from a sharpened lead pencil that i began to doubt her it was only when i promised that barrington edwards should be trapped that i actually knew the light that flamed in her eyes in spite of her at that would have made an idiot understand what's that what should i suspect from the finding of that scrap of pencil my dear mr narkom carry your mind back to that moment when i found the stain on poor jim peabody's thumb and then examined the blade of his pocket-knife the marks on the latter showed clearly that the man had sharpened a pencil with it and of course with the point of that pencil against the top of his thumb by the peculiar bronze-like shine of the streaks and the small particles of dust adhering to the knife-blade i felt persuaded that the pencil was an indelible one in short one of those which write a faint blackish lilac hue which on the application of moisture turns to a vivid and indelible purple the moisture induced by the act of thrusting his forefingers up his nostrils to allay the horrible sensation of the brain descending which that hellish powder produces together with the perspiration which comes with intense agony had made such a change in the smears his thumb and forefinger bore and left no room for doubt that at the time he was smitten he had either just begun or just concluded writing something with an indelible pencil which he had but recently sharpened poor wretch he of all the lot had some one belonging to him that was still living his poor old mother it is very fair to suppose that finding the alvarez place so lavishly furnished and having hopes that great riches were yet to be his he sat down on that bed and began to write a few lines in his illiterate way to that mother before wholly undressing and getting between the sheets the mark on his palm is a clear proof that when the powder suddenly descended upon him he involuntarily closed his hand on that letter and the perspiration transferred to his flesh the shape of the scrawl upon which it rested pardon how did i know through that scrawl that i was really on the track and that it was the bereaver reef that was at the bottom of the whole game my dear mr narkom i won't insult your intelligence by explaining that all you have to do is to turn that tracing upside down and look through it or at it in a mirror and you'll have the answer for yourself what's that the parcel the girl gave edgeburn to carry out on the pretext of taking it to an orphanage oh that was how they were slowly getting rid of the victim's clothes cutting them up into little pieces and throwing them into the river i suppose or if not he stopped suddenly his ear caught by a warning sound then turned in his seat and glanced through the little window at the back of the limousine i thought as much he said half aloud then leaned forward caught up the pipe of the speaking tube and signalled leonard look sharp taxi following us he said put on a sudden spurt that chap will increase speed to keep pace with us then pull up sharp and let the other fellow's impetus carry him by before he can help himself out with the light mr narkom out with it quick both leonard and his master followed instructions of a sudden the lights flicked out the car leapt forward with a bound then pulled up with a jerk that shook it from end to end 
in that moment the taxi in the rear whizzed by them and narkom leaning forward to look as it flashed past saw seated within it the figure of count valdemar of mauravania by james did you see that cleek he cried and switched round and made a grab for cleek's arm but cleek was not there his seat was empty and the door beside it was swinging ajar well i'll be jiggered exclaimed the superintendent fairly carried out of himself for even in his old vanishing cracksman's days when he had slipped the leash and eluded the police so often the man had not made a more adroit more silent more successful getaway than this of all the astonishing gad and eels a fool to him for slipping out of tight places when did he go i wonder and where never very strong on matters of detail here curiosity tricked him into absolute indiscretion sliding along the seat to the swinging door he thrust it open and leaned out into the darkness for a purpose so evident that he who ran might read that one who ran did he had good reason to understand in the next instant for of a sudden the taxi in advance checked its wild flight swung round with a noisy scroop and pelted back until the two vehicles stood cheek by jowl so to speak and the glare of its headlights was pouring full force upon mr narkom and into the interior of the red limousine Ugh, dash your infernal impudence began he blinking up at the driver through a glare which prevented him seeing that the taxicab's leather blinds had been discreetly pulled down and its interior rendered quite invisible but before he could add so much as another word to his protest the chauffeur's voice broke in with a blandness and an accent which told its own story dix mille pardon monsieur it commenced then pulled itself up as if the owner of it had suddenly recollected himself and added abruptly in a farcical attempt to imitate the jargon of the fast disappearing london cabby keep off the air on old cock only wanting to ask of the question civil lost my bloomin way put a cove on to the short cut to the high street will you like a blessed christian i don't know where i are mr narkom was not suffered to make reply before he had more than grasped the fact that the speaker was undeniably a frenchman leonard out of the range of that dazzling light had made the discovery that he was yet more undeniably a frenchman of that class from which the apaches are recruited and stepped into the breach with astonishing adroitness oh that's the trouble is it he interposed my hat why well, of course we'll put you on the way what's more we'll take you along and show you won't we governor eh so as you won't go astray till you gets there heads in and door shut superintendent bringing the limousine around until it pointed in the same direction as the taxicab and now then straight ahead and follow your nose jules we'll be rubbing shoulders with you the whole blessed way and as the duke of wellington said to napoleon bonaparte and none of your larks you blighter you're a comin along with me that he was was a condition of affairs so inevitable that the chauffeur made no attempt to evade it merely put on speed and headed straight for the distant high street for the purpose of getting rid of his escort as soon as possible and leonard putting on speed likewise and keeping pace with him ran him neck and neck until the heath was left far and away behind the darkness gave place to a glitter of street lamps the lonely roads to populous thoroughfares and the way was left clear for cleek to get off unfollowed and unmolested End of section eight. Chapter Six. Screened by that darkness, and close sheltered by the matted gorse which fringed and dotted the expanse of the nearby heath, he had been an interested witness to the entire proceeding. 
played my lad played he commented putting his thoughts into mumbled words of laughing approval as leonard taking the taxicab under guard escorted it and its occupants out of the immediate neighbourhood then excessive caution prompting him to quell even this little ebullition he shut up like an oyster and neither spoke nor moved nor made any sound until the two vehicles were represented by nothing but a purring noise dwindling away into the distance when that time came however he rose and facing the heath forged out across its mist-wrapped breadth with that long swinging soldierly stride peculiar unto him his forehead puckered with troubled thought his jaw clamped and his lips compressed until his mouth seemed nothing more than a bleak slit gashed in a grey unpleasant-looking mask but after a while the night and the time and the place worked their own spell and the troubled look dropped away the dull eyes lighted the grim features softened and the curious crooked smile that was nature's birth gift to him broke down the rigid lines of the bleak slit and looped up one corner of his mouth it was magic ground this heath a place thick set as the caves of manor with the sapphires of memory and to a nature such as his these things could not but appeal here dollops had come into his life a starveling an outcast derelict even in the very morning time of youth a bit of human wreckage that another ten minutes would have seen stranded forever upon the reefs of crime here too on that selfsame night when the devil had been cheated and the boy had gone and they two stood alone together in the mist and darkness he had first laid aside the mask of respectability and told ailsa lorne the truth about himself of his apache times of his vanishing cracksman's days and in the telling had watched the light die out of her dear eyes and dread of him darken them when she knew but not for always thank god for in later days when time had lessened the shock when she came to know him better when the threads of their two lives had become more closely woven and the hope had grown to be something more than a mere possibility he laughed aloud remembering and with a sudden rush of animal spirits twitched off his hat flung it up and caught it as it fell after the manner of a happy boy god what a world what a glorious glorious world all things were possible in it if a man but walked straight and knew how to wait well please god a part at least of his long waiting would be over in another month she would be back in england then her long visit to the hawksleys ended and nothing before her now but the pleasant excitement of trousseau days for the coming autumn would see the final act of restitution made the last vanishing cracksman debt paid to the uttermost farthing and when that time came he flung up his hat again and shouted from sheer excess of joy and forged on through the mist and darkness whistling his way lay across the great common to the vale of health district and thence down a slanting road and a sloping street to the hampstead heath station of the tube railway and he covered the distance to such good effect that half past eleven found him down under swaying to the rhythmic movement of an electric train and arrowing through the earth at a lively clip ten minutes later he changed over to yet another underground system swung on for half an hour or so through gloom and bad air and the musty smell of a damp tunnel before the drop of the land and the rise of the roadbed carried the train out into the open and the air came fresh and sweet and pure as god made it over field and flood and dewy garden spaces and away to the west a prickle of lights on a quiet river 
told where the stars mirrored themselves in the glass of Father Thames. At a toy station, in the hush and loneliness of the pleasant country ways, his long ride came to an end at last, and he swung off into the balm and fragrance of the night to face a two-mile walk along quiet, shadow-filled lanes and over wet wastes of young bracken to a wee little house in the heart of a green wilderness with a high-walled old-world garden surrounding it and in the far background a gloom of woodland smeared in darker purple against the purple darkness of the sky no light shone out from the house to greet him no light could come from behind that screening wall unless it were one set in an upper window yet he was certain the place was not deserted for as he came up out of the darkness cat-like of tread and cat-like of ear he was willing to swear that he could catch the sound of some one moving about restlessly in the shadow of that high brick wall and the experiences of the night made him cautious of things that moved in darkness he stopped short and remained absolutely still for half a minute then stooping swished his hand through the bracken in excellent imitation of a small animal running and shrilled out a note that was uncannily like the death squeal of a stoat caught rabbit gawd's truth governor is it you at last sir and me never seeing nor hearing a blessed thing spoke a voice in answer from the wall's foot then a latch clicked and as cleek rose to his feet a garden door swung inward a rectangle of light shone in the darkness and silhouetted against it stood dollops what are you doing out here at this time of night you young monkey don't you know it's almost one o'clock said cleek as he went forward and joined the boy don't i know it says you don't i just he gave back there aren't a minute since the night come on that i haven't counted sir not a blooming one and if you hadn't turned up just as you did well let that pass as the suffragette said when she heaved half a brick through the shop window god's truth governor do you realize that you've been gone since yesterday afternoon and i haven't heard a word from you in all that time well what of that it's not the first time by dozens that i've done the same thing why should it worry you at this late day look here my young man you're not developing nerves are you because if you are turn round and let's have a look at you why you're as pale as a ghost you young beggar and shaking like a leaf anything wrong with you old chap not as i knows of returned dollops making a brave attempt to smile and be his old happy-go-lucky whimsical self albeit he wasn't carrying it off quite successfully for there was a droop to his smile and a sort of whimper underlying his voice and cleek's keen eyes saw that his hand groped about blindly in its effort to find the fastenings of the garden door leastwise nothing as matters now that you're here sir and i am glad you're back governor lord yus nothing like company to buck you up as the bull said when he tossed the tinker so of course here you let those fastenings alone i'll attend to them rapped in cleek's voice with a curious note of alarm in it as he moved briskly forward and barred and locked the wall door if i didn't know that eating not drinking was your particular failing here he stopped his half-uttered comment cut into by a bleating cry and he screwed round to face a startling situation for there was dollops leaning heavily against a flowering almond tree his face like a dead face for colour and his fingers clawing frantically at the lower part of his waistcoat doubling and twisting in the throes of an internal convulsion the gravelled pathway gave forth two sharp scrunches and cleek was just in time to catch him as he lurched forward and sprawled heavily against him the man's arms closed instinctively about the twisting sweat-drenched helpless shape and with great haste and infinite tenderness gathered it up and carried it into the house but he had scarcely more than laid the boy upon a sofa and lit the lamp of the small apartment which served them as a general living-room when all the agony of uncertainty which beset his mind regarding the genesis of this terrifying attack 
vanished in a sudden rush of enlightenment all that was left of a bounteous and strikingly diversified afternoon tea still littered the small round dining-table and there on one plate lay the shells of two crabs on another the remains of a large rhubarb tart on a third the skins of five bananas leaning coquettishly up against the lid of an open pickle jar and hard by there was a pint tumbler with the white blur of milk dimming it good lord the young anaconda blurted out cleek as he stood and stared at this appalling array no wonder no wonder then he turned round on his heel looked at the writhing and moaning boy and in a sudden fever of doing peeled off his coat rolled up his sleeves and made a bolt for the kitchen stove the hot water kettle and the medicine chest the result of master dollop's little gastronomic experiment scarcely needs to be recorded it is sufficient to say that he had the time of his life that night that he kept cleek busy every minute for the next twenty-four hours wringing out flannels in hot water and dosing him with homely remedies and that when he finally came through the siege was as limp as a wet newspaper and as feeble as a good many dry ones what you need to pull yourself together is a change you reckless young ostrich a week's roughing it in the open country by field and stream and as many miles as possible from so much as the odour of a pastry-cook's shop said cleek patting him gently upon the shoulder a nice sort of assistant you are keeping a man out of his bed for twenty-four hours with his heart in his mouth and his hair on end you young beggar now 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 none of your blubbing sit tight while i run down and make some gruel for you after that i'll nip out and phone through to the yard and tell mr narkom to have somebody look up a caravan that can be hired and we'll be off for a week's gypsying in yorkshire old chap he did coming back later with a piece of surprising news for it just so happened that the idea of a week's holiday-making a week's rambling about the green lanes the broad moors and through the wild gorges of the west riding and living the simple life in a caravan appealed to mr maverick narkom as being the most desirable thing in the world at that moment and he made haste to ask cleek's permission to share the holiday with him as nothing could have been more to his great ally's liking the matter was settled forthwith a caravan was hired by telegram to sheffield and at ten the next morning the little party turned its back upon london and fared forth to the pleasant country lands the charm of laughing waters and the magic that hides in trees for five days they led an absolutely idyllic life loafing in green wildernesses and sleeping in the shadow of whispering woods and this getting back to nature proved as much of a tonic to the two men as to the boy himself refreshing both mind and body putting red blood into their veins and breathing the breath of god into their nostrils having amply provisioned the caravan before starting they went no nearer to any human habitation than they were obliged to do in passing from one district to another and one day was so exact a pattern of the next that its history might have stood for them all up with the dawn and the birds and into woodland pool or tree-shaded river then gathering fuel and making a fire and cooking breakfast then washing the utensils harnessing the horses and moving on again sometimes cleek driving sometimes narkom sometimes the boy stopping when they were hungry to prepare lunch just as they had prepared breakfast then forging on again until they found some tree-hedged dell or bosky wood where they might spend the night crooned to sleep by the wind in the leaves and watched over by the sentinel stars so they had spent the major part of the week and so they might have spent it all but that chance chose to thrust them suddenly out of idleness into activity and to bring them here in this arcadia face to face again with the evils of mankind and the harsh duty of the law 
it had gone nine o'clock on that fifth night when a curious thing happened they had halted for the night by the banks of a shallow chattering stream which flowed through a wayside spinney beyond whose clustering tree-tops they had seen before the light failed the castellated top of a distant tower and farther afield the weathercock on an uplifting church spire they had supped and were enjoying their ease the two men sprawling at full length on the ground enjoying a comfortable smoke while dollops with a mouth harmonica was doing knocked em in the old kent road his back against a tree his eyes upturned in ecstasy his long legs stretched out upon the turf and his feet crossed one over the other and all about them was peace all the sordid money-grubbing crime-stained world seemed millions of miles away when of a sudden there came a swift rush of bodies trampling on dead leaves and brushing against live ones then a voice cried out commandingly surrender yourselves in the name of the king and scrambling to a sitting position they looked up to find themselves confronted by a constable a gamekeeper and two farm labourers the one with drawn truncheon and the other three with cocked guns End of section nine chapter seven hello i say began mr narkom in amazement why what the dickens but he was suffered to get no farther you mind your p's and q's i warn you that anything you say will be used against you interjected sharply and authoritatively the voice of the constable hawkins you and marlow keep close guard over these chaps while me and mr simpkins looks round for the animal i said it would be the work of gypsies didn't i now mr simpkins addressing the gamekeeper come on and let's have a look for the beast keep eyes peeled and gun at full cock mr simpkins and given both barrels if and makes to spring at us this be a sharp capture mr simpkins what ay but un seems to take it uncommon cool mr nippers one of em's laughin fit to bust hisself replied the gamekeeper as cleek slapped both thighs and throwing back his head voiced an appreciative guffaw un don't look much like gypsies either from t little i can see of em in this tomfool light wait a bit till i scoop up an armful of leaves and throw em on the embers of fire yon he did so forthwith and the moment the dry leaves fell on the remnants of the fire which the caravanners had used to cook their evening meal there was a gush of aromatic smoke a sudden puff and then a broad ribbon of light rushed upward and dispelled every trace of darkness and by the aid of that ribbon of light mr nippers saw something which made him almost collapse with astonishment and chagrin the great of the world may and often do forget their meetings with the small fry but the small fry never cease to remember their meetings with the great or to treasure a vivid remembrance of that immortal day when they were privileged to rub elbows with the elect five years had passed since mrs maverick narkom seeking a place wherein to spend the summer holidays with the little narkoms and their nurses had let her choice fall upon winton old bridges and had dwelt there for two whole months three times during her sojourn her liege lord had come down for a weekend with his wife and children and during one of these brief visits meeting mr ephraim nippers the village constable in the public highway he had deigned to stop and speak to the man and to present him with a sixpenny cigar times had changed since then mr nippers was now head constable for the district but he still kept that cigar under a glass shade on the drawing-room what-not and he still treasured a vivid recollection of the great man who had given it to him and whom he now saw sitting on the ground with his coat off and his waistcoat unbuttoned his moustache uncurled wisps of dried grass clinging to his tousled hair 
and all the dignity of office conspicuous by its absence oh lummy said mr nippers with a gulp put down the hammers of them guns you two put em down quick it's mr narkom mr maverick narkom superintendent at scotland yard hello exclaimed mr narkom shading his eyes from the firelight and leaning forward to get a clearer view of the speaker how the dickens do you know that my man and who the dickens are you anyway can't say that i remember ever seeing your face before mr nippers hastened to explain that little experience of five years ago but the circumstance which had impressed itself so deeply upon his memory had passed entirely out of the superintendent's oh that's it is it said he can't say that i recall the occasion but mrs narkom certainly did stop at winton old bridges some four or five summers ago so of course it's possible by the way my man what caused you to make this sudden descent upon us and what are these chaps who are with you bearing arms for anything up oh lummy sir yes a murder's just been committed leastwise it's only just been discovered but it can't have been long since it was committed mr narkom for miss renfrew who found him sir and give the alarm she says as the poor dear gentleman was alive at a quarter to eight cause she looked into the room at that time to ask him if there was anything he wanted and he spoke up and told her no and went on with his figuring just the same as usual as usual said cleek why do you say as usual my friend was the man an accountant of some sort lummy no sir a great inventor is what he is or was poor gentleman reckon you must a heard of un some time or another most everybody has nosworth is the name sir mr septimus nosworth of the round house you could see the tower of it over yon if you was to step out into the road and get clear of these trees cleek was on his feet like a flash not the great septimus nosworth he questioned eagerly not the man who invented lithamite the greatest authority on high explosives in england not that septimus nosworth surely ay him's the one poor gentleman i thought it like as the name would be familiar sir a goodish few have heard of un one way and another yes acquiesced cleek lithamite carried his name from one end of the globe to the other and his family affairs came into unusual prominence in consequence widower wasn't he hard as nails and bitter as gall had an only son hadn't he a wild young blade who went the pace took up with chorus girls music hall ladies and persons of that stripe and got kicked out from under the parental roof in consequence lummy now think of you a knowing about all that said mr nippers in amazement but then your being with mr narkom and him being what he is why of course scotland yard it do know everything i'm told sir yes it reads the papers occasionally mr nippers said cleek i may take it from your reply may i not that i am correct regarding mr septimus nosworth's son indeed yes sir right as rain leastwise from what i've heard i never see the young gentleman myself them things you mention happened before mr nosworth come to live in these parts a matter of some four years or more ago always had his laboratory here sir built it on the land he leased from sir ralph droger's father in the early sixties and used to come over frequent and shut hisself in the round house for days on end but never come here to live until after that flare-up with master harry come then and built living quarters beside the round house and after a piece fetched miss renfrew and old patty dax over to live with un miss renfrew and old patty dax who are they miss renfrew is his niece sir daughter of a dead sister old patty dax she war the cook 
i don't know what her be now though her died six months ago and an i had mistress arm roid in her place french piece her am though being widder of a lancashire man and though i don't much fancy foreigners nor their ways this i will say her keeps the house like a pin and her cookin's amazing tasty indeed yes you are an occasional caller in the servants hall i see mr nippers said cleek serenely as he took up his coat and shook it preparatory to putting it on i think mr narkom that in the interests of the public at large it will be well for someone a little more efficient than the local constabulary to look into this case so if you don't mind making yourself a trifle more presentable it will be as well for us to get mr nippers to show us the way to the scene of the tragedy while you are doing it i will put a few headland questions to our friend here if you don't mind assuring him that i am competent to advise right you are old chap said narkom taking his cue nippers uh, this is mr george headland one of the best of my yard detectives he'll very likely give you a tip or two in the matter of detecting crimes if you pay attention to what he says nippers paid attention forthwith the idea of being in consultation with any one connected with scotland yard tickled his very soul and in fancy he already saw his name getting into the newspapers of london and his fame spreading far beyond his native weald i won't trouble you for the full details of the murder mr nippers said cleek those i fancy this miss renfrew will be able to supply when i see her for the present tell me how many other occupants does the house hold beyond these two of whom you have spoken miss renfrew and the cook mrs armroyd none sir but the scullery maid emily and the parlour maid clark but both of them is out to-night sir having went to a concert over at beatty corners a friend of mistress armroyd sent her two tickets and her not being able to go herself her thought it a pity for em to be wasted so her give em to the maids i see no male servants at all then no sir not one there's jones the andy man as comes in mornings to do the rough work and the hauling and carrying and things like that and there's the gardener and mr kemper him as is mr nosworth's assistant in the laboratory sir but none of em is ever in the house after five o'clock set against having men sleep in the house was mr nosworth swore as never another should after him and master harry had their falling out why sir he was that bitter he'd never even allow mr charles to set foot in the place just because him and master harry used to be friends which makes it precious hard on miss renfrew i can tell you as how is this mr charles connected with miss renfrew in any way no me yes sir he's a young man been sweet on each other ever since they was in pinafores but never had no chance to marry because mr charles mr charles drummond is his full name sir he hasn't one shilling to rub against another and miss renfrew she's a little worse off than him never gets nothing i'm told for keeping house for her uncle just her food and lodging and clothes and her slaving like a nigger for him the whole blessed time keeps his books and superintends the running of the house she do but never gets a brass farthing for it poor girl i don't like to speak ill of the dead mr redland sir but this i must say a rare old skinflint was mr septimus nosworth wouldn't part with a groat unless un was forced to but praise be ill get her dues now fegs yes unless old skinflint went and changed his will without her knowing oh ho said cleek with a strong rising inflection his will was made in miss renfrew's favour was it ay 
that's why her come and put up with un and all his hard-heartedness denying her the pleasure of ever seeing her young man just because him and master harry had been friends and playmates when the pair of un was just boys in knickers and broad collars there be a stone heart for you rather now one more question i think you said it was miss renfrew who gave the alarm when the murder was discovered mr nippers how did she give it and to whom eh hey, now to me and mistress armroyd of course me and her was sitting in the kitchen having a bite of supper at the time gora me were there too in the beginning but un didn't stop of course it wouldn't a done for the pair of us to be off duty together oh is gorham a constable then ay under constable second to me got an appointed six months ago him had just gone a bit of a time when miss renfrew come rushing in and shrieked out about the murder but he heard the rumpus and came pounding back of course i don't know what i'd a done if un hadn't for miss renfrew her went from one fainting fit to another twas just awful gora helped her to carry her up to the sitting-room where mistress armroyd burnt feathers under her nose and when we'd got her round a bit we all three went outside and round to the laboratory that's when we first see the prints of the animal's feet mistress armroyd spied em first all over the flower-bed just under the laboratory window aha uh -huh. then that is what you meant when you alluded to an animal when you pounced down upon us was it i see one word more what kind of an animal was it or couldn't you tell from the marks no sir i couldn't nobody could unless it might be sir ralph droger he'll be like too if anybody keeps all sorts of animals and birds and things in great cages in droger park does sir ralph one thing i can swear to though sir they want like the footprints of any animal as i ever see there be a picture of st jarge and the dragon on the walls of town hall at birchampton mr edland sir and them footprints is more like the paws of that dragon than anything else i can call to mind scaly and clawed they is like the thing as made em was part bird and part beast and they're a good twelve inches long every one of em hmm that's extraordinary deeply imprinted are they lummy yes sir the animal as made em must have weighed ten or twelve stone at least soon as i see them sir i knowed i had my work cut out so i left gorham in charge of the house rattled up these two men and mr simpkins here which all three is employed at droger park sir and set out hot foot to look for gypsies why cause mistress armroyd she says as she see a gypsy lurking round the place just before dark sir and he had a queer thing like a bear's muzzle in his hand ah i see said cleek and gave one of his odd smiles as he turned round and looked at the superintendent already mr narkom good let's go over to the round house and investigate this interesting case dollops stop where you are and look after the caravan if we are away more than a couple of hours tumble into bed and go to sleep we may be a short time or we may be a long one in affairs like this one never knows any ideas old chap queried narkom in a whisper as they forged along together in the wake of nippers and his three companions yes a great many answered cleek i am particularly anxious mr narkom to have a look at those footprints and an interview with miss renfrew i want to meet that young lady very much indeed end of section ten chapter eight twenty minutes later his desires in that respect were granted and having been introduced by mr nippers to the little gathering in the sitting-room of the house of disaster as a friend of mine from scotland yard miss 
he found himself in the presence of one of those meek-faced, dove-eyed, mousy little bodies who seem born to be patient Griseldas, and in looking at her he was minded of the description of Lady Jane in the poem. Her pulse was slow, milk-white her skin, she had not blood enough to sin. Years of repression had told upon her, and she looked older than she really was, so old and so dragged out, in fact, that Mrs. Armroyd, the cook, appeared youthful and attractive in contrast. Indeed, it was no wonder that Mr. Ephraim Nippers had been attracted by that good soul, for although her hair was streaked with grey, and her figure was of the sack of flour order, and her eyes were assisted in their offices by a pair of steel-bowed spectacles, her face was still youthful in contour, and Mr. Narkom, looking at her, concluded that at twenty-four or twenty-five she must have been a remarkably pretty and remarkably fascinating woman. What Cleek's thoughts were upon that subject it is impossible to record, for he merely gave her one look on coming into the room, and then took no further notice of her whatsoever. "'Indeed, Mr. Headland, I am glad.' I am very, very glad that fortune has sent you into this neighbourhood at this terrible time," said Miss Renfrew, when Cleek was introduced. I do not wish to say anything disparaging of Mr. Nippers, but you can see for yourself how unfitted such men as he and his assistant are to handle an affair of this importance. Indeed, I cannot rid my mind of the thought that if more competent police were on duty here the murder would not have happened. In short, that the assassin, whoever he may be, counted upon the blundering methods of these men as his passport to safety. "'My own thought, precisely,' said Cleek. "'Mr. Nippers has given me a brief outline of the affair. Would you mind giving me the full details, Miss Renfrew? At what hour did Mr. Nosworth go into his laboratory, or don't you know exactly?' "'Yes, I know to the fraction of a moment, Mr. Headland.' I was looking at my watch at the time. It was exactly eight minutes past seven. We had been going over the monthly accounts together when he suddenly got up, and without a word walked through that door over there. It leads to a covered passage connecting the house proper with the laboratory. That, as you may have heard, is a circular building with a castellated top. It was built wholly and solely for the carrying on of his experiments. There is but one floor and one window, a very small one about six feet from the ground, and on the side of the roundhouse which looks away from this building. Nothing but the door to that is on this side, light being supplied to the interior by a roof made entirely of heavy corrugated glass. I see. Then the place is like a huge tube. Exactly, and lined entirely with chilled steel. Such few wooden appliances as are necessary for the equipment of the place are thickly coated with asbestos. I made no comment when my uncle rose and walked in there without a word. I never did. For the past six or seven months he had been absorbed in working out the details of a new invention, and I had become used to his jumping up like that and leaving me. We never have supper in this house— my uncle always called it a useless extravagance. Instead, we defer tea until six o'clock and make that the final meal of the day. It was exactly five minutes to seven when I finished my accounts, and as I had had a hard day of it, I decided to go to bed early, after having first taken a walk as far as the old bridge, where I hoped that somebody would be waiting for me. "'I know,' said Cleek gently. I have heard the story. It would be Mr. Charles Drummond, would it not? Yes. He was not there, however. Something must have prevented his coming. Hmm. Go on, please. Before leaving the house, it occurred to me that I ought to look into the laboratory and see if there was anything my uncle would be likely to need for the night, as I intended to go straightway to bed on my return. I did so. He was sitting at his desk, immediately under the one window of which I have spoken, and with his back to me when I looked in. He answered my inquiry with a curt, no, nothing, get out and don't worry me. I immediately shut the door and left him, 
returning here by way of the covered passage and going upstairs to make some necessary changes in my dress for the walk to the old bridge when i came down ready for my journey i looked at the clock on the mantel over there it was exactly seventeen minutes to eight o'clock i had been a little longer in dressing than i had anticipated being so in order to save time in getting to the trysting place i concluded to make a short cut by going out of the rear door and crossing diagonally through our grounds instead of going by the public highway as usual i had scarcely more than crossed the threshold when i ran plump into constable gorham as he is rather a favourite with good mrs armroyd here i fancied that he had been paying her a visit and was just coming away from the kitchen instead he rather startled me by stating that he had seen something which he thought best to come round and investigate in short that as he was patrolling the highway he had seen a man vault over the wall of our grounds and bending down dart out of sight like a hare he was almost positive that that man was sir ralph droger of course that frightened me almost out of my wits why there was bad blood between my uncle and sir ralph droger bitter bad blood as you perhaps know my uncle held this ground on a life lease from the droger estate that is to say so long as he lived or refused to vacate that lease no droger could oust him nor yet lift one spadeful of earth from the property does sir ralph desire to do either he desires to do both borings secretly made have manifested the fact that both barnsley thick coal and iron ore underlie the place sir ralph wishes to tear down the roundhouse and this building and to begin mining operations my uncle who has been offered the full value of every stick and stone has always obstinately refused to budge one inch or to lessen the lease by one half hour it is for the term of my life he has always said and for the term of my life i'll hold it oh ho said cleek and then puckered up his lips as if about to whistle under such circumstances went on miss renfrew it was only natural that i should be horribly frightened and only too willing to act upon the constable's suggestion that we at once look into the roundhouse and see if everything was right with my uncle why should the constable suggest that everybody in the neighbourhood knows of the bitter ill-feeling existing between the two men so of course it was only natural hmm. yes just so did you act on constable gorham's suggestion then yes i led the way in here and then up the covered passage to the laboratory and opened the door my uncle was sitting exactly as he had been when i looked in before his back to me and his face to the window but although he did not turn it was evident that he was annoyed by my disturbing him for he growled angrily what the devil are you coming in here and disturbing me like this for jane get out and leave me alone hmm said cleek drawing down his brows and pinching his chin any mirrors in the round house mirrors no certainly not mr headland why nothing only that i was wondering if as you say he never turned and you never spoke how in the world he knew that it really was you that's all oh i see what you mean said miss renfrew knotting up her brows it does seem a little peculiar when one looks at it in that way i never thought of it before neither can i explain it mr headland any more than to say that i suppose he took it for granted and as it happened he was right besides as you will remember i had intruded upon him only a short time before quite so said cleek that's what makes it appear stranger than ever under the circumstances one might have expected him to say not what are you coming in here for but what are you coming in for again still of course there's no accounting for little lapses like that go on please what next why of course i immediately explained what constable gorham had said and why i had looked in to which he replied 
the man's an ass get out upon which i closed the door and the constable and i went away at once constable there with you during it all then yes certainly in the covered passage just behind me he saw and heard everything though of course neither of us actually entered the laboratory itself there was really no necessity when we knew that my uncle was safe and sound you see quite so agreed cleek so you shut the door and went away and then what constable gorham went back to his beat and i flew as fast as i could to meet mr drummond it is only a short way to the old bridge at best and by taking that short cut through the grounds i was there in less than ten minutes and by half-past eight i was back here in a greater state of terror than before and why were you so much alarmed that mr drummond did not keep the appointment no that did not worry me at all he is often unable to keep his appointments with me he is filling the post of private secretary to a large company promoter and his time is not his own what terrified me was that after waiting a few minutes for him i heard somebody running along the road and a few moments later sir ralph droger flew by me as if he were being pursued under ordinary circumstances i should have thought that he was getting into training for the autumn sports he is you may know very keen on athletics and holds the county club's cup for running and jumping but when i remembered what constable gorham had said and saw that sir ralph was coming from the direction of this house all my wits flew i got into a sort of panic and almost collapsed with fright and all because the man was coming from the direction of this house not that alone she answered with a shudder i i have said that i should under ordinary circumstances have thought he was merely training for the autumn sports for you see he was in a running costume of white cotton stuff and his legs were bare from the knee down but as he shot past me in the moonlight i caught sight of something like a huge splash of blood on his clothes and coupling that with the rest i nearly went out of my senses it wasn't until long afterward i recollected that the badge of the county club is the winged foot of mercury wrought in brilliant scarlet embroidery to me just then that thing of red was blood my uncle's blood and i ran and ran and ran until i got back here to the house and flew up the covered passage and burst into the roundhouse he was sitting there still just as he had been sitting before but he didn't call out to me this time he didn't reprove me for disturbing him didn't make one single movement utter one single sound and when i went to him i knew why he was dead stone dead the face and throat of him were torn and rent as if some furious animal had mauled him and there were curious yellow stains upon his clothes that's all mr headland i don't know what i did nor where i went from the moment i rushed shrieking from that room until i came to my senses and found myself in this one with dear kind mrs armroyd here bending over me and doing all in her power to soothe and to comfort me there there chérie you shall not more distress yourself it is of a hardness too great for the poor mind to bear put in mrs armroyd herself at this bending over the sofa as she spoke and softly smoothing the girl's hair it is better she should be at peace for a little is it not monsieur very much better madame replied cleek noting how softly her hand fell and how gracefully it moved over the soft hair and across the white forehead no doubt the major part of what still remains to be told you in the goodness of your heart will supply of a certainty monsieur of a certainty but for the present continued cleek finishing the interrupted sentence there still remains a question or two which must be asked and which only miss renfrew herself can answer as those are of a private and purely personal nature madame would it be asking too much he gave his shoulders an eloquent frenchified shrug 
looked up at her after the manner of her own countrymen, and let the rest of the sentence go by default. Madame looked at him, and gave her little hands an airy and a graceful flirt. Of a certainty, monsieur, she said with charming grace, cela m'est égal, and walked away with a step remarkably light and remarkably graceful for one of such weight and generous dimensions miss renfrew said cleek sinking his voice and looking her straight in the eyes as soon as mrs armroyd had left them miss renfrew tell me something please have you any suspicion regarding the identity or the purpose of the person who murdered your uncle not in the slightest mr headland of course in the beginning my thoughts flew at once to sir ralph Droger, but i now see how absurd it is to think that such as he i am not even hinting at sir ralph Droger, interposed cleek two other people in the world have a motive quite as strong as any that might be assigned to him you of course feel every confidence in the honour and integrity of mr charles drummond mr headland gently gently please i merely wish to know if in your heart you had any secret doubt and your flaring up like that has answered me you see one has to remember that the late mr nosworth is said to have made a will in your favour the statement is correct is it not to the best of my belief yes filed it with his solicitors did he that i can't say i think not however he was always sufficient unto himself and had a rooted objection to trusting anything of value to the care of any man living even his most important documents plans and formulas of his various inventions even the very lease of this property have always been kept in the desk in the laboratory hmm said cleek and pinched his chin hard then after a moment one last question he went on suddenly what do you know miss renfrew of the recent movements of mr harry nosworth the son who was kicked out nothing absolutely nothing she answered with a look of something akin to horror i know what you are thinking of but although he is as bad as man can be it is abominable to suppose that he would lift his hand against his own father hmm. yes of course but still it has been known to happen and as you say he was a bad lot i ran foul of the young gentleman once when no matter it doesn't signify so you don't know anything about him eh nothing thank god the last i did hear he had gone on the stage and taken up with some horrible creature and the pair of them were subsequently sent to prison for enticing people to dreadful places and then drugging and robbing them but even that i heard from an outside source for my uncle never so much as mentioned him no i know nothing of him nothing at all in fact i've never seen him since he was a boy he never lived here you know and until i came here i knew next to nothing of my uncle himself we were poor and lived in a quite different town my mother and i uncle septimus never came to see us while my mother lived he came for the first time when she was dead and his son had gone away and i was so poor and so friendless i was glad to accept the home he offered no mr headland i know nothing of harry nosworth i hope for his own sake he is dead cleek made no reply he sat for a minute pinching his chin and staring at the carpet then he got up suddenly and faced round in the direction of the little group at the far end of the room that's all for the present he said mr narkom mr nippers get a light of some sort please and let's go out and have a look at those footprints end of section eleven Chapter 9 
the suggestion was acted upon immediately even mrs armroyd joining in the descent upon the portable lamps and filing out with the rest into the gloom and loneliness of the grounds and miss renfrew finding that she was likely to be left alone in this house of horrors rose quickly and hurried out with them one step beyond the threshold brought them within sight of the famous roundhouse bulked against the pale silver of the moonlit sky there it stood a grim unlovely thing of stone and steel with a trampled flower-bed encircling the base of it and a man on guard constable gorham lummy i'd clean forgot him exclaimed mr nippers as he caught sight of him and there un be keepin guard like i told un out here in the grounds whiles we'm been talkin comfortable inside he do be a chap for doin as e'en told that gorham indeed yes nobody replied to him all were busily engaged in following the lead of scotland yard as represented by cleek and superintendent narkom and bearing down on that huge stone tube within whose circular walls a dead man sat alone dreary post this constable said cleek coming abreast of the silent guard yes sir very but duty's duty and there you be replied gorham touching his helmet with his finger then as the light from the lamps fell upon cleek's face and let him see that it was no face he had ever seen in this district before his eyes widened with a puzzled stare which never quite left them even when the entire group had passed on and turned the curve of the roundhouse wall and beyond that curve cleek came to a sudden halt here a curtainless window cut a square of light in the wall's dark face and struck a glare on the trunk and the boughs of a lime tree directly opposite and under that window a trampled flower-bed lay with curious marks deep sunk in the soft moist surface of it cleek took the lamp from mrs armroyd's hand and bending looked at them closely mr nippers had not exaggerated when he said that they were all of twelve inches in length nor was he far out when he declared that they looked like the footprints of some creature that was part animal and part bird for there they were with three huge claw-like projections in front and a solitary one behind and so like to the mark which a gigantic bird could have made that one might have said such a creature had made them only that it was impossible for anything to fly that was possessed of weight sufficient to drive those huge footprints so deeply into the earth as they had been driven by the mere walking of the thing claws and the marks of scales mr nippers had asserted and claws and the marks of scales the prints in the soft earth showed la la the horror of them exclaimed mrs armroyd putting up her little hands and averting her face it could kill and kill and kill horses oxen anything an abominable creature like that what do you think i do have been monsieur souls of the saints what blessed if i know said cleek only of course it couldn't possibly be anything human so we may put the idea of the old chap having been killed by anything of his kind out of our minds altogether it is perfectly clear that the creature whatever it might be got in through the window there you see it is open and killed him before he could call out for help or strike a blow in his own defence Eh, but window's six foot up mr headland sir put in nippers excitedly and how am a thing the weight of that going to fly in didn't fly in my friend replied cleek with an air of lofty superiority use your wits man it jumped in from the tree there look here see going to it and tapping certain abrasions upon the trunk here's where it peeled off the bark in climbing up lord man why it's plain as the nose on your face ten to one we shall find the same sort of footprints when we go into the laboratory damp ones you know from the moisture of the earth and to make sure in case we do find them let's take the length of the things and see got a tape measure with you no oh well lend me your handcuffs if you've got a pair with you and we can manage a measurement with those 
thanks very much now then let's see one two three by jupiter three fingers longer than these things chain and all that'll do now then let's go in and see about the others lead the way miss renfrew if you will she would and did leading the way back to the covered passage she opened a door in the side of it a door designed to let the inventor out into the grounds without going through the house if he so desired and conducted them to the laboratory leaving constable gorham to continue his dreary sentry duty outside at any time the interior of that huge stone-walled steel-lined tube must have been unlovely and depressing to all but the man who laboured in it but to-night with that man sitting dead in it with his face to the open window a lamp beside him and stiff hands resting on the pages of a book that lay open on the desk's flat top it was doubly so for added to its other unpleasant qualities there was now a disagreeable odour and a curious eye-smarting throat-roughening heaviness in the atmosphere which was like to nothing so much as the fumes thrown off by burnt chemicals cleek gave one or two sniffs at the air as he entered glanced at mr narkom then walked straightway to the desk and looked into the dead man's face under the marks of the scratches and cuts upon it marks which would seem to carry out the idea of an animal's attack the features were distorted and discoloured and the hair of beard and moustache was curiously crinkled and discoloured cleek stopped dead short as he saw that face and his swaggering flippant cocksure air of a minute before dropped from him like a discarded mantle hello this doesn't look quite so promising for the animal theory as it did he flung out sharply this man has been shot shot with a shell filled with his own soundless and annihilating devil's invention lithamite and bomb-throwing is not a trick of beasts of a lower order than the animal tribe look here mr narkom see the lock of the desk has been broken shut the door there nippers let nobody leave the room there has been murder and robbery here and the thing that climbed that tree was not an animal nor yet a bird it was a cut-throat and a thief naturally enough this statement produced something in the nature of a panic miss renfrew indeed appearing to be on the verge of fainting and it is not at all unlikely that she would have slipped to the floor but for the close proximity of mrs armroyd that's right madame get a chair put her into it she will need all her strength presently i promise you wait a bit better have a doctor i fancy and an inquiry into the whereabouts of mr charles drummond mr narkom cut out will you and wire this message to that young man's employer pens and papers were on the dead man's desk cleek bent over scratched off some hurried lines and passed them to the superintendent sharp's the word please we've got ugly business on hand and we must know about that drummond chap without delay miss renfrew has not been telling the truth to-night look at this man rigor mortis pronounced feel him muscles like iron flesh like ice she says that he spoke to her at a quarter to eight o'clock i tell you that at a quarter to eight this man had been dead upward of an hour good god exclaimed mr narkom but his cry was cut into by a wilder one from miss renfrew oh, oh no oh no she protested starting up from her seat only to drop back into it strengthless shaking ghastly pale it could not be it could not i have told the truth nothing but the truth he did speak to me at a quarter to eight he did he did constable gorham was there he heard him he will tell you the same yes yes i know you said so but will he he looks a sturdy straight-going honest sort of chap who couldn't be coaxed or bribed into backing up a lie so send him in as you go out mr narkom we'll see what he has to say 
what he had to say when he came in a few moments later was what miss renfrew had declared an exact corroboration of her statement he had seen a man whom he fancied was sir ralph droger run out of the grounds and he had suggested to miss renfrew that they had better look into the round house and see if all was right with mr nosworth they had looked in as she had said and mr nosworth had called out and asked her what the devil she was coming in and disturbing him for and it was a quarter to eight o'clock exactly sure about that are you questioned cleek yes sir sure as that i'm telling you so this minute how do you fix the exact time as we came out of the covered passage miss renfrew looked at her wrist-watch and says impatient-like there i've lost another two minutes and am that much later for nothing see it's a quarter to eight good night then she cut off over the grounds and leaves me la la exclaimed mrs armroyd approvingly there's the brave heart to come to mademoiselle's rescue so gallantly but yes i make you the cake of plums for that mon cher monsieur of the yard of scotland he can no more torture the poor stricken child after that not he but cleek appeared to be less easy to convince than she had hoped for he pursued the subject still questioning gorham to needless length it seemed trying his best to trip him up to shake his statement but always failing and indeed going over the same ground to such length that one might have thought he was endeavouring to gain time if he was he certainly succeeded for it was quite fifteen minutes later when mr narkom returned to the round house and he was at it still indeed he did not conclude to give it up as a bad job until the superintendent came get it off all right did you mr narkom he asked glancing round as he heard him enter quite all right old chap right as rain in every particular thanks very much i'm having rather a difficult task of it for our friend the constable here corroborates miss renfrew's statement to the hair and yet i'm absolutely positive that there is a mistake there is no mistake no not one the wicked one to say it still oh that's all very well madame but i know what i know and when you tell me that a dead man can ask questions pah, the fact of the matter is the constable merely fancies he heard mr nosworth speak that's where the mistake comes in now look here i once knew of an exactly similar case and i'll tell you just how it happened let us suppose strolling leisurely forward let us suppose that this space here is the covered passage and you madame step here a moment please thanks very much and you are miss renfrew and gorham here is himself and standing beside her as he did then wasn't beside her sir at least not just exactly a bit behind her like this oh very well then that will do now then here's the passage and here are you and i'll just show you how a mistake could occur and how it did occur under precisely similar circumstances once upon a time when i was in paris in paris monsieur yes madame this little thing i'm going to tell you about happened there you may or may not have heard that a certain frenchy dramatist wrote a play called chanticlay or maybe you never heard of it didn't eh well it's a play where all the characters are barnyard creatures dogs poultry birds and the like and the odd fancy of men and women dressing up like fowls took such a hold on the public that before long there were chanticlay dances and chanticlay parties in all the houses and chanticlay turns on at all the music halls until wherever one went for an evening's amusement one was pretty sure to see somebody or other dressed up like a cock or a hen and running the thing to death but that's another story and we'll pass over it 
now it just so happened that one night when the craze for the thing was dying out and barnyard dresses could be bought for a song i strolled into a little fourth-rate cafe at montmartre and there saw the only chanticler dancer that i ever thought was worth a sou she was a pretty dainty little thing light as a feather and graceful as a fairy alone i think she might have made her mark but she was one of what in music halldom they call a team her partner was a man bad dancer an indifferent singer but a really passable ventriloquist a ventriloquist monsieur uh, uh. cleek madame name's cleek if you don't mind cleek oh lummy blurted out mr nippers but neither madame nor constable gorham said anything they merely swung round and made a sudden bolt and cleek making a bolt too pounced down on them like a leaping cat and the sharp click click of the handcuffs he had borrowed from mr nippers told just when he linked their two wrists together game's up madame fifine otherwise madame nosworth the worthless wife of a worthless husband he rapped out sharply game's up mr henry nosworth bandit pickpocket and murderer there's a hot corner in hell waiting for the brute beast that could kill his own father and would for the simple sake of money get at him quick mr narkom he's got one free hand nip the paper out of his pocket before the brute destroys it played sir played buck up miss renfrew buck up little girl you'll get your boy and you'll get mr septimus nosworth's promised fortune after all god's in his heaven and all's right with the world end of section twelve chapter ten yes a very very clever scheme indeed miss renfrew agreed cleek laid with great cunning and carried out with extreme carefulness as witness the man's coming here and getting appointed constable and biding his time and the woman serving as cook for six months to get the entree to the house and to be ready to assist when the time of action came round i don't think i had the least inkling of the truth until i entered this house and saw that woman she had done her best to pad herself to an unwieldy size and to blanch portions of her hair but she couldn't quite make her face appear old without betraying the fact that it was painted and hers is one of those peculiarly pretty faces that one never forgets when one has ever seen it i knew her the instant i entered the house and remembering the chanticlay dress with its foul-foot boots i guessed at once what those marks would prove to be when i came to investigate them she must have stamped on the ground with all her might to sink the marks in so deeply but she meant to make sure of the claws and the exaggerated scales on the toes leaving their imprint i was certain that we should find that dress and those boots among her effects and mr narkom did what i wrote on that pretended telegram was for him to slip away into the house proper and search every trunk and cupboard for them pardon no i don't think they really had any idea of incriminating sir ralph droger that thought came into the fellow's mind when you stepped out and caught him stealing away after the murder had been committed no doubt he like you had seen sir ralph practising for the sports and he simply made capital of it the main idea was to kill his father and to destroy the will and of course when it became apparent that the old gentleman had died intestate even a discarded son must inherit where he made his blunder however was in his haste to practise his ventriloquial accomplishment to prevent your going into the roundhouse and discovering that his father was already dead he ought to have waited until you had spoken so that it would appear natural for the old man to know without turning who it was that had opened the door that is what put me on the track of him until that moment i hadn't the slightest suspicion where he was nor under what guise he was hiding 
of course i had a vague suspicion even before i came and saw her that the cook was in it her readiness in inventing a fictitious gypsy with a bear's muzzle coupled with what nippers had told me of the animal marks she had pointed out looked a bit fishy but until i actually met her nothing really tangible began to take shape in my thoughts that's all i think and now good night and good luck to you miss renfrew the riddle is solved and mr narkom and i must be getting back to the wilderness and to our ground-floor beds in the hotel of the beautiful stars here as if some spirit of nervous unrest had suddenly beset him he turned round on his heel motioned the superintendent to follow and brushing by the awed and staring mr ephraim nippers whisked open the door and passed briskly out into the hush and darkness of the night the footpath which led through the grounds to the gate and thence to the long lonely way back to dollops and the caravan lay before him he swung into it with a curious sort of energy and forged away from the house at such speed that narkom's short fat legs were hard put to it to catch up with him before he came to the path's end my dear chap are you going to training for a match with that sir ralph what's his name of whom miss renfrew spoke he wheezed when he finally overtook him you long lean beggars are the very old boy for covering the ground but wait until you get to be my age by james perhaps i shan't perhaps they won't let me threw back cleek in a voice curiously blurred as if he spoke with his teeth hard shut donkeys do die you know that little bit of tommy rot about the absence of their dead bodies to the contrary meaning what old chap that i've been as big an ass as any of the thistle-eating kind that ever walked gad such an indiscretion such an example of pure brainlessness and the worst of it is that it's all due to my own wretched vanity my own miserable weakness for the theatrical and the spectacular it came to me suddenly while i was standing there explaining things to miss renfrew and i could have kicked myself for my folly folly what folly what folly what good heavens man use your wits isn't it enough for me to be a blockhead without you entering the list along with me said cleek irritably oh no forgive that dear friend my nerves were speaking not my heart but in moments like this when we had built a safe bridge and my own stupidity has hacked it down i tell you i could kick myself didn't you hear didn't you see i saw that for some special reason you were suddenly obsessed with a desire to get out of the house in the midst of your talking with miss renfrew if that's what you refer to is it not altogether it's part of it however but not the worst part unfortunately it was at that moment then the recollection of my indiscretion came to me and i realized what a dolt i had been how completely i had destroyed our splendid security wrecked what little still remains of this glorious holiday when i couldn't let george headland have the centre of the stage but needs must come in like the hero of a melodrama and announce myself as cleek to nosworth and his wife to nippers to all that gaping crowd you remember that incident surely yes of course i do but what of it what of it man alive with a chap like that nippers how long do you suppose it will remain a secret that cleek is in yorkshire in the west riding of it in this particular locality travelling about with mr maverick narkom in a caravan a caravan that can't cover five miles of country in the time a train or a motor-car is able to get over fifty good lad i never thought of that but wait a bit there's a way to overcome that difficulty of course stop here a minute or two and i'll run back and pledge that nippers fool to keep his mouth shut about it he'll give me his promise i know 
to be sure he will but how long do you suppose he will keep it how long do you suppose that an empty-headed gabbling old fool like that fellow will refrain from increasing his own importance in the neighbourhood by swaggering about and boasting of his intimacy with the powers at scotland yard and the rest of it and even if he shouldn't what about the others the gathering of rustics that heard what he had the gamekeepers from the droger estate the nosworths as well as they can their mouths too be shut they will not love me for this night's business be sure then too they have lived in paris the woman is french by birth of montmartre of the apache class the apache kind and she will know of the cracksman be assured so will her husband and they won't take their medicine lying down believe me an accused man has the right to communicate with counsel remember and a wire up to london will cost less than a shilling so as between margot's crew and our friend count valdemar la la there you are mr narkom screwed up his face and said something under his breath he could not but follow this line of reasoning when the thing was put before him so plainly and we had been so free from all worry over the beggars up to this he said savagely but to get a hint to pick up the scent out here in a wild bit of country like this cinnamon it makes me sweat what do you propose to do the only thing that's left us to do gave back cleek get out of it as quickly as possible and draw a red herring over the scent in other words put back to dollops abandon the caravan make our way to some place where it is possible to telephone for the chap we hired it from to send out and get it then to make tracks for home yes but why bother about telephoning old chap why can't we drop in ourselves and tell the man when we get back to sheffield on our way to london because we're not going back to sheffield my friend not going in for anything so silly as twice travelling over the same ground if it's all the same to you replied cleek as he swung off from the highway on to the dark still moor and struck out for the place where they had left dollops and the caravan at best we can't be more than thirty miles from the boundary line of cumberland a night's walking will cover that there we can rest a while at some little out-of-the-way hostelry then take a train over the scottish border and make for dumfries from that point on the game is easy there are six trains a day leaving for st pancras and eight for euston we can choose which we like and a seven hours ride will land us in london without having once doubled on our tracks or crossed the route by which we came out of it by james what a ripping idea said mr narkom approvingly come along then old chap let's get back to the boy and be about it as soon as possible then he threw open his coat and waistcoat to get the full benefit of the air before facing the ordeal and falling into step with cleek struck out over the moor at so brisk a dog-trot that his short fat legs seemed fairly to twinkle end of section thirteen chapter eleven by the side of the little chattering stream that flowed through the bit of woodland where mr nippers and his associates had come upon them they found dollops with his legs drawn up his arms folded across his knees and his forehead resting upon them sleeping serenely over the embers of a burnt-out fire he was still making music but of a kind which needed no assistance from a mouth harmonica to produce it they awoke him and told him of the sudden change in the programme and of the need for haste in carrying it out oh so help me them apaches eh and that foreign josser count what's his name too said he rubbing his eyes and blinking sleepily right you are governor give me two seconds to get the cobwebs out of me thinking box and i'm ready to face marching orders as soon as you like my hat though but this is a startler i can understand what them apache johnnies has got against you sir of course but what that mauravanian biscuit is getting after you for beats me 
what did you ever do to the blighter governor trip him up in some little bit of crooked business sir and did him down as the americans say something like that returned cleek don't waste time in talking simply get together such things as we shall need and let us be off about our business as soon as possible dollops obeyed instructions upon both points obeyed them indeed with such alacrity that he shut up like an oyster forthwith dived into the caravan and bounced out again and within five minutes of the time he had been told of the necessity for starting had started and was forging away with the others over the dark still moor and facing cheerily the prospect of a thirty-mile walk to cumberlandshire all through the night they pressed onward thus the two men walking shoulder to shoulder and the boy at their heels over vast stretches of moorland where bracken and grass hung heavy and glittering under their weight of dew down the craggy sides of steep gullies where the spring freshets had quickened mere trickles into noisy water splashes that spewed over the rocks to fall into chuckling froth-filled pools below along twisting paths through the dark still woodland stretches and thence out upon the wild wet moor again with the wind in their faces and the sky all a prickle with steadily dimming stars and by and by the mist-wrapped moon dropped down out of sight the worn-out night dwindled and died and steadily brightening glory went blushing up the east to flower the pathway for the footfalls of the morning but as yet the farthermost outposts of cumberland were miles beyond the range of vision so that the long tramp was by no means ended and feeling the necessity for covering as much ground as possible while the world at large was still in what dollops was wont to allude to as the arms of murphy's house the little party continued to press onward persistently by four o'clock they were again off the moors and in the depths of craggy gorges by five they were on the borders of a deep still tarn and had called a halt to light a fire and get things out of the bag which dollops carried things to eat and to drink and to wear and were enjoying a plunge in the ice-cold water the while the coffee was boiling and by six gorged with food and soothed by tobacco they were lying sprawled out on the fragrant earth and blinking drowsily while their boots were drying before the fire and after that there was a long hiatus until cleek's voice rapped out saying sharply well i'll be dashed rouse up there you lazy beggars do you know that it's half past twelve and we've been sleeping for hours they knew it then be assured and were up on their way again with as little delay as possible rested and refreshed they made such good time that two o'clock found them in the morecambe abbey district just over the borders of cumberland and with appetites sharpened for luncheon bearing down on a quaint little hostelry whose signboard announced it as the rose and thistle well there's hospitality if you like said cleek as at their approach a cheery-faced landlady bobbed up at an open window and seeing them bobbed away again and ran round to welcome them with smiles and curtsies delivered from the arch of a vine-bowered door welcome gentlemen welcome beamed she as they came up and joined her but however in the world did you manage to get over here so soon the train not being due at shepherd and old cross until five and twenty past one and that a good mile and a quarter away as the crow flies however better too early than too late major norcross and lady mary being already here and most anxious to meet you as it happened that neither cleek nor mr narkom had any personal acquaintance with the lady and gentleman mentioned it was so clearly a case of mistaken identity that the superintendent had it on the tip of his tongue to announce the fact when there clashed out the sound of a door opening and shutting rapidly a clatter of hasty footsteps along the passage and presently there came into view the figure of a bluff hearty florid-faced man of about five-and-forty who thrust the landlady aside and threw a metaphorical bombshell by exclaiming excitedly my dear sir i never was so delighted talk about english slowness why this is prompt enough to satisfy a yankee i never dispatched my letter to you until late yesterday afternoon mr narkom and by the way which is mr narkom 
and which that amazing mr cleek or oh, never mind perhaps that clever johnny will be coming later you can tell me all about that afterward for the present come along let's not keep lady mary waiting she's anxious this way please here as mr narkom had lost no time in acknowledging his identity it being clear that no mistake had been made after all here he caught the superintendent by the arm whisked him down the passage and throwing open the door at the end of it announced excitedly all right mary the yard's answered the big reward's caught him as i knew it would and here's narkom that chap cleek will come by a later train no doubt the response to this came from an unexpected quarter of a sudden the man he had left standing at the outer door under the impression that he was in no way connected with the superintendent but merely a gentleman who had reached the inn at the same time came down the passage to the open door brushed past him into the room and announced gravely permit me to correct an error please major the man cleek is not coming later he is here and very much at your and lady mary norcross service believe me i have long known the name of major seaton norcross as one which stands high in the racing world as that indeed of the gentleman who owns the finest stud in the kingdom and whose filly highland lassie is first favourite for the forthcoming derby and i now have the honour of meeting the gentleman himself it seems the effect of this was somewhat disconcerting for as he concluded it he put out his hand and rested it upon mr narkom's shoulder whereat lady mary half rose from her seat only to sit down again suddenly and look round at her liege lord with uplifted eyebrows and lips slightly parted afterward she declared of the two men standing side by side in that familiar manner one reminded me of an actor trying to play the part of a person of distinction and the other of a person of distinction trying to play the part of an ordinary actor and not quite able to keep what he really was from showing through the veneer of what he was trying to be the major however was too blunt to bottle up his sentiments at any time and being completely bowled over in the present instance put them into bluff outspoken characteristic words oh gun games he blurted out if you really are cleek i really am mr narkom will stand sponsor for that Oh, good lud man oh look here you know this is old tommy rot what under god's heaven has brought a chap like you down to this sort of thing opinions differ upon that score major said cleek quietly so far from being brought down it is my good friend mr narkom here who has brought me up to it and made me his debtor for life debtor nothing don't talk rubbish as if it were possible for a gentleman not to recognize a gentleman it would not be so easy i fear if he were a good actor and you have just done me the compliment of indirectly telling me that i must be one it is very nice of you but may we not let it go at that i fancy from what i hear that i too shall soon be in the position to pay compliments major i hear on every side that highland lassie is sure to carry off the derby in fact that unless a miracle occurs there'll be no horse in it but her here both the major and his wife grew visibly excited gad sir exclaimed he in a voice of deep despair i am afraid you will have to amend that statement so that it may read unless a miracle occurs there will be every horse in it but her every blessed one from dawson blake's tarantula the second favourite down to the last also ran of the lot good heavens the filly hasn't gone wrong suddenly has she she's done more than gone wrong she's gone altogether some beastly low-lived cur of a horse-thief broke into the stables the night before last and stole her stole her sir body and bones and there's not so much as a hoof-print to tell what became of her well i'm blessed are you begad then you're about the only one who knows about it that is for as if that wasn't bad enough i've not only lost the best filly in england but the best trainer as well and the brute that carried off the one got at the other at the same time dash him 
what do you mean by got at the trainer major did the man take a bribe and sell you that way oh, tom farrow never in god's world nor that kind of a chap by george the man that offered tom farrow a bribe would spend the rest of the week in bed gad yes a more faithful chap never drew the breath of life god only knows when or how the thing happened but farrow was found on the moor yesterday morning quite unconscious and at death's door he had been bludgeoned in the most brutal manner imaginable not only was his right arm broken but his skull was all but crushed in there was concussion of the brain of course poor fellow he can't speak a word and the chances are that he never will be able to do so again bad business that declared cleek looking grave any idea of who may possibly have been the assailant local police picked up anything in the nature of a clue the local police know nothing whatsoever about it i have not reported the case to them not reported hmm. rather unusual course that to pursue isn't it when a man has his place broken into a valuable horse stolen and his trainer all but murdered one would naturally suppose that his first act would be to set the machinery of the law in motion without an instant's delay that is unless hmm, yes just so what is just so inquired the major eagerly you seem to have hit upon some sort of an idea right at the start mind telling me what it is certainly not i could imagine that when a man keeps silent about such a thing at such a time there is a possibility that he has a faint idea of who the criminal may be and that he has excellent reasons for not wishing the world at large to share that idea in other words that he would sooner lose the value of the animal fifty times over than have the crime brought home to the person he suspects End of section 14「12. Lady Mary made a faint moaning sound. The Major's face was a study. "'I don't know whether you are a wizard or not, Mr. Cleek,' he said after a moment. "'But you have certainly hit upon the facts of the matter. It is for that very reason that I have refrained from making the affair public. It is bad enough that Lady Mary and I should have our suspicions regarding the identity of the uh, person implicated.' without letting others share them there's dawson blake for one if he knew he'd move heaven and earth to ruin him dawson blake repeated cleek pardon but will that be the particular sir gregory dawson blake the millionaire brewer who achieved a knighthood in the last honours list and whose horse tarantula is second favourite for the coming derby yes the very man he is almost what you might call a neighbour of ours mr cleek his place castle claverdale is just over the borderline of northumberland and about five miles distant from morcan abbey his stables are if anything superior to my own and we both use the intervening moorland as a training ground also it was dawson blake's daughter that lieutenant chadwick played fast and loose with jilted her you know threw her over at the eleventh hour and married a chorus girl who had nothing to bless herself with but a pretty face and a long line of lodging-house ancestry not that miss dawson blake lost anything by getting rid of such a man before she committed the folly of tying herself to him for life but her father never forgave lieutenant chadwick and would spend a million for the satisfaction of putting him behind bars i see and this lieutenant chadwick is whom may i ask the only son of my elder and only sister mr cleek supplied lady mary with a faint blush she committed the folly of marrying her music master when i was but a little girl and my father died without ever looking at her again subsequently her husband deserted her and went she never learnt where to the day of her death 
while she lived however both my brother lord chevelmere and i saw that she never wanted for anything we also supplied the means to put her son through sandhurst after we had put him through college and hoped that he would repay us by achieving honour and distinction it was a vain hope he achieved nothing but disgrace shortly after his deplorable marriage with the theatrical person for whom he threw over miss dawson blake and who in turn threw him over when she discovered what a useless encumbrance he was he was cashiered from the army and has ever since been a hanger-on at race meetings the consort of touts billiard markers card sharpers and people of that sort i had not seen him for six years when he turned up suddenly in this neighbourhood three days ago and endeavoured to scrape acquaintance with one of the abbey grooms and under an assumed name mr cleek supplemented the major somewhat excitedly he was calling himself john clark and was trying to wheedle information regarding highland lassie out of my stable boys fortunately lady mary caught sight of him without being seen and at once gave orders that he was to be turned off the premises and never allowed to come near them again he was known however to be in this neighbourhood up to dusk on the following evening but he has never been seen since highland lassie disappeared you know now perhaps why i have elected to conduct everything connected with this affair with the utmost secrecy little as we desire to be in any way associated with such a man we cannot but remember that he is connected with us by ties of blood and unless pharaoh dies of his injuries which god forbid we will hush the thing up cost what it may all that i want is to get the animal back not to punish the man if indeed he be the guilty party for there is really no actual proof of that but if dawson blake knew it would be different he would move heaven and earth to get the convict's broad arrow on him and to bring disgrace upon everybody connected with the man hmm i see said cleek puckering up his brows and thoughtfully stroking his chin so that naturally there is with this added to the rivalry of the two horses no very good blood existing between sir gregory dawson blake and yourself no there is not if apart from these things mr cleek you want my private opinion of the man it can be summed up in the word bounder there is not one instinct of the gentleman about him he is simply a vulgar money-gilded low-minded cad and i wouldn't put it beyond him to be mixed up in this disappearance of the filly himself but that i know chadwick was about the place and for there to be anything between chadwick and him is as impossible as it is for the two poles to come together or for oil to assimilate with water that is the one thing in this world that dawson blake would not do under any circumstances whatsoever beyond that i put nothing beneath the man nothing too despicable for him to attempt in the effort to gain his own end and aim he races not for the sport of the thing but for the publicity the glory of getting talked about and of making the vulgar stir he wants the blue ribbon of the turf for the simple fame of the thing and he'd buy it if buying it were possible and either bribes or trickery could carry off the race hmm that's a sweeping assertion major but made upon a basis of absolute fact mr cleek he has twice endeavoured to buy farrow to desert me by an offer of double wages and a pension and failing that only last week he offered my jockey ten thousand pounds cash on the nail to slip over to france on the night before derby day and promised him a further five thousand if tarantula carried off the race oh ho said cleek in two different tones and with a look of supremest contempt so our tin-plate knight is that sort of a sportsman is he the cad and having failed to get hold of the rider 
Hmm, yes, it is possible, perhaps. Chadwick's turning up at such a time might be a mere coincidence, a mere tout's trick to get inside information beforehand, or... Well, you never can tell. Suppose, Major, you give me the facts from the beginning. When was the animal's loss discovered, and how? Let me have the full particulars, please. The Major sighed and dropped heavily into a chair. For an affair of such far-reaching consequences, Mr. Cleek, he said gloomily, it is singularly bald of what might be called details, I'm afraid. And beyond what I have already told you, there is really very little more to tell. When or how the deed was committed, it is impossible to decide, beyond the indefinite statement that it happened the night before last, at some time after half-past nine in the evening, when the stable-boy Dulish, before going home, carried a pail of water at Farrow's request into the building where Highland Lassie's stall is located, and five o'clock the next morning, when Captain McTavish strolled into the stables and found the mare missing. A moment, please. Who is Captain McTavish? And why should the gentleman be strolling about the Abbey stable-yard at five o'clock in the morning? Both questions can be answered in a few words. Captain McTavish is a friend who is stopping with us. He is a somewhat famous naturalist, writes articles and stories on bird and animal life for the magazines. It is his habit to be up and out hunting for specimens and things of that sort every morning just about dawn. At five he always crosses the stable-yard on his way to the dairy, where he goes for a glass of fresh milk before breakfast. I see. Captain a young man or an old one? Oh, young, of course. About two or three and thirty, I should say. Brother of a deceased army pal of mine. Been stopping with us for the past two months. Very brilliant and very handsome chap. Universal favourite wherever he goes. Thanks. Now, just one more question before you proceed, please. About the train of Farrow getting the stable-boy to carry in that pail of water, would not that be a trifle unusual at such a time of the night? Oh, I don't know. Yes, perhaps it would. I never looked at it in that light before. Very likely not. Stables would be closed, and all the grooms, etc., off duty for the night at that hour, would they not? Yes. That is, unless Farrow had reason for asking one of them to help him with something. That's what he did, by the way, with the boy, Dulish. Just so. Any idea what he wanted with that pail of water at that hour of the night? He couldn't be going to water one of the horses, of course, and it is hardly likely that he intended to take on a stableman's duties and wash up the place. Oh, gravy, no. He's a trainer, not a slosh bucket. I pay him eighteen hundred a year and give him a cottage besides. Married man or a single one? Single. A widower. About forty. Lost his wife two years ago. Rather thought he was going to take another one shortly, from the way things looked. But of late he and Maggie McFarlane don't seem, for some reason or another, to be hitting it off together so well as they did. Who's Maggie McFarland, please? One of the dairymaids. A little Scotch girl from Nairn who came into service at the Abbey about a twelve-month ago. Hmm, I see. Then the filly isn't the only Highland lassie in the case, it would seem. Pardon? Oh, nothing. Merely a weak attempt to say something smart, that's all. Don't suppose that Maggie McFarland could by any possibility throw light upon the subject of that pail of water, do you, Major? Good lud, no. Of course she couldn't. What utter rot. But, see here, come to think of it now, perhaps I can. It's as like as not that he wanted it to wash himself with before he went over to the shewers at Shefford and Old Cross with Chocolate Maid. I forgot to tell you, Mr. Cleek, that ever since Dawson Blake made that attempt to buy him off, Farrow became convinced that it wouldn't be safe to leave Highland Lassie unguarded night or day, 
for fear of that cad's hirelings getting at her in some way or another so he closed up his cottage and came to live in the rooms over the filly's stable so as to be on the spot for whatever might or might not happen at any hour he also bought a yapping little scotch terrier that would bark if a match fell and kept it chained up in the place with him when the discovery of the filly's disappearance was made that dog was found still attached to its chain but as dead as maria martin it had been poisoned there was a bit of meat lying beside the body and it was literally smothered in strychnine quite so keep strychnine about the place for killing rats i suppose yes of course they're a perfect pest about the granary and the fodder bins but of course it wouldn't be lying round loose a deadly thing like that besides there never was any kept in that particular section of the stables so the dog couldn't have got hold of it by accident then there's another thing i ought to tell you mr cleek highland lassie never was stabled with the rest of the stud we have always kept her in one especial stable there are just two whacking big box stalls in the place she occupies one and chocolate maid the other chocolate maid is lady mary's personal property a fine blooded filly that will make a name for herself one of these days i fancy dark coated and smooth as a piece of sealskin the beauty to-day she is the only animal in that unlucky place yes come to think of it mr cleek he added with a sort of sigh that is probably what the poor fellow wanted the pail of water for to wash up and ride her over to the forge at shepperton old cross singular time to choose for such a proceeding wasn't it major after half past nine o'clock at night it would be if it were any other man and under any other circumstances but remember it is but three weeks to derby day and every hour of daylight is worth so much gold to us pharaoh knew that he could not spare a moment of it for any purpose and he is most particular over the shoeing will see it done himself and direct the operation personally sort of mania with him wouldn't let the best man that ever lived take one of the horses over for him go himself no matter what inconvenience it put him to farrier at shepperton old cross knows his little fads and fancies and humours them at all times would open the forge and fire up for him if it were two o'clock in the morning i see and did he take chocolate maid over there on that night after all yes lady mary and i attended a whist drive at farmingdale priory that evening but her ladyship was taken with a violent headache and we had to excuse ourselves and leave early it would be about a quarter to eleven o'clock when we returned to the abbey and met farrow riding out through the gates on chocolate maid we stopped and spoke to him he was then going over to the shewers with the mare how long would it take him to make the journey oh, about five and twenty minutes maybe half an hour certainly not more so then it would be about quarter past eleven when he arrived at the farrier's i see any idea at what time he got back not the ghost of one in fact we should never have known that he ever did get back for nobody heard a sound of his return the whole night long were it not that when captain mctavish crossed the stable yard at five o'clock in the morning and seeing the door ajar looked in he found chocolate maid standing in her stall the dog dead and highland lassie gone of course chocolate maid being there after he had passed farrow on the road with her was proof that he did return at some hour of the night you know though when it was or why he should have gone out again heaven alone knows personally you know i am of the opinion that highland lassie was stolen while he was absent that on returning he discovered the robbery and following the trail went out after the robbers and coming up with them got his terrible injuries that way Hmm. yes i don't think what trail was he to find please when you just now told me that there wasn't so much as a hoof print to tell the tale or was that an error no it wasn't 
The entire stable yard is paved with red tiles, and we've had such an uncommon spell of dry weather lately that the earth of the surrounding country has baked as hard as a brickbat. An elephant wouldn't make a footmark upon it, much less a horse. But gravy, man, instead of making the thing clearer, I'm blessed if you're not adding gloom to darkness and rendering it more mysterious than ever. What under the four corners of heaven could Farrow have followed, then, if the trail is to be eliminated entirely? Maybe his own inclination, Major. Maybe nothing at all, said Cleek enigmatically. If your little theory of his returning and finding Highland Lassie stolen were a thing that would hold water, I am inclined to think that Mr. Tom Farrow would have raised an alarm that you could hear for half a mile and that if he had started out after the robbers, he would have done so with a goodly force of followers at his heels, and with all the lanterns and torches that could be raked and scraped together. Good lad, yes, of course he would. I never thought of that. Did you, Mary? His whole heart and soul were bound up in the animal. If he had thought that anything had happened to her, if he had known that she was gone— a pit full of raging devils would have been spirits of meekness beside him. Man alive, you make my head whiz. For him to go off over the moor without word or cry at such a time. I say, Mr. Cleek, for God's sake, what do you make of such a thing as that at such a time, eh? Well, Major, replied Cleek, I hate to destroy any man's illusions, and to besmirch any man's reputation, but, que voulez-vous, if Mr. Tom Farrow went out upon that moor after the mare was stolen, and went without giving an alarm or saying a word to anybody, then in my private opinion your precious trainer is nothing in the world but a precious double-faced, double-dealing, dishonourable blackguard who treacherously sold you to the enemy and got just what he deserved by way of payment. Major Norcross made no reply. He simply screwed up his lips until they were a mere pucker of little creases and looked round at his wife with something of the pain and hopeless bewilderment of an unjustly scolded child. "'You know, Seaton, it was what Captain MacTavish suggested.' ventured she gently and regretfully and when two men of intellect oh, then she sighed and let the rest go by default damn it mary you don't mean to suggest that i haven't any do you no dear but buts be blowed don't you think i know a man when i run foul of him and if ever there was a square dealing honest chap on this earth "'Look here, Mr. Cleek. "'Gad, you may be a bright chap and all that, "'but you'll have to give me something a blessed sight "'stronger than mere suspicion "'before you can make me believe a thing like that about Tom Farrow.' "'I am not endeavouring to make you believe it, Major. "'I am merely showing you what would certainly be the absolute truth of the matter "'if Tom Farrow had done what you suggested.' and gone out on that moor alone, and without a word or a cry, when he discovered that the animal was stolen. But, my dear sir, I incline to the belief that he never did go out there after any person or any living thing whatsoever. Then dash it, sir! How in thunder are you going to explain his being there at all? By the simple process, Major, of suggesting that he was on his way back to the abbey at the time he encountered his unknown assailant. In other words, that he had not only never returned to the place after you and her ladyship saw him leaving it at a quarter to eleven, but was never permitted to do so. Oh, come, I say, that's laying it on too thick. How the dickens can you be sure of such a thing as that? I'm not. I am merely laying before you the only two things possible to explain his presence there. One or the other of them is the plain and absolute truth. If the man went out there after the filly was stolen, he is a scoundrel and a liar. If he is innocent, 
he met with his injuries on the way back to his quarters above highland lassie's stall but the other animal but chocolate maid how could she have got back to the stable then she couldn't have found her way back alone after farrow was assaulted at least she could of course but not in the condition she was in when found next morning she had no harness of any sort upon her her saddle was on its peg she was in her box tied up begad and the door of the box was closed and bolted so that if by any chance hello i say what on earth are you smiling in that queer way for hang it man do you believe that i don't know what i'm talking about oh yes major it isn't that kind of a smile i have just discovered that four and four make eight when you add them up properly and the smile is one of consequent satisfaction a last question please at what time in the morning was farrow found lying unconscious upon the moor somewhere between six and seven o'clock why oh nothing in particular who found him captain mctavish no maggie mcfarland she was just coming back from milking when hang it man i wish you wouldn't smile all up one side of your face in that confounded manner it makes me think that you must have something up your sleeve well if i have major suppose you drive me over to the stables and give me a chance to take it out suggested cleek serenely a little poking about sometimes does wonders and a half hour in highland lassie's quarters may pick the puzzle to pieces a great deal sooner than you'd believe or stop perhaps on second thought it will be better for you and her ladyship to go on ahead as i shall want to have a look at tom farrow's injuries as well so it will be best to have everything prepared in advance in order to save time no doubt mr narkom and i can get a conveyance of some sort here at any rate <clears throat> it is now a quarter to three i see at any rate you may certainly expect us at quarter past five you and her ladyship may go back quite openly major there will be no need to attempt to throw dust in sir gregory dawson blake's eyes any longer by keeping the disappearance of the animal a secret if he's had a hand in her spiriting away he knows of course that she's gone but if he hasn't oh well i fancy i know who did and that she will be in the running on derby day after all a few minutes in highland lassie's stable will settle that i feel sure your ladyship my compliments major good afternoon i hope if night overtakes us before we get at the bottom of the thing you can manage to put us up at the abbey until to-morrow that we may be on the spot to the last with pleasure mr cleek said lady mary and bowed him out of the room end of section fifteen chapter thirteen it was precisely ten minutes past five o'clock and the long lingering may twilight was but just beginning to gather when the spring cart of the rose and thistle arrived at the abbey stables and cleek and mr narkom descending therefrom found themselves the centre of an interested group composed of the major and lady mary the countryside doctor and captain mctavish the captain who had nothing scottish about him but his name was a smiling debonair gentleman with flaxen hair and a curling fair moustache and cleek catching sight of him as he stood leaning in a carefully studied pose against the stable doorpost with one foot crossed over the other one hand in his trousers pocket and the other swinging a hunting crop whose crook was a greyhound's head wrought in solid silver concluded that here was perhaps the handsomest man of his day and that in certain sections of society he might be guaranteed to break hearts by the hundred it must be said of him however that he carried his manifold charms of person with smooth serenity and perfect poise that if he realized his own beauty he gave no outward evidences of it he was calm serene well-bred 
and had nothing of the doll or the johnny element in either his bearing or his deportment he was at once splendidly composed and almost insolently bland pleased to meet you mr cleek read a great deal about you one way and another he said when the major made the introduction a performance which the captain evidently considered superfluous as between an army officer and a police detective sorry i shan't be able to remain and study your interesting methods however should have been rather pleased to do so otherwise and i for my part should have been pleased to have you do so captain i assure you replied cleek the first intonation of his voice causing the captain to twitch up his head and stare at him as if he were a monstrosity shall you be leaving us then before the investigation is concluded well i'm blessed why how in the world oh uh, yes uh, obliged to go wire from london this afternoon regiment sails for india in two days beastly nuisance shall miss the derby and all that by the way norcross if this chap succeeds in finding the filly in time for the race that little bet of ours stands of course of course agreed the major ready are you mr cleek right you are come along and he forthwith led the way into the stable where chocolate maid like a perfect horse in french bronze stood munching hay in her box as contentedly as if there were no such things in the world as touts and swindlers and horse thieves and her companion of two days ago still shared the quarters with her gad but she's a beauty and no mistake major said cleek as he went over and leaning across the low barrier of the enclosure patted the mare's shoulder and smoothed her glossy neck i don't wonder that you and her ladyship have such high hopes for her future the creature seems well-nigh perfect yes she is a pretty good bit of horseflesh replied he but not to be compared with highland lassie in speed wind or anything there she is mr cleek and it's as natural as life the beauty speaking he waved his hand toward a framed picture of the missing animal a coloured gift plate which had been given away with the easter number of the horseman and which farrow had had glazed and hung just over her box cleek following the direction of the indicating hand looked up and saw the counterfeit presentment of a splendidly proportioned sorrel with a splash of white on the flank and a white stocking on the left forefoot a beauty as you say major agreed he but do you know that i for my part prefer the charms of chocolate maid maybe bad judgment upon my part but there you are what a coat what a colour what splendid legs the beauty mind if i step in for a moment and have a look at her the major did not so he went in forthwith and proceeded to look over the animal's points feeling her legs stroking her flanks examining her hoofs and it was then and then only that the major remembered about the visit to the farriers over at shepperton old cross and began to understand that it was not all simple admiration of the animal this close examination of her oh by jove i say he blurted out as he made with cleek a sudden discovery his face going first red and then very pale under the emotions thus engendered she hasn't any new shoes on has she so she can't have been taken to the farriers after all no said cleek she can't i half suspected that she hadn't so well let it go let's have a look round highland lassie's box please hm yes very nice very splendid everything of the best and all in apple pie order by the way major you surely don't allow harness to be washed and oiled in here certainly not what in the world could have put such an idea into your head 
merely that bit of rag and that dirty sponge tucked in the corner over there and half covered by the bedding the major went over and touched the things with the toe of his boot it's one of those imps of stable boys the young vandals he declared as he kicked the rag and the sponge out of the box and across the stable floor it's well for them that pharaoh isn't about or there would be some cuffed ears for that sort of presumption the young beggars hello found something else no said cleek that is nothing of any importance merely a bit torn from an old handbill see it probably got mixed up with the bedding it's of no account anyhow here he gave his hand a flirt as if flinging the bit of paper over the low barrier of the box instead of which he cleverly palmed it and afterward conveyed it unsuspected to his pocket you were right in what you declared this afternoon major for a case of such far-reaching effects it is singularly bald in the matter of detail at all events there's no more to be discovered here by the way doctor am i privileged to go up and see the patient i should like to do so if i may by all means sir by all means replied the doctor i am happy to inform you that his condition has considerably improved since my visit at noon mr cleek and i have now every hope that he may pull through all right excellent said cleek but i think i shouldn't let that good news go abroad just yet a while doctor if you haven't taken anybody into your confidence regarding it as yet don't do so you haven't have you no that is nobody but those who are now present i told the major and her ladyship on their return this afternoon of course and naturally captain mactavish he was with me at the time i made the examination which led me to arrive at the conclusion that the man would survive ah said cleek and the curious one-sided smile went slowly up his cheek oh well everything is all right among friends of course but i shouldn't let it go any farther and now if you please let us go up to pharaoh's room they went up forthwith lady mary alone refraining from joining the group and a moment or two later cleek found himself standing beside the bed of the unconscious trainer he was a strong sturdily built man this tom farrow upon whose integrity the major banked so heavily in his warm trustful outspoken way and if the face is any index to the mind which in nine cases out of ten it isn't that trustfulness and confidence were not misplaced for pharaoh's was a frank open countenance which suggested a clear conscience and an honest nature even though it was now pale and drawn with the lines that come of suffering and injury at cleek's request the doctor removed the bandages and allowed him to inspect the wound at the back of the head hmm made with a heavy implement shaped somewhat after the fashion of a golf stick and almost as heavy as a sledgehammer he commented arm broken too probably that was done first and the man struck again after he was on the ground and unable to defend himself there are two blows you see this one just above the ear and that crushing one at the back of the head that's all i care to see doctor thank you you may replace the bandages nevertheless although he asserted this it was noticeable that his examination of the stricken trainer did not end here for while the doctor was busy replacing the bandages he took the opportunity to lift the man's hands and inspect them closely parting the fingers and looking at the thin loose folds of skin between them a few minutes later the bandages being replaced and the patient turned over to the nurse in charge the entire party left the room and filed down the stairs together any ideas mr cleek questioned the major eagerly yes plenty of them replied he i rather fancy we shall not have to put you to the trouble of housing us at the abbey to-night major the case is a shallower one than i fancied at first shouldn't be surprised if we cleared it all up inside of the next two hours 
well i'll be dithered exclaimed the major aghast do you mean to tell me that you've got at the bottom of the thing that you've found something that leads you to suspect where the animal is more than suspect major i know where she is by half past seven o'clock to-night if you want me to make you a promise i'll put her bridle into your hands and she will be at the other end of it you will i certainly will major my word for it well of all the dash i'm done i'm winded i'm simply scoop dry where on earth did you get your clothes man you never did anything but walk about that i could see and now to declare i say mactavish did you hear that did you hear what he has promised eh <laughs> i heard responded the captain with a laugh but i believe when i see i say mr inspector where did you find the secret hidden between pharaoh's fingers or wrapped around chocolate maid's legs both said cleek serenely tell you something else if you care to hear it i know who poisoned the dog the other night pharaoh did it himself the major's exclamation of indignation was quite lost in the peal of the captain's laughter. Ha ha ha! Hawkshaw out, Hawkshaw! cried he derisively. Find out that too from Pharaoh's fingers? Oh, no, that would be impossible. He washed them before he went out that night, and they've been washed by the nurse several times since. I found it out from the dog himself and he's not the only dog in this little business believe me though i'm willing to stake my reputation and my life upon it that neither one nor the other of them had any hand in spiriting away the missing horse who did then mr cleek who did tom farrow and tom farrow alone major began cleek and then stopped suddenly interrupted by a painful circumstance by this time they had reached the foot of the stairs and were filing out into the stable again, and there, by the open door, Lady Mary Norcross was standing, endeavouring to soothe and to comfort a weeping girl, Maggie MacFarland, the dairymaid from Nan. "'Oh, but say you winner, dee, say you winner,' she was crying out distressfully. "'If I thought the sin o' that were added to the sale conscience o' me!' Then, with a sudden intaking of the breath as if drowning, and a sudden paleness that made her face seem ivory white, she cowered away, with hands closed shut and eyes wide with fright, as she looked up and saw the gentleman descending. It winna matter, it winna matter. I can come again, my lady, she said, in a frightened sort of whisper, which rose suddenly to a sort of wailing cry as she faced round and ran like a thing pursued. Cleek glanced round quietly and looked at Captain McTavish. He was still his old, handsome, debonair, smiling self, but there was a look in his eyes which did not make them a very pleasant sight at present upon my word seaton i cannot make out what has come over that silly girl said lady mary as her liege lord appeared she came here begging to be allowed to go up and see pharaoh and to be assured that he would live and then the moment you all put in an appearance she simply dashed away as you saw i really cannot understand what can be the matter with her don't bother about that just now mary don't bother about anything my dear but what this amazing man has promised exclaimed the major excitedly do you know he has declared that if we give him until half past seven to-night here cleek interrupted your pardon major i amend that he said i know all about the horse and it will not now take so long as i thought to know all about the dog as well give me one hour major just one gentleman all and i will give you the answer to the riddle every part of it dog's part as well as horses here on this spot so surely as i am a living man major all i ask of you is one thing 
let me have a couple of your grooms out there on the moor inside of the next fifteen minutes please may i have them certainly mr cleek as many as you want two will do thanks two are enough for fair play in any little bout and not going to stop and see the finish captain it will all be over in an hour sorry but i've got my packing to attend to my man ah to be sure oh well it doesn't matter you know the proverb if the mountain will not come to mahomet why mahomet must go to the mountain of course said cleek i'll just slip round to the dairy and have a glass of milk to brace me up for the business and then in one hour in just one by the watch you shall have the answer to the riddle here then with a bow to lady mary he walked out of the stable and went round the angle of the building after maggie mcfarland end of section sixteen chapter fourteen he lived up to the letter of his promise in an hour he had said when he walked out and it was an hour to the very tick of the minute when he came back mr narkom knowing him so well knowing how in the final moments of his coup he was apt to become somewhat spectacular and theatrical looked for him to return with a flourish of trumpets and carry all before him with a whirlwind rush so that it came in the nature of a great surprise when with the calmness of a man coming in to tea he entered the stable with a large stone bottle in one hand and an ostler's sponge in the other well gentlemen i am here you see he said with extreme calmness and indicating the bottle have brought something with me to do honour to the event no not to drink it is hardly that sort of stuff it is spirit of wine major i found it over in farrow's cottage and have brought it with me as he poor chap meant to do in time himself there are some wonderful things in tom farrow's cottage major they will pay for looking into i assure you pardon mr narkom a criminal oh no my friend a martyr a martyr, a martyr? yes your ladyship yes major a martyr a martyr to his love a martyr to his fidelity as square a man and as faithful a trainer as ever set foot in a stable-yard that's tom farrow i take off my hat to him the world can do with more of his kind but my dear sir you said that it was he that spirited away the animal that it was he and he alone who was responsible for her disappearance quite so and i say it again gently gently major i'll come to it in a minute personally i should like to put it off to the last it's such a fine thing for a finish by jove but well it can't be done under the circumstances in other words there is a part of this little business this evening which i must ask lady mary not to stop to either hear or see but as she is naturally interested in the matter of highland lassie's disappearance i will take up that matter first and ask her to kindly withdraw after the filly has been restored gad you've found her then you've got her yes major i've got her and as i promised that i would put her bridle into your hand with the animal herself at the other end of it why here you are speaking he walked across to the box where the brown filly was tethered unbolted it unfastened the animal and led her out here you are major he said as he tendered him the halter take hold of her the beauty and may she carry off the derby stakes with flying colours but good lad man what on earth are you talking about this is chocolate maid this is lady mary's horse oh no major oh no chocolate maid is in the stable at farrow's cottage 
hidden away and half starved poor creature because he couldn't go back to feed and look after her this is your bonny highland lassie died to look like the other and to throw possible horse nobblers and thieves off the scent if you doubt it look here he uncorked the bottle poured some of the spirit of wine on the sponge and rubbed the animal's brown flank the dark colour came away the sorrel hide and the white splotch began to appear and before you could say jack robinson the major and lady mary had their arms about the animal's neck and were blubbing like a couple of children oh my bully girl oh my spiffing girl oh mary isn't it clinking dear the lassie the island lassie her own bonny self yes her own bonny self major said cleek and you'd never have had a moment's worry over her if that faithful fellow upstairs had been suffered to get back here that night and to tell you about it in the morning i've had a little talk with oh well somebody who is in a position to give me information that corroborates my own little shots at the matter i'll tell you all about that later on and so am able to tell you a thing or two that you ought to have known before this i don't know whether lieutenant chadwick's coming here and prying about had any wish to do harm to the horse at the back of it or not i only know that farrow thought it had and he played this little trick to block the game and to throw dust into the eyes of anybody that attempted to get at her what he did then was to dye her so that she might be mistaken for chocolate maid then to take chocolate maid over to his own stable and hide her there until the time came to start for epsom that's what he wanted the pail of water for major to mix the dye and to apply it i half suspected it from the beginning but i became sure of it when i found that scrap of paper in the bedding of the box it was still wet a bit of the label from the dye bottle which came off in the operation between the poor chap's fingers i found stains of the dye still remaining spirit of wine would have removed it but washing in water wouldn't pardon your ladyship when did i begin to suspect that farrow was at the bottom of it oh when first i heard of the poisoned dog nobody ever heard it bark when the poisoner approached the stables that of course meant that the person who administered the poison must have been someone with whom it was familiar and also someone who was already inside the place since even the first approaching step of friend or foe would have called forth one solitary bark at least farrow didn't do the things by halves you see he meant it to look like a genuine case of horse stealing to outsiders and killing the dog gave it just that touch of actuality which carries conviction as for the rest the major must tell you that in private your ladyship the rest of this little matter is for men alone lady mary bowed and passed out into the fast-coming dusk and in the stable the major cleek and narkom stood together waiting until she was well beyond earshot now major we will get down to brass tacks as our american cousins say said cleek when that time at length came you would like to know i suppose how poor farrow came by his injuries and from whose hand well you shall he was coming back from his cottage after stabling the real chocolate made there when the thing happened and he received those injuries for rushing to the defence of the woman he loved and attempting to thrash the blackguard who had taken advantage of her trust and belief in him to spoil her life for ever the woman was of course maggie mcfarland the man was your charming guest captain mctavish good god mctavish mctavish yes major the gallant captain who received such a sudden call to rejoin his regiment 
as soon as he knew that Tom Farrow was likely to recover and to speak. Perhaps you can understand now why Farrow and the girl no longer seemed to hit it off together as formerly. The gallant captain had come upon the boards. Dazzled by the beauty of him, tricked by the glib tongue of him, deluded into the belief that she had actually caught a gentleman, and that he really meant to make her his wife and take her away to India with him when he went, the silly, innocent, confiding little idiot became his victim, and threw over a good man's love for a handful of Dead Sea fruit. Never for one instant had Tom Farrow an idea of this, but the night before last, as he crossed the moor, he knew. In the darkness he stumbled upon the truth. He heard her crying out to the fellow to do her justice, to keep his word and make her the honest wife he had promised that she should be, and he heard, too, the man's characteristic reply. You can guess what happened, Major, when you know Tom Farrow. In ten seconds he was up and at the fellow like a mad bull. The girl, terrified out of her life, screamed and ran away, seeing the brave captain laying about him with his heavy silver-headed hunting crop as she fled. She never saw the end of the fight, she never dared, but in the morning, when there was no Tom Farrow to be seen, she went out there on the moor and found him. She would have spoken then had she dared, poor creature, but the man's threat was an effective one. If she spoke, he would do likewise. If she kept silent, she might go away and her disgrace be safely hidden, which she chose, we know. The damned hound! Oh, no, Major, oh, no. That's too hard on hounds. The only hound-like thing about that interesting gentleman was that he made an attempt to get to cover and to run away. I knew that he would. I knew that this was his little dodge when he made that little excuse about having to pack up his effects. He saw how the game was running, and he meant to slip the cable and clear out while he had the chance. And you let him do it? You never spoke a word, but let the blackguard do it? Gad, sir, I'm ashamed of you. You needn't be, Major, on that score at least. Please remember that I asked for a couple of grooms to be stationed on the moor. I gave them their orders, and then went on to Farrow's cottage alone. If they have followed out those orders, we shall soon see. Here he stepped to the door of the stable put his two forefingers between his lips, and whistled shrilly. In half a minute more the two grooms came into the stable, and between them the gallant captain, tousled and rather dirty, and with his beautiful hair and moustache awry. "'Got him, my lads, I see,' said Cleek. "'Yes, sir. Nabbed him, sneaking out the back way like you thought he would, sir.' and being as you said it was the major's orders we copped him on the jump and have been holding of him for further orders ever since well you can let him go now said cleek serenely and just give your attention to locking the door and lighting up major doctor mr narkom pray be seated the dear captain is going to give you all a little entertainment and the performance is about to begin. As good with your fists as you are with a metal-headed hunting crop, Captain. None of your dashed business what I'm good at, replied the Captain. Look here, Norcross. You cut that out at once, roared the Major. If you open your head to me, I'll bang it off you, you brute. "'Well, then, you, Mr. Policeman—' "'Ready for you in a minute, Captain. Don't get impatient,' said Cleek, as he laid aside his coat and began to roll up his sleeves. "'Rome wasn't built in a day, though beauty may be wrecked in a minute. You'll have the time of your life this evening. 
you are really too beautiful to live captain and i'm going to come as near to killing you as i know how without actually completing the job you see that poor little highland lassie hasn't a father or brother to do this business for her so she's kindly consented to my taking it on in her behalf i'm afraid i shall break that lovely nose of yours my gay gallant and i don't give a damn if i do a brute that spoiled a woman's life deserves to go through the world with a mark to record it and i'm going to put one on you to the best of my ability all seated gentlemen right you are now then captain come on come on you swine it was twenty minutes later lady mary norcross deep in the obligatory business of dressing for dinner had just taken up a powder puff and was assiduously dabbing the back of her neck when the door behind her opened softly and the voice of her liege lord travelled across the breadth of the room saying mary may i come in a minute dear i just want to get my cheque-book out of your writing-desk that's all yes certainly come in by all means gave back her ladyship i'm quite alone springer has finished with me and-oh good heavens seaton my dear my dear all right don't get frightened it isn't mine and it isn't his either much of it we've been having a little set to at the stable and i got it hugging a policeman seaton yes i know it's awful but i simply couldn't help it damn it mary don't look so shocked i'd have kissed the beggar as well if i thought i could acquire the trick of that heavenly jab with the left that way i haven't had such a beautiful time since the day i was twenty-one darling he fights like a blooming angel that chap what chap what on earth are you talking about that man cleek weeping widows it was the prettiest job you ever saw we're sending the beggar over to the hospital and tell you all about it when i get back can't stop just now dear bye-bye then the door closed with a smack and man and cheque-book were on their way downstairs end of section seventeen chapter fifteen it is a recognized fact in police circles that crime has a curious propensity for indulging in periodical outbursts of great energy great fecundity and then lapsing into a more or less sporadic condition for a time like a gorged tiger that drowses and stirs only to lick its chops after a hideous feast so that following the lines of these fixed principles the recent spell of criminal activity was succeeded by a sort of lull and the next two weeks were idle ones for cleek idle but idyllic from his point of view for he was back in the little house in the pleasant country lands now with his walled garden his ferns and his flowers and the full glory of tulip time was here and soon another glory would be here as well in twelve more days she would be back in england in twelve more days he and dollops would move out and ailsa lorne would move in and this little eden in the green and fragrant meadowlands would have another tenant from that time forth but hers would not be a lonely tenancy however for captain horatio burbage had recently written to mrs condiment that as the sleeping mermaid seemed likely to prove an unprofitable investment after all and to bring her little reward for her labours he purposed relinquishing it and recalling old joseph to him and with that end in view had already secured for the good lady a position of companion housekeeper to one miss ailsa lorne 
who in the early part of june would call upon her at her present quarters and personally conduct her and the deaf and dumb maid of all work to their future ones here then in this bower of bloom would this dear girl of his heart await the coming of that glorious day when the last act of restitution had been made the last vanishing cracksman debt wiped off the slate and he could go to her clean-handed at last to ask the fulfilment of her promise remembering that it was a sheer delight to be free from all yard calls for a time that he might give his whole attention to the work of getting the place ready for her and day after day he was busy in the high-walled old-world garden digging planting pruning that when she came it might be brimming over with flowers but although he devoted himself mind and body to this task and lived each day within the limits of that confining wall he had not wholly lost touch with the world at large for each morning the telephone installed against the time of ailsa's tenancy put him into communication with mr narkom at the yard and each night a newspaper carried in to him by dollops kept him abreast of the topics of the times it was over that telephone he received the first assurance that his haste in getting out of yorkshire had not been an unnecessary precaution his suspicions regarding the probable action of the nosworths not ill-grounded for mr narkom was able to inform him that carefully made inquiries had elicited the intelligence that within two days of the roundhouse affair men who were undoubtedly foreigners were making diligent inquiries throughout the west riding regarding the whereabouts of two men and a boy who had been travelling about in a two-horsed caravan that sudden bolt of ours was a jolly good move old chap said the superintendent when he made this announcement it did the beggars absolutely shouldn't be a bit surprised if they'd chucked the business as a bad job and gone back to the continent disgusted at any rate none of my plain-clothes men has seen hide nor hair of one of the lot since either in town or out valdemar too seems to have hooked it and can't be traced so i reckon we've seen the last of him but cleek was not so sure of that he had his own ideas as to what this disappearance of the apaches meant and did not allow himself to be lulled into any sense of security by it there were more ways than one in which to catch a weasel he recollected and determined not to relax his precautions in the smallest iota when next the yard's call for his services should come that it would come soon he felt convinced as the days advanced that rounded out the end of his second week of freedom from it and what form it would take when it did come was a matter upon which he could almost have staked his life so sure he felt of it for a time of great national excitement great national indignation had arrived and the press had made him acquainted with all the circumstances connected therewith as why not when the whole country was up in arms over it and every newspaper in the land headlined it in double caps and poured forth the story in full detail it had its genesis in something which had happened at gosport in the preceding week and happened in this startling manner in the waterway between barrow island and the extreme end of the royal clarence victualling yard there had been found floating the body of a man of about five-and-thirty years of age fully and fashionably clothed and having all those outward signs which betoken a person of some standing it was evident at once that death must have been the result of accident and that the victim had been unable to swim for the hands were encased in kid gloves the coat was tightly buttoned and a pair of field glasses in a leather case still hung from the long shoulder strap which supported the weight of them 
the victim's inability to swim was established by the fact that he had made no effort to rid himself of these hampering conditions and was clinging tightly to a foot-long bit of driftwood which he must have clutched at as it floated by it was surmised therefore that the man must have fallen into the water in the dark either from the foreshore or from some vessel or small boat in which he was journeying at the time and had been carried away by the swift current and drowned without being missed the condition of the body clearly establishing the fact that it had been in the water for something more than a fortnight when found later it was identified by one of the deck-hands of the pleasure steamer which cruises round the isle of wight daily as being that of a man he had seen aboard that vessel on one of its night trips to alum bay between two or three weeks previously and still later it was discovered that a boatman in that locality had been hired to take a gentleman from the needles to a yacht lying out to sea that selfsame night and that the gentleman in question never turned up what followed gave these two circumstances an appalling significance for when the body was carried to the mortuary and its clothing searched for possible clues to identification there was found upon it a sealed packet addressed simply a steinmuller Königstrasse eight and inside that packet there were two unmounted photographs of the exterior of blockhouse fort and the south sea fort a more or less accurate ground-plan drawing of the interior of the portsmouth dockyard together with certain secret information relative to supplies and to the proposed armament of cruisers now undergoing alteration and re-equipment the wrath and amazement engendered by that discovery however were as nothing compared with the one which so swiftly followed brought up before the admiral superintendent and the board john beachman the dockmaster who alone knew these things outside of the admiralty was obliged to admit that one person and one only his eldest son was in a position to obtain admission to the safe in which he kept his private papers and that son was engaged to a young lady whom he had met during a holiday tour on the continent english or foreign he was asked to which he replied that she was english or at least english by birth although her late father was a german he had become naturalized before his death and was wholly in sympathy with the country of his adoption he did not die in it however circumstances had caused him to visit the united states and he had been killed in one of the horrible railway disasters for which that country was famous it was because the daughter was thus left orphaned and was so soon to become the wife of their son that he and mrs beachman had taken her into their home in advance of the marriage they did not think it right that she should be left to live alone and unprotected considering what she was so soon to become to them so they had taken her into the home and their son had arranged to sleep at an hotel in portsmouth pending the date of the wedding the lady's name was hillman miss greta hillman she was of extremely good family and quite well to do in her own right she had never been to germany since the date of the engagement she had relatives there however one in particular a baron von ziegelmund and his son axel the son had visited england twice once many months back and the last time some seven or eight weeks ago they liked him very much the bridegroom-elect especially so they had become very great friends indeed no axel von ziegelmund was no longer in england he had left it something like a month ago he was on a pleasure trip round the world he had heard but had no idea where he had gone when he left portsmouth two hours after this statement was made if the populace could have got hold of young harry beachman it would have torn him to pieces for it was then discovered 
that the drowned man was no less a person than this herr axel von siegelmund and that they had not only spent the greater part of that particular day shut up in the former's room in the portsmouth hotel but had been together up to the very moment when the excursion steamer had started on its moonlight trip to alum bay and to the bringing about of that providential accident which had prevented the state affairs of an unsuspecting nation from being betrayed to a secret foe what followed was in the face of this of course but natural john beachman was suspended immediately and his son's arrest ordered it served no purpose that he denied indignantly the charge of being a traitor and swore by every sacred thing that the hours spent in his room at the hotel were passed in endeavouring to master the intricacies of the difficult german card game scart and that never in all their acquaintance had one word touching upon the country or the country's affairs passed between axel von siegelmund and himself so help him god it was in vain also that greta hillmann shouting hysterically her belief in him and begging wildly that if he must be put into prison she might be taken with him and murdered when you murder him if he is to be court-martialled and shot you wretched blunderers it was in vain that greta hillman clung to him and fought with all her woman's strength to keep the guard from laying hands upon him or to tear her from his side the outraged country demanded him and took him in spite of all nor did it turn the current of sympathy in his direction that crazed when they tore him from her this frantic creature had gone from swoon to swoon until her senses left her entirely and the end was tragedy the full details were never forthcoming the bare facts were that she was carried back to beachman's house in a state of hysteria bordering close upon insanity and that when under orders from the admiralty that house and all its contents were impounded pending the fullest inquiry into the dockmaster's books and accounts the admiral superintendent and the appointed auditor entered into possession her condition was found to be so serious that it was decided not to insist upon her removal for a day or two at least a nurse was procured from the naval hospital and put in charge of her but at some period during the fourth night of that nurse's attendance and when she worn out by constant watching slept in her chair the half delirious patient arose and leaving a note to say that life had lost all its brightness for her and if they cared to find her they might look for her in the sea vanished entirely she could scarcely have hit upon a worse thing for the evil repute of her lover's name or her own for those who had never known her personally were quick to assert that this was proof enough of how the thing had been managed in short that she too was a spy and that she had adopted this subterfuge to get back to germany before the scent grew hot and the law could lay a hand upon her those who had known her took a more merciful view so far as she was concerned but one which made things look all the blacker for her lover what could her desperation and her utter giving up all hope even before the man was put on trial mean if it was not that she knew he was guilty knew he would never get off with his life and that her suicide was a tacit admission of this end of section eighteen chapter sixteen meanwhile public indignation ran high the investigation of the dockmaster's books papers and accounts proceeded in camera and all england waited breathlessly for the result to be made known thus matters stood when on thursday night at half past seven o'clock exactly one week after the discovery of that packet on the body of the drowned man an amazing thing happened a thing which smacked almost of magic 
and put to shame all that had gone before in the way of mystery surprise and terror the wildest storm that had been known on that coast for years had been raging steadily ever since daybreak and was raging still a howling wind coming straight over the channel from france was piling ink-black seas against an ink-black shore and all the devils of the pit seemed to be loose in the noisy darkness in the suspended dockmaster's house the admiral superintendent sir charles fordeck together with his private secretary mr paul grimsdick and the auditor mr alexander mckinnery who had been continuing their investigations since morning were now coming within sight of the work's end the only occupants of a locked and guarded room outside of which a sentry was posted while round about the house in the stormy outer darkness other guards patrolled ceaselessly over the books sir charles and the auditor bent at one end of the room at the other paul grimsdick tapped on his typewriter and made transcripts from the shorthand notes beside him it was at this instant just when the clock on the mantel was beginning to chime the half hour after seven that such a crash of thunder ripped out of the heavens that the very earth seemed to tremble with the force of it and the three men fairly jumped in their seats <laughs> that was a stunner if you like exclaimed sir charles with a laugh something went down that time or i miss my guess something had gone down gone down in black and white too at that and before another half hour had passed the mystery and the appalling nature of that something was made known to him and his two companions the operator at the central telegraph office sitting beside a silent instrument with the key open deciphering a message which a moment before had come through jumped as they had jumped when that crash of thunder sounded then without hint or warning up spoke the open instrument beginning a sentence in the middle and chopping it off before it was half done hello that deflected something crossed communication or i'm a dutchman he said and bent over to take it in another moment he got more of a shock than twenty thunderbolts could possibly have given him for translated that interrupted communication ran thus and eight-inch guns the floating conning towers lateral plates of and there as abruptly as it began the communication left off good god there's another damned german spy at it exclaimed the operator jumping from his seat and grabbing for his hat god a mighty hawkins take this instrument and watch for more somebody's telegraphing naval secrets from the dockyard and the storm's tapped a wire somewhere and sent the message to us then he flung himself out into the storm and darkness and ran and ran and ran but the mystery of the thing was all the greater when the facts came to be examined for those two parts of sentences were found to be verbatim copies of the shorthand notes which mr paul grimsdick had just taken down these notes had never left the sight of the three men in the guarded room of that guarded house for so much as one second since they were made no one but they had passed either in or out of that room during the whole seven days of the inquiry there was no telegraph instrument in the room in the house or within any possible reach from it yet somebody in that building somebody who could only know the things by standing in that room and copying them for never once had they been spoken of by word of mouth some invisible impalpable superhuman body was wiring state secrets from it how and to whom naturally this state of affairs set the whole country by the ears and evoked a panicky condition which was not lessened by the presses frothing and screaming thus matters stood on the evening of wednesday the twenty second of may and thus they still stood on the morning of the twenty-third when the telephone rang and dollops rushed into cleek's bedroom crying excitedly and disjointedly 
mr narkom sir ringing up from his own house wants you in a hurry national case he says and not a minute to lose cleek was out of bed and at the instrument in a winking but he had no more than spoken the customary hello into the receiver when the superintendent's voice cut in cyclonically and swept everything before it in a small tornado of excited words call of the country dear chap he cried that infernal dockyard business at portsmouth sir charles fordeck just sent through a call for you rush like hell don't stop for anything train it over to guildford if you have to charter a special meet you there in the portsmouth road with the limousine at seven thirty we'll show em by god yes good-bye then click went the instrument as the communication was cut off and away went cleek like a gunshot on a wild rush for his clothes the sun was but just thrusting a crimson arc into view in the transfigured east when he left the house on a hard run for part at least of the way must be covered afoot and the journey was long but by four o'clock it was almost as bright as midday and the possibility of securing a conveyance for the rest of the distance was considerably increased by that fact by five he had secured one and by seven he was in the portsmouth road at guildford munching the sandwiches dollops had thoughtfully slipped into his pocket and keeping a sharp lookout for the coming of the red limousine it swung up over the rise of the road and came panting toward him at a nerve-racking pace while it still lacked ten minutes of being the appointed half-hour and so wild was the speed at which leonard in his furious interest was making it travel that cleek could think of nothing to which to liken it but a red streak whizzing across a background of leaf green with splatters of mud flying about it and an owl-eyed demon for pilot it pulled up with a jerk when it came abreast of him but so great was leonard's excitement so deep-seated his patriotic interest in the business he had in hand he seemed to begrudge even the half-minute it took to get his man aboard and before you could have turned around twice the car was rocketing on again at a demon's pace gad but he's full of it the patriotic beggar said cleek with a laugh as he found himself deposited in narkom's lap instead of on the seat beside him so sudden was the car's start the instant he was inside it might give our german friends pause don't you think mr narkom if they could get an insight into the spirit of the race as a fighting unit it'll give them hell if they run up against it make no blooming error about that rapped out the superintendent too hot in the collar to be choice of words it's a nasty little handful to fall foul of when its temper is up and this damned spy business done behind a mask of friendship in times of peace look here cleek if it comes to the point just give me a gun with the rest i'll show the government that i can lick something beside insurance stamps for my country's good by james yes just so said cleek with one of his curious crooked smiles he was used to these little patriotic outbursts on the part of mr narkom whenever the german bogey was dragged out by the press but let us hope it will not come to that it would be an embarrassment of riches so far as our friends the editors are concerned don't you think to have two wars on their hands at the same time and i see by papers that the long-threatened mauravanian revolution has broken out at last in short that our good friend count irma has made his escape from sulberger put himself at the head of the insurgents and is organizing a march on the capital here he pulled himself up abruptly as if remembering something and before mr narkom could put in a word launched into the subject of the case in hand and set him thinking and talking of other things end of section 19chapter 17 it had gone nine by all the reliable clocks in town when the wild race to the coast came to an end and after darting swallow-like through the wind-swept streets of portsmouth the limousine mud-splashed and disreputable 
rushed up to the guarded entrance of the suspended dockmaster's house at Portsea, and precisely one and a quarter minutes thereafter Cleek stood in the presence of the three men most deeply concerned in the clearing up of this mystifying affair. He found Mr. Charles Fordeck, a dignified and courtly gentleman of polished manners and measured speech, although now, quite naturally, labouring under a distress of mind which visibly disturbed him. He found Mr. Paul Grimsdick, his secretary, a frank-faced, straight-looking young Englishman of thirty, Mr. Alexander McKinnery, a stolid, unemotional Scotsman of middle age, with a huge, knotted forehead, eyebrows like young moustaches, and a face like a face of granite and he found, too, reason to believe that each of these was, in his separate way, a man to inspire confidence and respect. "'I can hardly express to you, Mr. Cleek, how glad I am to meet you, and to have you make this quick response to my appeal,' said the Admiral Superintendent, offering him a welcoming hand. I feel that if any man is likely to get to the bottom of this mysterious business, you are that man, and that you should get to the bottom of it quickly, at whatever cost, by whatever means, is a thing to be desired not only in the nation's interest, but for the honour of myself and my two colleagues. I hardly think that your honour will be called into question, Sir Charles, replied Cleek, liking him the better for the manliness which prompted him in that hour of doubt and difficulty to lay aside all questions of position, and by the word colleague lift his secretary to the level of himself, so that they might be judged upon a common plane as men and men alone. It would be a madman indeed who would hint at anything approaching treason with regard to Sir Charles Fordeck no madder than he would hint it of either of these said sir charles laying a hand upon the shoulder of the auditor and the secretary and placing himself between them i demand to be judged by the same rule set upon the same plane with them we three alone were in this house when that abominable thing happened we three alone had access to the records from which that information was wired it never for so much as the fraction of one second passed out of our keeping or our sight. If it was wired at all, it must have been wired from this house, from that room, and in that case one or other of us must positively have been the person to do so. Well, I did not, McKinnery did not, Grimsdick did not, and yet, as you know, the wiring was done. We should never stand a chance of knowing to whom, nor by whom, but for the accident which deflected the course of the message. Hmm, yes, I don't think, commented Cleek reflectively. It won't wash, that theory. No, decidedly it won't wash. A uh, pardon? Oh, no, Sir Charles. I am not casting any doubt upon the telegraph operator's statement of the manner in which he received the message. It is his judgment that is at fault, not his veracity. Of course there have been cases, very rare ones, happily, of one wire automatically tapping another through, as he suggested, there being a break and an overlapping of the broken wire onto the sound one. But in the present instance there isn't a ghost of a chance of such a thing having happened. In other words, Sir Charles, it is as unsound in theory as it is false in fact. Mr. Narkom has been telling me on the way here that the operator accounted for the sudden starting of the message to the falling of a storm-snapped wire upon an uninjured one and for its abrupt cessation to the slipping off of that broken wire under the influence of the strong gale. Now, as we entered the town and proceeded through it, I particularly noted the fact that no broken wires were anywhere visible, 
nor was there sight or sign of men being engaged in repairing one ah yes agreed sir charles a trifle dubiously that may be quite so mr cleek but if you'll pardon my suggesting it is there not the possibility of a flaw in your reasoning upon that point the wire in question may not have been located in that particular district through which you were travelling i don't think there is any chance of my having made an error of that sort sir charles replied cleek smiling had i been likely to do so our friend the telegraph operator would have prevented it he recognized at once that the communication was coming over the wire from the dockyard i am told and i have observed that every one of the dockyard wires is intact i fancy when we come down to the bottom of it we shall discover that it was not the dockyard wire which tapped a message from some other but that the dockyard wire was being tapped itself and that the storm causing a momentary interruption in the carrying on of that tapping process allowed a portion of the message to slip past and continue to the wire's end the telegraph office good lad then in that case in that case mr narkom there can be no shadow of a doubt that that message was sent by somebody in this house and over the dockyard's own private wire but how mr cleek in the name of all that is wonderful how ah that is the point sir charles i think we need not go into the matter of who is at the bottom of the whole affair but confine ourselves to the business of discovering how the thing was done and how much information has already gone out to the enemy i fancy we may set our minds at rest upon one point however namely the identity of the person whose hand supplied the drawing found upon the body of the drowned man that hand was a woman's that woman i feel safe in saying was sophie borovonsky professionally known to the people of the underworld as la tarantula i never heard of her mr cleek who is she probably the most beautiful unscrupulous reckless daredevil spy in all europe sir charles she is a russian by birth but owns allegiance to no country and to no crown together with her depraved brother boris and her equally desperate paramour niccolo ferrand she forms one of the trio of paid bravos who for years have been at the beck and call of any nation despicable enough to employ them always ready for any piece of treachery or dirty work so long as their price is paid as cunning as serpents as slippery as eels as clever as the devil himself and as patient we shall not go far astray gentlemen if we assert that the lady's latest disguise was that of miss greta hillman good god young beechman's fiance exactly sir charles i should not be able to identify her from a photograph were one obtainable which i doubt she is far too clever for that sort of thing but the evidence is conclusive enough to satisfy me at least of the lady's identity but how how mr narkom will tell you sir charles that from our time of starting this morning to our arrival here we made but one stop that stop was at the portsmouth mortuary before we appeared at this house i wish to see the body of the man who was drowned i have no hesitation sir charles in declaring that that man's name is not and never was axel von siegelmund the body is that of niccolo ferrand la tarantula's clever lover the inference is obvious miss greta hillman's anguish and despair were real enough believe me that is why it deceived everybody so completely it is not however over the frightful position of young beechman that she sorrowed 
but over the death of Ferrand. Had he lived, I believe she has daring enough to have remained here and played her part to the end. But she either lost her nerve and her mental balance, which, by the way, is not in the least like her under any circumstances whatsoever, or some other disaster of which we know nothing overtook her and interfered with her carrying on the work in conjunction with her brother. Her brother? Yes, he would be sure to be about. They all three worked in concert. Gad, if I'd only been here before the vixen slipped the leash, if I only had. Let us have the elder Mr. Beechman in, if you please, Mr. Charles. There's a word or so I want to have with him. You've had him summoned, of course. Yes, he and the telegraph operator as well. I thought you might wish to question both, replied he. Grimstick, go, or oh, no, I'll go myself. Beechman ought to know of this appalling thing, and it is best that it should be broken by a friend. Speaking, he left the room, coming back a few minutes later in company with the telegraph operator and the now almost hysterical dockmaster. He waited not one second for introduction or permission or anything else, that excited father, but rushed at Cleek and caught him by the hand. "'It's my boy, and you're clearing him. God bless you!' he exclaimed, catching Cleek's hand and wringing it with all his strength. "'It isn't in him to sell his country. I'd have killed him with my own hand years ago if I thought it was. But it wasn't. It never was. My boy! My boy! My splendid loyal boy!' "'That's right, old chap. Have it out. Here on my shoulder, if you want to, Daddy. And don't be ashamed of it, said Cleek, and reached round his arm over the man's shoulder and clapped him on the back. Let her go, and don't apologise, because it's womanish. A man without a strain of the woman in him somewhere isn't worth the powder to blow him to perdition. We'll have him cleared, Daddy. Gad, yes. And look here. When he is cleared, you take him by the ear and tell him to do his sweethearting in England, the young jackass, and to let foreign beauties alone. They're not picking up with young Englishmen of his position for nothing, especially if they are reputed to have money of their own and to be connected with titled families. If you can't make him realise that by gentle means, take him into the garden and bang it into him hard. "'Thank you, sir, thank you. Oh, "'I can see it now, Mr. Cleek. "'Not much use in shouting rule Britannia "'if you're going to ship on a foreign craft, is there, sir? "'But anybody would have been taken in with her. "'She seemed such a sweet, gentle little thing "'and had such winning ways. "'And when she lost her father, "'the wife and I simply couldn't help taking her to our hearts.' "'Quite so. Ever see that father, Mr. Beechman?' "'Yes, sir, once. The day before he sailed, or was supposed to have sailed, for the States.' "'Short, thick-set man, was he? Carried one shoulder a little lower than the other, and had lost the top of a finger on the left hand?' "'Yes, sir, the little finger. That's him to a tee. "'Boris Borovonsky,' declared Cleek, glancing over at Sir Charles. "'No going to the States for that gentleman with a deal like this on hand. "'He'd be close by and in constant touch with her. "'Did she have any friends in the town, Mr. Beechman?' "'No, not one. "'She appeared to be of a very retiring disposition "'and made no acquaintances whatsoever.' The only outside person I ever knew her to take any interest in was a crippled girl who lived with her bedridden mother and took in needlework. Greta heard of the case and went to visit them. Afterwards she used to carry work to them frequently, and sometimes fruit and flowers. Ever see that bedridden woman or that crippled girl? No, sir, never. Harry and I would be busy here most of the days, so she always went alone. Did she ever ask Mrs. Beechman to accompany her? 
not that i ever heard of sir but it would have been to no purpose if she had the wife is a very delicate woman she rarely ever goes anywhere hmm i see so then you really do not know if there actually was a woman or a girl at all any idea where the persons were supposed to live yes they hired a room on the top floor of a house adjoining the ocean billow hotel sir uh, at least reggie that's my youngest son mr cleek saw gretter go in there and look down from one of the top floor windows one day when he was on his way home from school he spoke to her about it at the dinner-table that night and she said that that was where her pensioners lived pretty good neighbourhood that by jove for people who are pensioners to be living in commented cleek the ocean billow hotel is a modern establishment lifts electric lights liveried attendants and caters to people of substance and standing yes admitted beechman when i was suspended sir during the examination and this house taken over by sir charles i took mrs beechman and reggie there and we have remained at the place nominally under guard ever since you see being convenient and in a straight line so to speak it offered extra advantages in case of my being summoned here at a moment's notice hmm yes i see said cleek stroking his chin in a straight line from here eh house next door would of course offer the same advantages and from a room on the top floor a wire tapping device yes just so i think sophie i think i smell a very large mouse my dear and i shan't be surprised if we've hit upon the place of reception for your messages the very first shot messages mr cleek messages interposed sir charles you surely do not mean to infer that the woman telegraphed messages from this house do you forget then that there is no instrument no wire attached to the place cleek puckered up his brows for the moment he had forgotten that fact still there are wires passing over it sir charles he said presently and if a means of communication with those were established the tapper at the other end could receive messages easily she is a devil of ingenuity is sophie i wouldn't put it beyond her and her confederates to have rigged up a transmitting instrument of some sort which the woman could carry on her person and attach to the wire when needed here sir charles threw in something which he felt to be in the nature of a facer quite so he admitted but do not forget mr cleek that the deflected message was sent last night and that the woman was not then in this house end of section twenty chapter eighteen the queer little one-sided smile cocked up the corner of cleek's mouth sure of that sir charles he inquired placidly sure that she was not i am told it is true that she left the note saying she was going to drown herself and disappeared four nights ago i am also told that since the date of mr beachman's suspension this place has been under constant guard night and day but i have not been told however that any of the guards saw her leave the place no 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 don't jump to conclusions so readily gentlemen she will be out of it now out and never likely to return the news of that miscarried message would warn her that something was wrong and she would be up and out of it like a darting swallow the question is how and when did she get out let's have in the guard and see the sentries were brought in one after the other and questioned 
at no time since they were first put on guard they declared at no time either by day or by night had any living creature entered or left the house up to now except the admiral superintendent his secretary the auditor and the nurse who had been summoned to look after the stricken girl to that they one and all were willing to take solemn oath there is an old french proverb which says he that protests too much leads to the truth in spite of himself it was the last man to be called who did this no sir nobody passed either in or out i'll take my dying oath to that asserted he his feelings riled up by the thought that this constant questioning of his statement was a slur upon his devotion to his duty there aren't nobody going to hint as i'm a slacker as don't know what he's a-doing of or a blessed mug that don't obey orders no sir no fear sir charles's orders was nobody in or out and nobody in or out it was my hat yes why sir turning to the dockmaster you must have known he must have told you i wouldn't allow even young master reggie in last night when he came a pleading to be let in to get the school books he'd left behind when he what almost roared the dockmaster fairly jumping good lord marshal have you gone off your head do you mean to claim that you saw my boy here last night certainly sir just after that awful clap of thunder it was say about eight or ten minutes after and what with that and the darkness and the way the wind was howling i never seen or heard nothing of him coming till i got to the door and there he was in them light-coloured knickers and the pulled-down wide-awake hat i'd seen him wear dozens of times with his coat collar turned up and a dripping umbrella over his head making like he was going up the steps to try and get in who's there as i sings to him though i needn't for the little light was streaking out through the windows showed me what he was wearing and who it was well enough it's me master reggie marshal he says i've come to get my school books i left em behind in the hurry and father says he's sure you'll let me go in and get em oh does he says i well i'm surprised at him and at you too master reggie a thinking i'd go against orders word is that nobody gets in and nobody does even the king hisself till them orders is changed so you just come away from that door and trot right away back to your pa i says to him and ask him from me what kind of a sentry he thinks bill marshall is which sets him a snivelling and a pleading till i has to take him by the shoulder and fair drag him away before i could get him to go as he'd been told well done sophie exclaimed cleek gad what a creature of resource the woman is and what an actress she would make the vixen no need to ask you if your son really did come over here last night mr beachman your surprise and indignation have answered for you i should think it would by george rapped out the dockmaster what sort of an insane man must you have thought me marshal to credit such a thing as that as if i'd have been likely to let a delicate fifteen-year-old boy go out on an errand of any kind in a beast of a storm like last night's much less tell him that he was to ask a sentry in my name to disobey his orders good god gentlemen it's simply monstrous why look here sir charles look here mr cleek even if i'd been guilty of such a thing and the boy was willing to go out he couldn't have done it to save his life the poor little chap met with an accident last night and he's been in bed ever since he was going down the stairs on his way to dinner when that terrific clap of thunder came and the blessed thing startled him so much that in the pitch darkness he missed his footing fell clear to the bottom of the staircase and broke his collar-bone poor little lad too bad too bad sympathized sir charles feelingly and possibly would have said more but that cleek's voice broke in softly but with a curiously sharp note underlying its sleekness in the pitch darkness mr beachman it inquired 
the pitch darkness of a public hotel at dinner time isn't that rather extraordinary it would be under any other circumstances sir but that infernal clap of thunder interfered in some way with the electric current and every blessed light in the hotel went smack out whisk like that and left the place as black as a pocket everybody thought for the moment that the wires must have fused but it turned out that there was nothing the matter with them only that the current had been interrupted for a bit for the lights winked on again as suddenly as they had winked out by jupiter cleek cracked out the two words like the snapping of a whiplash then quickly turned round on his heel and looked straight and intently at the telegraph operator speak up quick he said in the sharp staccato of excitement i am told that when that crash came and the diverted message began there was a force that almost knocked you off your stool is that true yes sir the man replied perfectly true it was something terrific the lord only knows what it would have been if i'd been touching the instrument you'd have been as dead as julius caesar flung back cleek no wonder she cut away to see what was wrong the vixen no wonder the lights went out mr narkom the limousine quick come along sir charles come along mr beachman come along at once where mr cleek where to the top floor of the house next door to the ocean below hotel sir charles to see miss greta hillman's precious pensioners he made answer rather excitedly unless i am woefully mistaken gentlemen one part of this little riddle is already solved and the very elements have conspired to protect england to become her foeman's executioner he was not mistaken not in any point with regard to that house and the part it had played in this peculiar case for when they visited it and demanded in the name of the law the right to enter and to interview the bedridden woman and the crippled girl who occupied the top floor they were met with the announcement that no such persons dwelt there nor had ever done so it is let to an invalid it is true the landlady a motherly unsuspecting old soul told them when they made the demand but it is a gentleman not a lady a professional gentleman i believe artist or sculptor something of that sort and never until last night has anybody been with him but his niece who makes occasional calls last night however a nephew came just for a moment indeed it seemed to me that he had no more than gone upstairs before he came down again and went out pardon no nobody has called to-day neither has the gentleman left his room but he often sleeps until late he was sleeping for ever this time for when they came to mount the stairs and force open the door of the room there under a half-opened skylight a dead man lay one screwed up contracted hand still clutching the end of a flex which went up and out to the telegraph wires overhead on a table beside the body a fused and utterly demolished telegraph instrument stood and it was evident from the scrap of flex still clinging to this that it had once formed part of that which the dead hand held that it had snapped somehow and that the man was attempting to reattach it to the instrument when death overtook him gentlemen the wire tapper boris borovonsky said cleek as he bent over and looked at him step here mr beachman and tell me if this is not the man who played the part of miss greta hillman's interesting papa yes yes declared the dockmaster excitedly after he too had bent over and looked into the dead face it is the very man sir the very one but who but why but how he then looked upward in a puzzled way to where the flex went up and out through the skylight and threading through a maze of wires hooked itself fast to one electrocuted said cleek answering that inquiring glance 
a few thousand volts a flash of flame through heart and head and limbs and then this see his little game mr narkom see it do you sir charles he was taking the message from the tapped wire with that flex and the fragment that reached the telegraph office only got through when the flex snapped the furious gale did that no doubt whipping it away from its moorings so to speak and letting the message flash on before he could prevent it can't you read the rest when you look up and see that other wire the thick one with the insulated coating torn and frayed by contact with the chimney's rough edge it is not hard to reconstruct the tragedy when one sees that when the flex snapped he jumped up and grabbed it and was in the very act of again attaching it to the instrument when he became his own executioner look for yourself the wild wind must either have blown the flex against the bared wire of the electric light or the bared wire against the flex that we shall never know and in the winking of an eye he was annihilated no wonder the lights in the hotel went out mr beachman the whole strength of the current was short-circuited through this man's body and it crumpled him up as a glove crumples when it is cast in the fire but the dead hand which had recovered the broken flex still held it you see and no more of the tapped message went down the dockyard wire so long as that message continued so long as the instrument which sent it continued to send it it was received here a mere silent unrecorded impotent thrill locked up in the grip of a dead man's hand and look there the pile of burnt paper beside the fused instrument and the cinder of a match-box against it the force which obliterated life in him infused it into the dipped heads of those little wooden sticks and flashed them into flame so long as there was anything for that flame to feed upon it continued its work you see and sophie borovonsky found nothing to take away with her after all gentlemen the state secrets that were stolen will remain england's own the records were burnt and the dead cannot betray. End of section 21